Okay. So on the agenda then, as amended, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. On the minutes, uh, Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, prepared to move both sets of minutes, Your Worship. Oh, very well. I'm sorry. I thought you said prior to moving them. I was waiting for more. <laughs> All right. Um, great. We've got a seconder. Uh, on the minutes, Alderman Carra. Uh, Alderman Marr was seconding, by the way. Yeah, this is uh, just a question pertaining to how we record uh, direct control within the minutes. And this probably isn't the right, because this isn't a question to these minutes specifically. But um, in the last minutes that we approved in the first sort of meeting of council, there was sort of a very loose interpretation of a direct control permit that came through that caused some serious um, issues for one of my community associations at Subdivision Development Appeal Board. And so what's the procedure for sort of discussing and reviewing how we anal or how we re record council's specific intent to direct control land use amendments in the minutes so subdivision development appeal board has more clarity on a move forward basis it's not entirely in order to ask that question now i, I, I respect that that's probably since, the case but since we're all here mr watson did you have anything to say about that well through the chair i'm not aware of the the actual specific item i have a i could make a guess but i'd rather not um so i'm not aware of what we're actually talking about, but I, I take an undertaking to sit down and go over it with you. I mean, the, the direct control is the direct control. It's the bylaw that council gives three readings to with all the pieces. And if there's something outside of that that needs to be done, it really needs to be put in the bylaw. The bylaw is the legal document. Okay. I understand, certainly SDAB doesn't have the benefit of all the discussion that goes on here before it looks at it, perhaps although there's staff that come to SDAB, but Your Worship, I'd rather, I think, uh, arrange a time for a coffee with Alderman Carrar and find out. We'll discuss, and I apologize. No, no problem. Time. The right time for this sort of thing, Alderman Carrar, is um, under question period or administrative inquiries, okay. depending on the nature of the question. Okay. That said, given that we are in the middle of a governance subcommittee and one of the things they're going to be looking at is the minutes, it would also be a good time for you to have a chat with the clerk's office and bring that forward to that committee. Thank you very much. Very well. Anyone else on the minutes? Very well. We've got a motion to approve the minutes of the combined meeting of council 2010 November 8th, as well as the special strategic meeting of council on 2010 November 16 and 17. On these minutes, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. I'll take a motion now um, to accept the consent agenda. Happy to move the consent agenda, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Do I have a seconder? Alderman Lowe. Any discussion on the consent agenda? Anyone want to pull anything? Alderman Carra? Thank you, Your Worship. This is going to be probably a similarly uh, procedurally challenged question. Um, but we've got two uh, things coming forward. Uh, number one is uh, f within the consent agenda is 5.1, which is CPS 2010 uh, 58, which discusses the uh, update on meetings and conventions in Calgary. At a uh, standing policy committee, I made some uh, comments about the uh, questionable uh, value or the, the issues I had with the general implications with regards to the triple bottom line framework. If you, if you want to have the discussion at yeah. council, Alderman Carra, yeah. the right thing to do is to pull it from the consent agenda now and then we'll deal with it as a separate, as a separate motion. Okay, my question, I guess, would be if you bring up issues at Standing Policy Committee and everyone's like, yeah, that's a great point, and then it comes through unchanged, how do I do it? Do I pull it and then we discuss it? Yes. yes. I will do so then. Okay, so we're going to pull 5.1. Uh, anyone else on the, uh, anything else, sorry? You said you had two. Okay. Uh, one is uh, SPS 2010-58. Uh, the other is... Um, The other one is FCS 2010-25. 5.4 on the agenda. You'd like to pull that one too? It's 5.2. What is it? It's 5.2. Uh, 25, council reserves policy. Is that the one you were aiming for? Yeah. And then it both pertain to the uh, 
Both pertain to the uh, implications, the triple bottom line implications, the okay, reporting so, on the triple bottom line implications. So sorry, Alderman Carra, you're pulling 5.1 and okay. 5.4? I have 5.2 here, 2010, 20, FCS 2010, 25. It's 5.4. Sorry, There's, Your Worship, I think you're numbering on that. Oh, sorry, my, my agenda numbering is incorrect. Okay. So we'll pull the, okay, so you're asking to pull those two. Okay. Okay. 5.1, which is page 39, and it's uh, SPS 2010-58, CPS, sorry. And the other one is 5.2 on page 53, FCS 2010-25. Okay, thank so you. So my movement is to? <laughs> to pull those two. And put them onto the non-consent agenda? When, when you pull them, what happens is we go through the consent agenda, approve yep. it, and then whatever's been pulled off, we deal with it at that time. Got you. Okay. I so move. Point of clarification, my agenda says 5.4. And yeah. Alderman, I'm not sure what agenda we're working off of, but I'm online. So I'm curious, which one's right? Uh, I think the print one and the online one have a discrepancy because I just noticed it too. So Madam Clerk, how best to proceed? It looks like it's the numbering in the hard copy that's um, conflicting. So we'll just go with the report, actually, the actual numbers of the report. Okay, so if, so you, if say you look at the- FCS 2010-25, uh, then- Okay, that's the best way to do it. Rather than the others, I think we'll be okay then. So we're being asked then to pull um, CPS 2010-58 and FCS 2010-25. As we move to this brave new world of electronic agendas, we will sort all of this moving forward. Um, I really, I, I want to take the motion uh, on the consent agenda, but I'll just recognize Alderman Hodges and Alderman Marr if there's anything else. Yes, just briefly, Your Worship, I just, I noticed uh, looking at the agenda here yesterday, the uh, Audit Committee 2010-84 there's a typo on uh, the right-hand column where we have a report coming in before the report's finished. So I just thought I should just get the typo corrected. I don't know that I need to pull a report out. No, I don't think so. What's the, if it's a clerical, it's a clerical. Uh, what's says, the actual, what should the actual date be? Do you have it handy? It says April 2010. I'm sure they meant April uh, 2011. Thanks, Alderman Hodges. That's just a clerical. We can do yeah. that now. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and Alderman Marr. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I know that we're all eagerly anticipating uh, Alderman Carra's next soliloquy, but um, I'm I, be nice. I, I, I am being nice. I'm always nice. That's why you all love me. Uh, the the <laughs> intent of it is is that uh, the reason why I'm, I'm on my feet now is that what he mentioned at committee uh, was a discussion on the triple bottom line analysis, and I just wanted to remind council that that's part of the discussion my notice of motion is bringing. So. Okay, Alderman to, Moore. We may be able to uh, circumvent some we'll of this. get Thank to it you. later. Okay. Um, so then on the consent agenda with those two items removed, are we agreed? Agreed. Very well. That takes us then to CPC 2010. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, no, sorry. CPS 2010 is what I meant to say. CPS 2010-58. Um, so on CPS 2010-58, did you want to introduce it, Alderman Moore? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this is the uh, CPS 2010-58, which is an update on meetings and conventions. Calgary, there was uh, ongoing discussion about the benefits of having conventions in Calgary, and uh, I know that we are going to be hearing from other members of council on this now. Thank you. Are you moving the recommendation, Alderman Marr? Yeah. Thank you, do I have a seconder? Thanks, Alderman Stevenson. On CPS 2010-58, did I see Alderman Putman's light on? Um, Alderman Carrad, do you want to? Thank you, Your Worship. My point, and, and I, again, I understand that we're sort of like procedurally questionable here. Um, okay. Well, I, I guess the, pro the, the procedural questionability had to do with that was like my first SPS, Standing Policy Committee, and I called into question the reporting on the implications. So council a while ago established triple bottom line policy implications to uh, bring forward before uh, 
for council to sort of discuss what the implications were for any particular report that's coming forward. And in my short time on council, and part of my issue preceding my arrival at council, had to be uh, surrounded the fact that we weren't, I don't think, taking these triple bottom line policy council uh, tr policy reporting as seriously as we could. And so I'm, I've pulled out these two particular things to just highlight this, and I'm, I'd be happy to forward it to Alderman Mars' uh, motion arising later in the agenda as, as potentially. But I, I just want to sort of highlight this for the public. But we have this report discusses. Conventions, it says the social implications, meetings and conventions contribute to the vibrancy of Calgary. These events also provide opportunities for Calgarians to network with and learn from colleagues around the world. Definite positive social benefit to having conventions and an increase in convention uh, here in Calgary. Economic um, repercussions of this report are that meetings and conventions in Calgary generate employment across many industry sectors introduce visitors to investment and tourism opportunities in Calgary and provide substantial direct delegate spending in local hotels, restaurants, retail outlets, attractions, and transportation providers. So definite positive economic implication for Calgary becoming an increasing center for conventions. The environmental report says none as a result of this update report. And I think that if we become more of a convention center and we have more air traffic and more international travel coming to Calgary, there are definite, obvious environmental impacts. And I think that us not noting that here because it's potentially a negative drawback is something that we have to, we have to make a point of so we can mitigate. For example, if we have more people coming to the airport to come downtown, might be smart to connect the airport with transit. And so acknowledging it here would be a good place. So uh, I will make that point and uh, assume that we are going to address it adequately with Alderman Mars, uh, unless there's someone from uh, one of the GMs would like to address this. Oh, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Alderman Carra. Uh, I think that uh, it, Alderman Marr has kindly brought us a notice of motion, which would be a good opportunity to talk about that, and or at the procedural bylaw. Though I do, though I do agree with you that uh, all reports should include a positive recommendation for the airport underpass. Um, did I say that out loud? <laughs> Anything else, Alderman Carra? Um, that's all for this report. Great, thank you. Any other discussion on this one? So then, on the administration recommendation on CPS 2010-58, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Yes, Alderman Putmans? Uh, rise uh, to uh, introduce a school class. Oh, lovely. Thank you very much. I have the pleasure to introduce City Hall class for this week. They are 28 grade 3 students from Our Lady of Assumption School accompanied by their teachers, Ita Kistorma and Lisa Letwin. Interestingly, their focus for this week will be, what is a city built on? Wonderful. Would you please stand? Welcome. And uh, greetings from Council. Thank you. <laughs> and you have now been on television. Welcome, and I look forward to uh, spending some time with you all later this week as well. That takes us to uh, FCS 2010-25, Council Reserves Policy. Uh, Alderman Lowe, would you like to introduce? And your worship, I'll move the recommendations of the committee. It was a uh, very straightforward report. There was no discussion about the recommendations at the uh, committee whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, I'd be interested to hear um, you know, the environmental comments in this one are that certain reserves support environmental programs and, com and uh, compliance with environmental regulations, which I think is positive. Uh, the social, certain reserves support social programs that, which assist the city in providing services, which is, again, positive. The report has been reviewed for alignment, uh, the standard language, the economic. Uh, there were no implications indicated because the policy simply introduces a, a uh, regular and routine review of, of, of reserves, Your Worship. So uh, while I think I understand uh, Alderman Carra has an interest in further reporting, 
Uh, you know, he's put the other one over to refer the comments over to Alderman Mars notice of motion, which uh, I'll telegraph to you, Your Worship, that I intend to remove that to the committee that's looking at procedures. Not quite yet, Alderman Lowe. Um, do I have a seconder? Second. Thanks, Alderman Pincott. Um, Alderman Chabot. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, well, I supported this in committee, and I will be supporting it here again. The report, as Alderman Lowe indicated, is very straightforward. It does talk about some of the uh, the reserves that we decomm decommissioned back in July that had been identified as being surplus to our needs or no longer required. And there's going to be some additional reports coming forward in regards to um, how we deal with some of the other reserves and whether or not they need to be expanded on or limited, and so I think the report is pretty straightforward, so I'll be supporting it. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. I actually have a question on this one, which is last week uh, we had a fair bit of discussion about one of the reserves, the Fiscal Stability Reserve, um, and I noticed that one's not on the list uh, to be reviewed in 2011, and I just wonder when that one's coming up on the schedule. Alderman Lowe? Mr. Sawyer? Uh, Your Worship, the um, selection of the reserves uh, to be addressed in the first cycle was principally drawn from recommendations from the audit committee report or the auditor, city auditor's report on reserves that identified a number that should go first. So the FSR um, probably would come in the second year or for sure in the third. Um, but I think the city auditor's report did not identify any issues around the FSR from a policy, um, rules, that kind of process. From any control I, I, perspectives that they were reviewed under your worship. Okay, yeah, because the, the question, of course, that was raised was much more about the amount than the policy and controls. Exactly, so. and this is about, pol about controls. Will, will, will the reviews also look at the appropriate amount, Alderman Lower, or will that be a separate process? They, they will look at them all, your worship. Okay, and that's the, what I thought. Standard questions. Uh, the question I forgot in 2001, which is, is there a paper trail? So mm -hmm. there will be a paper trail. Why was the reserve established? Uh, is that reason valid today? And uh, is the reserve performing as it should? Thank you very much, Alderman Lowe. Alderman Keating on this item. Thank you, Your Worship. I just had uh, one clarification on the number. Um, and, and again, for my own information, uh, I understand we have somewhere in the number of 80 plus reserve funds. If we divide that into three, and we're doing it on a th every three years, the fund would be reviewed. Uh, if we look at this, we're fa far below the one third. Um, is it any reason for this? Uh, Your Worship, I haven't got the exact figures in front of me, but my understanding is this is approximately a third or so. I'm noticing the um, uh, for example, the reserve for future capital, the life cycle maintenance and upgrade reserve are both fairly sizable reserves. So um, I thought it is out of the roughly 900 or so million, this is hitting about 300. So that was the intent. Now I haven't got my math in front of me. So it's roughly one third of the amounts every year, not one third of the actual reserves. Does that help, Alderman Keating? Well, yeah, that's right. I that's right. understand the, that portion. I just. When you're looking at numbers, if you're going to re review them every three years, it means in one year you're going to have uh, 25, and here we have 12 or 15. And I just wondered this concept. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, then on the administration recommendation on FCS 2010-25, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. All right, that then brings us to the public hearing portion. Uh, of the agenda. Now, for the benefit of those new to this process, um, as well as those following along at home, the way this works is that we will have the various items. We'll start with an administration report, um, and then we will have questions of clarification only from members of council to administration. Members of the public will then be invited to come uh, and speak their piece for five minutes. I'll first ask for uh, members who are in favor of the uh, proposal, then I'll ask for people who are opposed to the proposal. Once we've heard from the public, council may ask further questions of administration, and then we vote. 
So we're going to start then with CPC 2010-112, and that is land use redesignation in Forest Heights. And we'll begin with the administration presentation. Are you ready for us? Mr. Cope? Uh, the first item before you today is a land use item in the community of Forest Heights. This was a table from the last public hearing meeting uh, to allow the applicant to conduct further consultation with the directly affected uh, adjacent landowners. That process has occurred and the applicant has provided us with documentation of the uh, houses where he uh, made contact with those uh, affected adjacent neighbors. The proposed redesignation is to take the 0 0.07 hectares of land and redesignate the site from the uh, existing RC1 residential district to a direct control district to accommodate the additional use of a child care service. The use of a direct control district will allow for a site to retain its residential character and potential use into the future as well for the additional use of a child care service. The site is located on 47th Street uh, Southeast at uh, Fortune Road Southeast. It's outlined in red on the location map, uh, corner site, and meets with the guidelines of the child care service policy and development guidelines. Uh, there has been no written objections to the proposed redesignation, and Calgary Planning Commission is recommending that Council adopt the proposed redesignation to DC Direct Control and give three readings to propose bylaw 101D 2010. Thank you, Mr. Cope. Any questions for clarification for Mr. Cope? Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Worship. Mr. Cope, there's a, um, a deck on site. Do you know if that deck is, um, is um, got a development permit associated with it or a building permit associated with it? Uh, no, I have no information on that. Uh, as this is a land use, uh, once a de development permit uh, comes in for the actual use, that would probably form part of the bylaw check on the site itself. So it will form part of the bylaw check for the RPR, the real property report? That's correct. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Any other questions of clarification on this? Any members of the public who wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Members of the public in favor, sir. Please, please approach the podium. Hello, please introduce yourself for the record and then you may proceed. Good morning. My name is Josh Huan. I'm the applicant. Worship, element, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to remind that children are our future. A good quality children's service can make a significant difference in the lives of the families and their children. This in turn enables these children to make a profound, valued and long-lasting contribution to the society. Some of you may still remember the waiting list in early 2008 for all childcare service facilities. And also the panic the parents have got while the organizations call them back to work and they're still looking for childcare facility availability. Can we do something to avoid this happen again in our city? The answer is yes. This property is located in, right in the requirement of provincial and cities. A better, we are working to build the Calgary a better city for children and our future. Remember, it is better, easier, and more cost efficient to build a child than repair an adult. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for members of council for Mr. Kwan? Mr. Kwan? Is it Sir? <laughs> I think Alderman Chabot has a question for you, sorry. Okay. Thank you, Your Worship. Mr. Wang, um, I, as you know, there's been a couple of concerns raised by some of the neighbors. Yep. And in your submission, you make reference to the fact that you want to provide high quality child care services. Yep. So is this something that you've been prov providing in the past? I know it's not part of the land use, but it is 
part of the concerns? Uh, my wife, not me, I am a professional engineer by, by trade. My wife working in a child care service as a manager, as a teacher for like almost 20 years. So we are trying to get into this kind of service. And my wife is a certified level three daycare teacher at the provincial of Albert. Thank you. That does help give me some confidence, and I'm sure the adjacent residents. Now, insofar as the the deck that I referenced before, mm -hmm. um, there is some question as to the aesthetics of it. Is that something you plan on um, making look relatively consistent with the rest of the community? Uh, this deck was built under the application of city city's development permission. And it would, it, I went through all of the signation with the planning, planning department. Yeah. And they said, well, first of all, this property, I bought it just for daycare. And I want to keep the children in our property safe. We need a deck. I don't want the children run to the street. That's the first point. And this deck is low, a kind of low, lower than 20, 28 inches. So according to city's bylaw and either it's not required to be like, say, all those fencing, everything to be built up, like as high as meter. I, I, I'm not a cold, cold guy. But the gentleman, after I finished this one, a gentleman from the city of cold, cold and safety guy was there to do the inspection, and he's happy with that. So you completed inspection? You received yes, a completion? Yes, I inspection. completed application and inspection. So the preliminary inspection as well as the completion inspection? Yes. Okay. Thank and you the Coke gentleman was happy with what I did. Good. Well, Your Worship, I, I would like to make some comments once we've heard from anyone who wants to speak against the application. On Very well. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Any, any other questions for the applicant? Thank you, sir. And I will remind uh, members of council that really we're talking about the land use. So please try to keep your questions uh, specific to the issues on the land use. Um, anyone else wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone else in favor? Anyone wish to speak in opposition to this proposal? Anyone opposed? All right, then discussion on this proposed bylaw change. Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, well, as you recall, I did ask for this to be tabled last, last council meeting, and the reason that I asked for that is because some of the adjacent neighbors were concerned about the uh, ongoing issues related to this property um, in anticipation that, or with the assumption that the, uh, the tenants were actually the owners. And as it turns out, the tenants were actually only just renters. And uh, Mr. Huang was trying to recapture some of his initial investment pending the approval for this facility. Um, he has now gone and, as you may have copies of, contacted all of the adjacent neighbors. I, I spoke with one of the appellants recently who was uh, at least satisfied with the fact that uh, Mr. Wang has made attempts to contact him to try and resolve some of the outstanding issues. He, it's an ideal site. It's on a corner lot. It's adjacent to uh, uh, 47th Street, which is a fairly major uh, collector road, which ties into 4th Avenue, which subsequently can tie you either to the Memorial Drive by a 47th or 44th Street by a 4th Avenue. Um, so there's great connectivity from a mobility perspective. So I don't see that this will provide any undue uh, impacts onto the community from a transportation perspective. So uh, in light of that, Your Worship, I'm prepared to uh, move the recommendations of CPC in three readings. Thank you. And I think I have Alderman Marr as a seconder. Uh, Alderman Stevenson. Very well. Any further discussion on this item? Okay, so then on first reading of bylaw 101D20, oh, excuse me, first on the recommendations. Uh, on the recommendations, are we agreed? Any opposed? Then on the associated bylaw. On first reading of bylaw 101D2010, first reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? Second reading of the bylaw. On second reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? and third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried, thank you. That takes us then to CPC 2010-126 Eau Claire and its associated
bylaws. Oh, Alderman Farrell. Thank you. Is this from you, Mr. Cope, this note? Uh, from uh, the applicant's representative, John Merritt. Oh, okay. Apparently there's a request before the public hearing that there's a request to table it. Yes, okay. Request from the applicant to table this until February. There's um, some question about the title. The, the note that I have here, uh, Alderman Farrell, is only to table the third reading. That's not what Oh, there's I more information now? Uh, if I may, uh, 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 Mr. Mayor, uh, just been indicated that there is some uh, discussion over some of the content of the existing bylaw. Uh, the applicant would like an opportunity to discuss that with the downtown team and, if necessary, re-advertise and bring this back in February. Okay, so Alderman Farrell, you're making a motion to table this item until? Second. February. February. I heard someone say second. Alderman Lowe? Okay. Thank you. Any discussion on the, well, no, it's non-debatable, except the time of the motion. So, any discussion on the time of the motion? Okay. Uh, was it February 6th, Alderman Farrell? Is that right? First meeting in February? Okay, thank you. First public hearing in February in any case. All right, so on the motion to table until the first public hearing in February, are we agreed? Any opposed? Eau Claire, CPC 2010-126. Thank you for that. All right, so are we agreed then? Any opposed? All right, carried. So that one is tabled until February. That takes us to CPC 2010-127 and associated bylaws, uh, Windsor Park. Mr. Cope. Thank you, Your Worship. Proposed redesignation is located on the edge of the community of Windsor Park. The parcel in question is outlined red on this location map uh, and fronts onto McLeod Trail Southwest at 57th Avenue Southwest. The site itself is the former location of a number of various car, car dealerships. Uh, proposed redesignation is to take the land from the existing Secor 3 F3.0 H46 land use designation and redesignate the lands to Secor 2. F3 H46 Commercial Corridor 2 District. As is uh, the FAR and height is not changing as a result of this proposed redesignation, the substantial change will be to allow for residential uses to occur on the site, creating a true mixed use uh, opportunity for the site itself. The proposed uh, redesignation is supported by the community of Windsor Park, and CPC is recommending that Council adopt the proposed redesignation. Uh, of the 1.7 acres from Secor 3 to the Secor 2 designations with the noted uh, height and FAR limitations. Great, thanks Mr. Cope. Uh, Madam Clerk, um, a note that one of the screens is kaput. Yes, Your Worship, we are investigating it with uh, corporate properties. Thank you. Questions uh, for administration of clarification on this one. Questions of clarification, Alderman Carra? Uh, sorry, no, I was just asking about the screen, which was purple and then went kaput. Purple is a good thing, Alderman Carra. Um, they're working on it. Sorry, sorry for the folks to my left who have to crane their necks a little bit. Uh, any questions of clarification uh, for administration? All right, seeing none, any members of the public who would like to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone who would like to speak in favor of the proposal? Good morning, Your Worship and members of the Council. My name is Manichu, and I'm here to answer any questions you may have on this application. Uh, any questions for Mr. Chu, uh, Alderman Hodges? Thank you, Worship. Uh, Mr. Chu, there's reference to the Chinook Station area plan in the report. Um, how far is this site from the Chinook Station? Can you tell me? We're just outside the 600-meter radius. Yeah. Can, you, can someone show me, perhaps, uh, one of the staff uh, where the station is located. Which 61st I think Avenue, two blocks west of McLeod Trail, of so it's, it's south of what you see on the map. East side of McLeod, I think. Yeah. Not even south of there. A little bit south of where the N arrow is, I think. Yeah, even a little bit further south than that. Down? Over? <laughs> to where it says north. Yeah, it looks so like it's a it's little bit south of there, I think. Well outside the 600 meters. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. 
Other questions for Mr. Chu? Very well then. Any anyone else who wishes to speak? Thank in, you. Oh, Mr. Chu, did you have anything else to say? Sorry. Anyone else who wishes to speak in favor? Anyone else in favor? Anyone who wishes to speak against this proposal? Anyone who wishes to speak against? All right, then to members of council, Alderman Pincott. Well, thank you. I will move the uh, recommendations in three readings of Bylaw 109D 2010. And just for a point of information, the boundary of the Chinook Station area plan is across the street. Uh, so the, the boundary of the plan area is 56th. Thanks. Do I have a seconder? Thanks, Alderman Jones. Any further discussion on this one? So then on the recommendations, are we agreed? Any opposed? All right, let's move then to three readings of the proposed bylaw 109D 2010. First reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? Second reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? Authorization for third reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? And third reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Okay. Oh, that takes us to CPC 2010-128, Richmond. Mr. Cope. Thank you, Your Worship. Proposed redesignation is in the community of <laughs> Richmond. Uh, the parcel in question is outlined on red and faces on to 17th Avenue Southwest at 24th Street Southwest. Proposed redesignation will take the lands from the existing CCOR 1 district with a uh, FAR of 4.5 and a height limitation of 30 meters and change the district to the CCOR 1 district with a uh, up dated FAR of 4.7 and a height limitation of 32 meters. Proposed redesignation is to reflect the actual as-built uh, condition of the building that is on the site. Uh, the proposed redesignation has been supported by the community association and we understand that the, uh, there has been some areas within the existing building that were filled in resulting in the requirement for the additional FAR and height. The uh, building in question is shown here. This is taken from the uh, northeast looking southwest, a uh, residential building or office above the podium level with offices located adjacent to the street on 24th and 17th Avenue. In that respect, uh, there is a minor um, requirement for a uh, change to the existing area, area redevelopment plan. Uh, that is simply with text to reflect that the area is subject to uh, a new land use designation to bring it into conformance with the ARP. In that respect, CPC is recommending the Council adopt that proposed amendment to the Richmond Area Redevelopment Plan and give three readings to Bylaw 40P 2010. And secondly, to adopt the proposed redesignation from CCOR 1 F 4.5 H30 to CCOR 1 F 4.7 H32 and give three readings to bylaw 110 D 2010. Thanks, Mr. Cope. Any questions of clarification for administration? Alderman Chabot. Yeah, very briefly, Mr. Cope, so what's the intent of this land use? Just basically to bring it into conformity with the existing built form? That's correct. Nothing else other than that? Nothing else. Thank you, Worship. No further questions. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Any other questions of clarification for administration? All right, then, any members of the public who would like to speak in favor of this proposal? We're making you jump up again. and down a little bit, Mr. Chu. Your Worship, members of the Council, I'm here to answer any questions you may have. And just a slight clarification, the revised FAR requested is 4.74. Alderman Chabot? Well, I was going to approve it at 4.7, but I don't know about 4.74. <laughs> um, no, sorry, Your Worship. Uh, Mr. Chu, I'm just curious as to why the application didn't come in with the correct um, height modifiers as well as correct FAR originally. And, and was the community, did the community have an opportunity to have some input on this at, at the current land use? and what were their thoughts on it? 
from your recollection? Mr. Your Worship, the original proposal was for 4.74, but during the construction stages, some changes were made to the mechanical system, etc., and they added a little bit to the build form. Mm -hmm. So this changes to reflect what is there. There's no increase in the density. There's no increase in any areas except the build form has changed a little bit. So it has to be 4.74. So no additional units were added to this facility? No, Your Worship, no additional units were added. And the height modifier was because of? The, the mechanical animal. system that was required to be installed. Right. Thank you for those clarification points here. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Alderman Kara. Yeah, <clears throat> my question is, uh, just, I just want to get a sense of um, time and expense to this project for making that very minor variation. Uh, you know, it's obviously still under construction, but how much extra time and expense has gone to the developer for having to bring this minor variation forward? bring it into conformance with our, our rules and regulations. Your Worship, yeah. the question uh, better we ask the administration than us. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure that's an appropriate question for a land use public hearing, though a very interesting one. That's all I wanted to do is just <laughs> make that. Thanks, Alderman Kara. Other questions for Mr. Chu? All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in favor of this proposal? In favor of this proposal? Anyone wish to speak against this proposal? Anyone wish to speak against this proposal? All right, uh, members of council, uh, Alderman, Lo you're moving it? Do I have a seconder? Uh, Alderman Chabot, thank you. Any discussion on this one? All right then, so on the recommendations of administration, you all right? Okay. On the recommendations of administration, are we agreed? Any opposed? Okay, we're going to take the two bylaws separately then. So we'll start with proposed bylaw 40P 2010. Uh, first reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Second reading, are we agreed? Authorization for third reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? Third reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? Very well carried. And then on proposed bylaw 110D 2010, first reading, are we agreed? Second reading, are we agreed? Authorization for third reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? Third reading, are we agreed? Very well then, carried. That takes us then to CPC 2010-129 and associated bylaws, Aspen Woods. Mr. Cope. Thank you, Your Worship. Proposed redesignation is located in the community of Aspen Woods and affects the lands outlined in red on the location map accessed from 14th Avenue Southwest. Proposed redesignation will take the lands from the existing SSPR district, which is intended for reserve purposes, and redesignate the lands to R2 residential one and two dwelling district, uh, which is consistent with the other lands located to the east along 14th Avenue Southwest. The lands in question became surplus in terms of a potential municipal reserve dedication as a result of the increase in environmental reserve dedication, which is occurring on the overall development concept area, which is outlined in the dotted line in that area. The area shown as SCRI uh, on the easterly portion of the site is going from what was to be a storm pond to now it is going to be a, um, a storm uh, naturalized area and it will therefore be dedicated as an environmental reserve. As a result, the overall uh, gross developable area of the entire site has been reduced, resulting in a reduced uh, requirement for municipal reserve dedication, and therefore the site will uh, allow for additional two lots to occur within the development area. The site in question is currently treed, uh, with the house you can see under construction being directly adjacent to the uh, proposed R2 lots. Uh, in this respect, it is recommended that uh, Council adopt the proposed redesignation and give three readings to bylaw 111 D 2010. Thank you. Questions of clarification for administration, Alderman Hodges. Thank you, Worship. Uh, uh, Mr. Cope, I, I take it that uh, there was an environmental reserve designation on the lands, but no MR designation on the lands at the present time? That's correct. The entire area has been approved as part of an outline plan. 
with the R2 lots that you can see there having already been registered. Uh, there is no municipal reserve or environmental reserve that has been dedicated to this point in time. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Alderman Hodges. Alderman Lowe. Thank you. Mr. Cope, do you have an aerial photograph, a current aerial photograph of the area? Uh, slightly dated, but yes, we do have a... There we are there. So when I look at that, uh, what I see is uh, the whole, that whole of that panhandle corner is treed at the moment. That's correct. The lands to the south and to the west and to the southwest have all been stripped of any vegetation. And they have been constructed upon, yes. Yeah. So, but about half of what could be termed as a treed area remains as a buffer, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And access, access to the area remains unchanged through the... Access would be from 14th Avenue. Yeah. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Lowe. Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. Mr. Cope, you said there was no municipal reserve ded dedication. Is that because of a previous agreement with the MD? or uh, It's just a matter of timing, actually. Uh, reserves are owing for the entire subject area that just left the screen. <laughs> the outline plan covered the area that is uh, outlined in the dotted uh, line there. Uh, the first phase included the R2 along 14th Avenue, but the balance of the area has not yet been registered on a tentative plan basis. When that occurs, that is what will dedicate the municipal reserve and environmental reserve parcels. So does that not further encumber the balance of the site to try and make up that difference? Uh, actually, because of the, the additional environmental reserve dedication, the amount of municipal reserve has been reduced. Uh, therefore, the area affected by this land use redesignation is not required to fulfill the 10% reserve dedication. Although it, it doesn't really have any bearing on it, does it? Only, only by choice? There's still an obligation, is there not? Uh, the obligation for 10% municipal reserve is still there and will be fulfilled. Okay. Um, so now, as far as this particular site is concerned, it's, it's identified on the map as SPR. That's Does correct. Does that mean it went through uh, JUCC for their approval? Uh, no, uh, the land, that's a land use term. Uh, it is provided for in terms of where municipal reserve might occur. Okay. But uh, their designation under, la uh, under land titles would be the MR. Designation under land use bylaw is the SSPR. So it didn't need to go through joint use coordinating committee. That's correct. That's good because we wouldn't be here yet. Yeah. Thank you, Your Worship. No further questions. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Alderman Farrell. Thank you. I, I just wanted to point out the photograph with all the aspen, and this would have been this area would no, have been a perfect photograph. perfect location for conservation subdivision. So I I'll continue to bring it up. No. until we see that um, no. implemented in the city of Calgary. Perhaps Alderman Putmans and I could talk about it. All right, a reminder that we are still on questions of clarification for administration, uh, not yet on debate, though Though the irony of the community called Aspen, removing the Aspens is not lost on many um, in the room. Uh, Alderman Putmans. Thank you, Worship, uh, Mr. Cope. What it would be the width between the um, redesignated uh, land and the alleyway behind the existing houses to the wet, west? What, what square foot uh, and feet or meters? Don't have the uh, actual plan with me. I would estimate that to be in the order of 60 to 70 feet. So approximately two lots. That's right. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Putmans. Alderman Carra, questions for administration? sort of asked and answered by your worship. I'm just going to ask Mr. Cope. The area is called? Aspen Woods. And the site is currently covered with? Trees. Aspen Woods? I am presuming they're Aspen. Okay. <laughs> and, okay, thank you. 
some some of the the, the botanists around the room are, are, are questioning whether those are actually aspens, but uh, I won't push that on you, Mr. Cope. Um, I think they are. Um, <laughs> Alderman Putman's questions of clarification. Uh, Your Worship, uh, the tone of the discussion is, is amusing. The reality is is that um, development, uh, previous aerial photos show that the entire area at one point was treed. And in fact, I might go so far as to say large parts of Calgary have been treed. Um, developers have purchased and negotiated with the city in good faith to build out much needed housing for which there is a strong market demand. and. Um, I, I think it's appropriate to recognize that appropriate allocations for municipal reserve and in fact great efforts made to preserve amenities are being made and that perhaps where we all live currently was treated at one point. So I, I think that point in fairness has to be entered into the discussion and put on the record. Thank you. Fair enough, Alderman Putman. Alderman Hodges. So just going to comment, Your Worship, I didn't know we were into debate yet. No, we're not. <laughs> Thanks, Alderman Carra. Members of the public who would like to speak in favor of this proposal, anyone who'd like to speak in favor? Your Worship, members of Council, Kathy Oberg with Brown and Associates Planning Group. I have some paperwork to hand out. Um, one of them is a letter from the Community Association that was received yesterday. Another is a concept plan of the overall um, Aspen Woods community and a cross-section that identifies and answers a lot of the questions that were just asked. This application for 0.11 hectares is considered a technical refinement resulting, resulting from the completion of detailed design of the storm pond east of the proposed Stage 1 roadway. At the time of the Aspen Woods Stage 1 approval in December of 2009, an agreement was made between Dundee and City Administration to, at the time of detailed design, review the possibility of providing a higher quality, natural amenity, environmental reserve stormwater pond instead of a more engineered storm stormwater management facility. Detailed design was undertaken earlier this year for the proposed storm pond facility. Administration has concurred with our team that the higher quality natural amenity design for the 1.05 hectare east pond meets the environmental reserve standards and should replace the original stormwater management facility on a public utility lot designation. Due to the increased environmental reserve on the subject site, there is a minor reduction of 0.11 hectares to the total municipal reserve requirement being requested by administration. The total percentage of municipal and environmental reserve for the approved application is 37% of the total area. With the proposed changes before you today, the percentage of reserve dedication will increase by 3% and will be 40% of the total area. The Aspen Woods Community Plan identified the ravine area on the subject site as the environmentally significant area, while the tree stand that includes the subject 0.11 hectares redesignation site was not recognized as an area of significance. That being said, Dundee, as illustrated in their Wentworth development to the north, recognizes the benefit that existing vegetation brings to their communities. These proposed lots will contain a caveat protecting up to four meters of trees in the rear yards of these lots, as does all the other lots along that 14th Avenue roadway. A significant amount of time was spent with parks and administration to review areas where the 0.11 hectares of municipal reserve could be removed from the original approved subdivision plan. Through the review of vegetation, grading and existing slopes, it was determined by Parks and by Dundee that this was the best location for conversion of municipal reserve to residential in exchange for the substantial addition of environmental reserve. We have read the letters submitted in opposition to this application and Dundee has contacted four of the adjacent residents. Comments came from the Community Association and have stated that the Community Association is neither in support nor against the proposed application. The major resident concerns are as follows. The removal of the proposed narrow strip of MR land will affect the enjoyment of their homes and those traveling along 14th Avenue. And since they purchased their homes, there was a green space designated behind them. We've prepared a cross-section that illustrates the interface between the proposed land use amendment and the Aspen Cliff community, as well as those traveling along 14th Avenue. We believe that there will be no impact on the adjacent Aspen Cliff lots. The existing Aspen tree stand and tree stand and underbrush present a dense population of trees and a visual vegetation screening will be maintained. 
The proposal would result in the construction of two single-family homes along 14th Avenue. The municipal reserve width along 14th Avenue would be 25 meters, it would be a 25 meter tree buffer between the proposed lots and the rear property line of the homes located within the Aspen Cliff community. In addition to it being 25 meters in width, this MR parcel is also elevated at this location and sits between four to six feet above grade of the adjacent regional pathway. We recognize that the parcel was zoned as a park and designated a municipal reserve with our 2009 approval. Dundee and its consultants have worked diligently upon this land use approval to complete the detailed design of the storm pond and resolve the land uses. An application was made immediately after the design was completed. Another concern of residents is the removal of a heavily treed area having an effect on the duck pond and threatening the lives of the organisms within the system. It is park's mandate to ensure the long-term viability of this wetland and as such all the appropriate buffering and water control measures were provided with this December 2009 approval. These areas were designated ER. Urban development changes the natural environment. Um, many parts of Aspen Woods including the Aspen Cliff subdivision were covered in trees prior to development. The trade-off in this application is 0.11 hectares of lower quality municipal reserve being exchanged for 1.05 hectares of a higher quality wetland a tenfold increase in area. Dundee and its environmental consultants are confident that this new environmental reserve land will be an area used for continued wildlife and bird use. In addition, vegetation will continue to thrive along the eastern boundary of 14th Avenue and be of benefit to the overall community. We hope that Council will support the redesignation from SPR to R2 and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Um, Alderman Hodges. Yes, uh, thank you, Worship. Ms. Oberg, uh, this is an Aspen Wood Stage 1 yes. uh, site plan you've distributed, and you mentioned uh, new environmental reserve of the 1.0, well, on the screen, the 1.05 hectares. Yes. Is any or all of this uh, included in a development agreement for this part of Aspen Woods? In other words, is there any obligation to dedicate any of this still in the works? I know that the subdivision had gone through and those, all the components except for the bottom corner were included in that subdivision. So I, I believe they've worked through the subdivision development agreement. I could, that would be a question I could get Dundee to answer. Okay. But it did, it was included within the tentative plan except for the bottom, the bottom corner because we were still trying to sort out yeah. the designation. I wouldn't have asked except you used the term new, new. environmental reserve. Words mean something in this business quite a bit actually so I'm just asking because of the word yeah. new. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks Alderman Hodges. Alderman Putmans. Yes, Your Worship. Um, thank you and thank you for your presentation. Could you please outline briefly um, the public consultation process, public notice process that you've been through with this development? It, it was a standard process as far as um, when we submitted it. Um, when, we, when we went through it, we were thinking of it as a, a technical refi like technical correction to the, to the reserve numbers. Um, and at the time, there were, there were definitely parts of Aspen Cliff still under development. Um, it wasn't until we were contacted that there was some opposition to, to the application and, and we made contact with all the names, all the residents that were offered to us to, to contact. But um, we didn't go through a, a, say, a full open house kind of scenario with, with this small application, so that, that wasn't included in it. But again, we made all efforts once we found out that there was some opposition. And again, a lot of the, the some of the other, we, until the agenda came out, we didn't have you know, a full idea of all the issues that were raised until we saw the agenda. Thank you. Okay. Alderman Carra. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just following with uh, Alderman Hodge's assertion that words mean something, in your presentation, uh, you stated that we're getting a tenfold increase of high quali higher quality environmental reserve in exchange for, I guess, one tenth lower quality municipal reserve. Can you qualify that sort of statement of quality? Because, I mean, it seems to me we're talking about an existing Aspen tree stand, not just something that's sort of like left over after development. Um, there are components, and, and again, back when, when the application was approved back uh, last year with in regards especially to that storm pond in the corner, or the pond in the corner, there are some um, wetland qualities in there, not the entire area, and there was discussion um, many years ago when the stormwater management plan was done with parks and, and for this area, um, it was always designated that this area would contain a stormwater pond. So. There's definitely a lot of qualities in the detailed design that was done in order to 
kind of meet the two, you know, the two requirements of, of, of having the stormwater requirement there for this area, this kind of quadrant, um, and then being able to, to keep those and enhance them as well, that the enhancement um, in the parts that um, have to be engineered um, will bring that environment there to be, to be a quite a substantial uh, piece to it. But I, under, I recognize what you're saying that, I mean, we're, we're taking a, you know, a, a chunk out to... Yeah, so I, let, me, let me rephrase my question into, um, is your assertion that the environmental reserve in question is higher quality because it's environmental reserve as opposed to municipal reserve? Or is your assertion that an engineered wetland is of higher environmental quality than an existing area of tree to aspen woods? And that question was posed to our environmental consultant when we were weighing, even when we went through the process as to where would be um, things that were um, of substance to, to maintain on the, on the land. I would go with his, his recommendation that um, as we had removed partial parts of the trees but kept what we could along 14th Avenue, um, definitely it was stated at that time that um, the wet pond on both sides of the road um, that's where the wildlife exists, the birds are, um, and as an overall community amenity to maintain that coexisting of ourselves and, and wildlife. Um, I'm not an environmental um, cons uh, planner, but um, I mean, that could be, I guess, posed to, to someone of that background. I'm going off that we, we believe that this corner, as does parks, that this is is an area that is of benefit and to have all the characteristics that will be in there. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Alderman Carr, Alderman Chabot, and then me. Um, just briefly, so um, Ms. Oberg, what you're saying is that if, I, if I'm reading this correctly, is 1.05 hectares of environmental reserve is of greater significance than 0.11 hectares of aspen woods. That's what we believe that would be. Thank you for that. Thank, Thank you, Your Worship. Just to be clear, Alderman Chabot, 0.11 hectares of Aspen Reserve. Um, Ms. Olberg, I've looked through the public submissions and I noticed there are a number of submissions from homeowners who have not yet moved in along Aspen Cliff Close Southwest. Just to make sure that I'm reading this correctly, these folks are still getting a regional pathway and 20 meters of um, Aspen Woods behind their homes before we get to this particular, um, this particular lot, is that correct? They had 50 and now they're having 25? Yes. Okay, yes. I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, um, thank you. Alderman Carr, did you have another question of clarification? Okay. Um, any other questions from Ms. Olberg? All right, anyone else then who wishes, thank you very much. Anyone else then who wishes to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone who wishes to speak in favor? Anyone who wishes to speak against this proposal? Good morning. So please identify yourself and then you can proceed. Yes. Good morning, Your Worship and members of Council. My name is Donna Cunnan. Um, that's spelled C-U-N-N-I-N. -N -N. And um, I've come to this Council meeting today to address the issue of land use redesignation. And uh, we, my family and others, as you have read in your agenda, are strongly opposed to this recommendation for rezoning in our neighbourhood. And we believe um, in fairness that this issue should be tabled uh, for further study to find a solution that suppo supports not only the developer, but also the adjacent homeowners, of which we are one. Um, we live in Aspen and we live adjacent to the land in question. My husband and I entered into an agreement with our builder in November of 2009. And we believed at that time that our home would back onto a large stand of aspen forest and a protected class five wetland. We learned in December of last year that that plan was approved by city administration and we were pleased to go ahead with our building. Um, however, this summer um, we were out for a walk, walking along 14th Avenue and we saw a yellow sign 20 by 24 inches 
which indicated a request for rezoning. I question the due process by which adjacent homeowners are advised of land rezoning if this is the manner in which we are to learn of these requests. I spoke with a Ms. King in the planning department and I was informed that the only way we could have input into this decision at this time was to come here today at the end of the piece. We were never throughout this process notified directly by the city or the developer for a request for rezoning. It was only through our own curiosity and our own determination that we learned of Dundee's plan. I have spoken with a developer and he tells us, as we've just seen, that this request is for what he called a correction to the original plan. We and others would like to see this correction made elsewhere. You can see from the plan that it is a very large development and we believe that two additional lots could be found somewhere that wouldn't require a redesignation of reserve land and a substantial loss of trees and wildlife. The irony again, our neighborhood is called Aspen Woods. If you allow more of our woods to be taken out, perhaps we should be here requesting a renaming. Before you make a decision to allow the developer to turn an existing green space into more housing, I ask that you consider the people who bought homes in Aspen Cliff Estates because of that Aspen Grove which surrounds it. We purchased our lots with a reliance on the existing development plan with the good faith that it would be the plan going forward. Now to consider changing the plan after the fact is inequitable and inappropriate. We made our decision based on the development plan approved by the city and it would be unfair for this council to open the door to change that now. I would ask that this new council do what you said you would do and change the way you do business. We see this as an opportunity for you to demonstrate your conviction to your election slogans. We made a substantial investment in this neighborhood based on good faith in public documents. We had hoped to see our investment increase in value. We didn't plan on seeing the value drop because our city council voted to support a huge developer. We, like our neighbors, would have written to this council, who have written to this council, pardon me, I believe there's seven others. We are strongly opposed to the designation and we trust you will support us. We believe that adequate consultation and informed and equitable approach to reaching this important decision are your responsibility and that I trust you will fulfill it. A balanced and healthy community that grows in accordance with sound planning principles is what I want for this generation and those to come. Maintaining adequate green space is the key to this. I thank you for your time and your attention. I'd be happy to try and answer questions. Um, there was an issue about traffic. I don't know if you were notified by Weber Academy, but there's a big problem on that street between Weber Academy and Calgary Academy. Hundreds of students and families using that access to get into that community. Another consideration that I haven't heard mentioned today. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today, Ms. Cunnan. And I think we do have uh, some questions for you. Alderman Marr. I'll try to answer them. Thank you. So. Um, un unfortunately, one of the ways that we are communicating to citizens on land use and development permits and things of that nature, one is by the sign, and the second one is, of course, it's, it's uh, printed in the newspaper and advertised for two weeks. Obviously, unless you're specifically looking for something in your area, you're, it, it makes it very, very difficult to come across. Are you connected at all to your community association? Um, well, we're not, we don't really have, well, we're part of Strathcona, I understand, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But are you, are you personally connected? Are you or no. no one? No. Okay, because uh, that's often another way that, that uh, communities will reach out to their, their neighbours, if you will, and talk about issues yeah, like I, this. The problem has been timing, and that's why we've requested a tabling to try to, there's a lot of information we don't have, mm -hmm. um, you know. There's lots of things we could add at this point. I'm not sure it's the place or time, but um, you know, there's lots of things that could be said and done. So whereabouts are you in this particular? Um... We back on to that SSPR. We're about four lots in from the corner, maybe five, not right sure. There? Yeah, I think right so. there? Yeah, I think so. Okay, and so your concerns are that you're gonna lose some tree coverage and uh, green space and things of that nature, really? 
Exactly. And, and when when you first purchased your house, you, you you mentioned that you met with your your builder and and the developer, and it was understood at the time. It was in advance of the plan approval. It was November, but the plan was approved in December of 2009, mm -hmm. and that was when we said, "Okay, perfect. We'll go ahead." Okay, and I'm guessing by what you're what you're getting at then is that had you known that this was going to come, you would not have chose to purchase that that lot. You would have moved to maybe another one over there, or Perhaps, is that is that yeah. what you're? We we moved there because we didn't want to look on another house, right? Mm -hmm. We moved from Kelvin Grove, beautiful established neighborhood, out here to where there's few trees, and said, okay, I'll live here only if we can look on trees and not another barbecue. So. Mm -hmm. That was our decision. Okay, well, those are my it questions. Changed probably, yeah. Sorry, I didn't. Catch it that. may have changed if those trees, if we knew they were going to be taken out. Right. Okay. Well, and and one last question. How long would you suggest it would be uh, ta to table this for, so you could have a more fulsome discussion with the uh, with your? With I your think two to three months would be reasonable. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Alderman Marr. Alderman Hodges. Your Worship, uh, thank you. Uh, Ma'am, uh, you do live on uh, that lot, right? You're a resident homeowner. We took, home, uh, we took ownership in July. Yeah. Well, I just want to uh, put this question out there. And uh, as Alderman Marr has said, uh, there's a system of uh, posting a site, putting an advertisement, at least in one newspaper much well ahead of the public hearing but there's also a practice the department has of sending adjacent property owners letters to we let, never received a let letter. them know there's a land use application adjacent to them. no never okay so if you hadn't seen the sign you wouldn't you may be unaware and the photographs that you have show what's going on on that street there's nothing but trucks so I mean yeah. unless you're walking behind the trucks you're not going to see a little yellow sign I understand that ma'am that's a that's what I'm trying to clarify. Uh, as you said, you happened to be out walking and saw it one day. Thank you. And they posted another one in October, but there were more trucks there, so I'm sure nobody saw that one. Uh, you should have, in my opinion, in my area, people get letters. There's no reason you shouldn't receive a we letter. We did not receive a letter. Okay. Thank you, Worship. Thanks, Alderman Hodges. Alderman Putmans. Uh, yes, Your Worship, thank you. Perhaps a point of order, would it be possible to have an, someone from administration speak to this matter of uh, notification? We, we can do that uh, when we finish the public submissions. Alderman Kara? Asked and answered, I'm sorry. Alderman Chabot? Yes, um, and thank you for being here today. Now, you mentioned something about when you purchased your home, you wanted to be able to continue to look upon trees, but um, based on where you've suggested that your home is, there's really not going to be any visible change from your home, is there? There is. I invite you to come and see the corner. And I'm not sure of the measurements that are presented by Brown and Associates. I mean, these are the kinds of questions that um, we would like to find out for our own sake, if that's truly the amount of green space left there. Okay, because it does look like the trees are going to be retained in that area? Some, but not all. There's a, a large tract of land, as you can see, where there's lots of opportunity to add two lots. They're not lots that overlook a beautiful wetland, but there's places they be, could be given that land that if it is owed to them, we'd like to see it considered. And uh, uh, Ms. Mr. Orr, can you put that overhead map up, please, if you would be so kind? The, um, the topographical, the overhead view, the one where it shows the trees and whatnot. Yeah, so that one there does show that the bulk of the trees are all in that area. So you're saying because of the density of the trees that's being removed that it's going to have a visual impact? I will see those houses from my my house through the trees yeah okay thank you and so it's not an issue of walking around the community and the loss of uh, trees so much as your your own visual impact it's not just a NIMBY issue it's an issue of process it's an issue of beauty it's an in, in issue of 
wildlife. When they started taking the trees, you know, I was in the backyard, saw two deer running around, like, wow, what's happening? And we hear owls in there, there's coyotes, you know, animals live there. I'm not going to appeal to that sensibility because, you know, why bother? I, but I, I am going to appeal to the sensibility of process. I wish I could understand animals like that. But thank, thank you for you. your presentation here today. Thank you. Alderman Lowe. Yeah, thank you. Ms. Coonan, you said that uh, <clears throat> when you purchased your property, uh, your developer and builder made some Who was your developer? Uh, Brymore Developments. Okay, it was it's not Dundee? No. Okay. Thank you, Your Worship. <coughs> Thanks, Alderman Lowe. Any other questions for Ms. Cunnan? Again, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. We know that this process is arduous and requires people to give up a lot of their personal time, but it's important that Council hear from you uh, on these matters. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Any others who would like to speak in opposition to this proposal? Anyone else who would like to speak in opposition? Uh, Mayor, Alderman, my name is Oscar Feck. I acknowledge uh, Cunning's uh, comments about the city process. I just want to make a couple of comments. Uh, I have some land at, at Maggie Trail Northeast, and, uh, and this is part of the system that we have lived in. And I've been talking to the city hall for years. I've talked to Alderman uh, uh, Stevenson, and uh, we tried to negotiate. And my land is zoned commercial industrial. Uh, it seemed like they down zoned it to R1. And I was never no notified. And uh, I tried to make a deal with them to put this four lane through on Major Trail. They're stifling me, and uh, they're uh, like, yeah. The, the process says, look, if, if you're not going to sell it to us, we're going to expropriate. That's what uh, Alderman Stevenson just, mentioned to me a couple bit, of three years ago. Just be ago. a bit careful, Mr. Yeah, Beck. No, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm always trying to protect you in yeah, these I know. things. It's, and it's, it's, I, thank you very your, much, I understand your question as to process, so yeah. stick to that, please. Yeah, okay. No, but you know what I'm saying, though? I hope it's going to change because, uh, and they're supposed to put an under, uh, underpath because it is zoned commercial but they want to down zone it. And why build a two lane Métis Trail where they could build a, f a four lane, six lane now and don't come back two or three years later and start over again? It's half the price when you build it now. See, this is the process, Mayor. I hope you will take uh, my uh, appreciation what I mentioned in the lady mentioned to you because things must change. It shouldn't be who you know to get things approved. That's wrong. That's not democracy. It's, it's frightening what's happened in the last many years. I've been here since 52, and I know what's going on. And it's, Mayor, expect a new alderman, please, analyze everything that's happening. We must change the system now. I hope you will take my land up the north in consideration. I hope we don't have to go through procedures where we gonna fight over it. Let's do it now. Okay. Build, make the trail the way it should be built. Have your uh, uh, staff negotiate with me in an honest, honorable way. Again, Mr. Feck, don't get into the other land issue. No, 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 I'm not. Because you, we, we could be jeopardizing things going forward. But no, I, I appreciate but this, your comments this on This has been going on for so many years, mm -hmm. and person gets tired after a while. You know what I'm saying. I hear you. Okay, thank thank you. you very much. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to speak in opposition to this proposal? All right, then. Uh, members of Council, Alderman Putmans, this would be the appropriate time. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, if I may speak with the member, thank you, Mr. Cope. Um, I'm wondering, there must be precedent for how you've managed in the past when there are developments being proposed with adjacent landowners, lots may have been purchased, not built on. How, is there any methods you have to get in touch with such people who have a vested interest, clearly, in fact, perhaps in 
elevated sense of, uh, of concern because they have just recently made the purchase, and I'm wondering what mechanisms you might have to address this problem. We try to be absolutely consistent on the notification procedures. Uh, notification procedures include sending letters to adjacent properties who would abut the subject lands or would abut the lands if it were not for a road or a river or something to that effect. In this particular case, because there is an intervening parcel, the landowners along Aspen Cliff Close Southwest would not have received a letter of notification. The other methods we use for notification to a, a wider audience is to advertise this public hearing in the, uh, in the Calgary Herald, uh, as well as at the start of the process, posting the site, and at the end of the process for the public hearing, posting the site again with contact numbers for information. Interesting. Are there, what have you, have there been precedents to this type of problem before? Uh, certainly on occasion, uh, because of, of our effort to be absolutely consistent, so we cannot be uh, criticized for doing something differently in different situations. Uh, something like this is slightly awkward. Obviously, they are fairly close, but in terms of our uh, guidelines, which is out of the Act, it's the same requirements that are used to advertise subdivisions under the Municipal Government Act. Uh, so we try to be absolutely consistent uh, so that we're not changing procedures for different items. Oh, so you can't elevate the level of notice requirement for one and not another? Uh, not without uh, direct request, I suppose, from Council. Uh, essentially, if we were to do that, the next time, which would be an item which may not be as a, of a critical nature, we would, of course, be uh, uh, looked at for why didn't we do it in that situation. So we try to be absolutely consistent in all respects. Would you have done anything differently on this project? No. We do, of course, circulate to the local community association. Uh, and depending on the community association, they also have their various means of making contact with affected. Yes, and I too contacted and stimulated this um, response. There, there are well, it's another discussion. Um, thank you, Mr. Cole. Thanks, Alderman Putmans. Alderman Marr, questions or debate? Yes, uh, questions for administration, Your Worship. Mr. Cope, so according to, to what I've just heard, your letters would only have gone to whom? Who is considered an affected parcel? The affected parcel would be the lot directly to the east of the site. Yes. The four lots to the south across 14th Avenue. Yes. And the uh, lot directly to the west, which is a municipal reserve lot owned by the city, so we would not have sent a letter to ourselves. Because of that skinny little That's correct. bit. How wide is that bit? Uh, Give or take, not an exact measurement, obviously. Five meters? Five meters, okay. No, oh yeah, there it is there. Okay, thank you. Now, um, could you go back to the map, please? So the R2 lots immediately adjacent to the site, how far, you, did you just say four lots of those or, or uh, all of them? One, one lot of the R2, which is directly adjacent. Right. And the four lots directly across 14th Avenue. And according to the, to the report, the community association, no comments whatsoever. Correct. And according to adjacent neighbor comment section, uh, again, very limited, focused on the fact that they were not owners at the time. So people, when they found out about it afterwards, had, had said, sent something in. Um, that was the extent of the, of, the, uh, of the objections. Is that correct? That's correct. And they were localized where? Uh, we would not, uh, I don't have the letters uh, before us here today other than those that were <coughs> sent in uh, directly to the city clerk. Uh, any letters that we receive administratively, mm -hmm. uh, we do review their concerns. That forms part of the report to Calgary Planning Commission. And those, as we did in this particular case, those concerns are outlined in the report. Okay, a few moments ago, there was also a color photograph from a bird's eye view. Could we have a quick look at that again, please? This one? Yes, and then maybe move it to the right a bit. All right. Okay, so there's the subject site. These are the houses. You can see that they're sort of under construction, some of them. 
and some of them are, are, are built. Uh, could we make that bigger at all? Can we zoom that in? From and the five meter setback area is right there where the dashed line is. That's right. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Worship. Thanks, Alderman Marr. Um, you know, it may well be worth noting that while the uh, public uh, notification process was certainly inelegant, uh, if I'm following the letters correctly, we have now heard by way of public submission from the directly affected homeowners on that street that, that are the ones in question about whether you ought to have sent them a letter or not. Um, so it's unfortunate that uh, it was this inelegant, but we have heard from them, and I just want council to be aware of that. Alderman Carra? Thank you, Your Worship. I was going to sort of, I guess, note that, but also by way of asking a question. This is the only time those landowners, and there, there's, there's letters submitted to CPC, and CPC will take into consideration those letters. Uh, the only time the landowners in question have the right to be publicly heard or to engage with the proponent, with the planner, or anyone is the submission we just heard here today? It would be in this forum, yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Alderman Carl. Alderman Putman's again? Yes, thank you, Worship. Unfortunately, another point of order. I apologize. I'm not up to speed with my little orange book. Um, do I have uh, the ability to ask questions of the applicant? No, too late. Okay, thank you. Uh, we actually don't yet have a motion on the floor, by the way. I was just uh, letting the I was letting the questions go for Mr. Cope because I knew there were a lot of them. But Alderman Putmans, are you? Yes, thank you, Worship. I am prepared to move for a tabling of this motion until the first public hearing in February. Motion 2010-0062. All right, then I have a seconder, Alderman Keating. Any discussion as to time? Only as to time. He's first tabling it to the first meeting in February. I think it's Feb 14. I'm not sure. As to time, Alderman Chabot? Well, if the mover could clarify as to his reasoning and what the intent is through the tabling motion, I would certainly like him to yeah. entertain that you, in his you've close. Still got, you've still got the floor, Alderman Putman, so if you want to just explain, that would be great. Thank you, Alderman Chabot. Um, I find the matters raised by the not only the residents and landowners to the immediate west, but also to the south who have contacted our office with other emails and phone calls, uh, approximately a dozen in all. Um, to their issues of process, I find compelling. I, I don't believe there are any faults with it. It just, the word awkward was used, and, and I think perhaps that's the best way of characterizing this. Um, coupled with a change in alderman, coupled with an election process, there's just been a series of perhaps a perfect storm. And because of that, I believe that there is an opportunity. I've toured the site twice. I've met with the developer twice and um, have some appreciation of, of the quality of work that will be done and some of the other amenities which haven't been produced or discussed at this table. And I think it's very appropriate that uh, all the parties have a further relatively short period of time to um, perhaps resolve their differences and perhaps even develop some new solutions. And um, with that, I believe a, a tabling motion is an appropriate motion to present, and I would ask you to support me into that motion. Thank you very much. Thanks, so Alderman Putmans. Uh, again, only debatable as to time. Alderman Hodges. Yes, Your, Your Worship, exactly. I have the uh, 2011 calendar here, and Alderman Putmans mentioned uh, the second Monday. That's a regular meeting, second Monday, February 14th. The public hearing, uh, combined meeting, and public hearing is uh, February 7th. So I just wanted to clarify. Yes, all right. Is Which, February 7th all right know, with on, you? February 7th. It'll, it'll public be hearing is okay. February 7th. Thank you. Your Worship, on a point, a point of uh, procedure. You're ready. Have we not heard the public from the public? So we've essentially gone through the public meeting portion. It's not required to come back to a public hearing. I was just about to ask that. Uh, it would actually come back to the regular meeting, but is that date still? February 14th is the regular meeting. Well, of council. 6th either, or 7th. Let's go to the 14th, because it'd be, I, I would, no Your Worship, I have the floor. I was just seeing if they were objecting, but they're not. 
Thank You'd you. rather have February 14th? I, I think um, normally the 7th, but with the, the time would be appropriate, but with the holiday season, I believe that the extra two weeks is probably... I don't think any of your colleagues will complain about that extra two weeks. So we have a motion on the floor then to table this to the regular meeting of council on 14th February. That's going to be a fun day in addition to Valentine's Day. Um, all right, and uh, Alderman Keating, you're still seconding that, correct? All right. Oh, right. In order to in order to do that, I do need a motion to close the public hearing on this. So let's just do that. Alderman Pincott, Alderman Lowe, are we agreed to close the public hearing? Very well then. So on the motion to... Oh, sorry, Alderman Hodges. Alderman Hodges is opposed. Um, then on the motion to table and to February 14th, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Chabot is opposed. All right, carried. That takes us then to the next item in the public hearing. CPC 2010-130, Douglas Dale, Douglas Glenn. Mr. Cope. Thank you, Your Worship. Proposed redesignation affects two lots in the development area of Corey Park in the community of Douglas Dale, Douglas Glen. Sites in question are outlined in red uh, and is within an area that is being developed as part of the Quarry Park development. Uh, the proposed redesignation will take the two subject lands from the existing uh, direct control district and redesignate lands to a new direct control district as well as R1 residential one dwelling district. The site to the shown in solid yellow will be going to the R1 to allow for single detached development to occur which is consistent with the adjacent uh, proposed uses uh, within the development area. The hatch site will be going to a new direct control district to allow for a wider variety of residential land uses. The current direct control allows for a low density multi-residential type of development. The proposed direct control district will allow for that development to occur as well as for the opportunity for uh, lower density development in the form of single or semi-detached development to occur within the site dependent on market demand at the time. In that respect, uh, there has been no objections from adjacent landowners or the uh, adjacent community associations. Therefore, Calgary Planning Commission is recommending that Council adopt the proposed redesignations and give three readings to proposed bylaw 112-2010. Questions for administration on clarification only, Alderman Farrell. Thank you. So, Mr. Cope, we are lowering the allowable density. In the uh, there is a slight reduction, but potential reduction in density, primarily as a result of the R1. I believe it will amount to a potential of 14 dwelling units. It is well within the uh, expected uh, density for the area. At the moment, yes. Alderman Keating, question of clarification. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, uh, am I correct in assuming that uh, my understanding of, of Quarry Park, which I'm very uh, admirable for because it's an excellent development, but the um, ratio of multifamily to single family, it seems like it's around 80% for multifamily in this area and 20% for single family. Is that correct? Uh, I'm not sure about the percentages. Certainly uh, the greatest bulk of the Quarry Park residential development is in a multi-residential format. Uh, so I'm being at a, a, a lower density uh, with uh, walkout type uh, uh, townhouse development. Uh, there are some apartments. Uh, this area here being closer to the existing Douglas Glen residential area is reflecting the type of uh, single detached residential which is occurring directly adjacent to it. So putting the percentages aside, um, I'm correct in assuming that this is well and above other areas where we're developing multifamily. Uh, certainly, it is certainly within the uh, expected densities under the Municipal, Government Act, or Municipal Development Plan, as well as for the uh, design briefs for the area. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Keating. Any other questions of clarification? So is there anyone here who would like to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone who would like to speak in favor? Good morning, Your Worship and members of Council. Uh, my name is Ben Lee. I'm a planner with IBI Group, who's the formal applicant here. Uh, with me today is uh, the lovely Julian Lawrence from Remington Development Corporation, uh, who's a developer for Quarry Park. Uh, further to what Mr. Cope presented, uh, the. The intent here of the, of the proposal is simply to redeploy a nominal amount of land in Quarry Park 
uh, from the prevailing multifamily residential um, form to accommodate, I guess, lower profile, lower density residential options. The proposed DC district serves to embed flexibility, as Mr. Cope said, and responsiveness to the residential market in the future. Um, I mean, that aside, I think we believe that you know, this DC district is a creative and innovative approach to residential land use that I think the industry may be seeking more of in the future. But if I could be also be, be preemptive, uh, if I could answer a couple of the alderman's questions with, with regards to the additional density decrease, we're talking about a potential for 14 units out of a total of 2,100, 2, 2, so in effect it's probably less than 0.1% or less than 1%, so it's about 0.8%. And with regards to the ratio of multifamily currently in, in Quarry Park, as I mentioned, multifamily is the prevailing use in this area, and it's uh, you know, something that Remington has taken a commitment to and, uh, and pursued at some risk to them, but that's the commitment and it still resides. And the ratio is approximately currently 90% to 10% in favor of multifamily. Uh, we're looking forward to implementing the final and core residential phases of Quarry Park. And altogether, we believe Quarry Park is reflective of Planet Calgary principles and represents a true mixed-use community that we believe the entire city can be proud of. That being said, Jillian Lawrence and myself will be available to answer any questions Council may have. Questions for Mr. Lee, Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. Mr. Lee, um, insofar as the ratio that you just referenced, 90-10, are you referring to uh, number of units or area? In this case, I'm referring to the units only. So, as you know, Quarry Park has, is it over, over a million? But as far as uh, office space as well? It's, it's a mixed-use community, so the office and the re regional center, the commercial center, accounts for a large land mass of that, that community. But as far as if we isolate for the residential portion of land alone, there's approximately 2,100 units anticipated in the, in the community. So, so part of the commercial, is that like mixed use, at grade commercial with residential above? Yes, there's potential for that as well, okay. in addition to the market that's there now. But from an area perspective, any idea on what the, uh, what the split is? Uh, if you ask me the, if you like, let me know the exact split you're curious in it between what and one, I can try to give it to you right now. Single family residential versus anything else? Versus anything, like, is it just strictly residential or strictly multifamily, or you want to mix in the commercial and industrial as well? R1 versus everything else. else. Uh, give me a second, if I may, indulge counsel. R1 will account for about 8.5%. Area wise. Area wise. But density wise, it accounts for yeah, about the same, about 10. Um, as far as residential block, it's 10% of the residential portion. So, so tell me, what is it that I don't see here? Because all I see is R1. Well, do you have a comprehensive plan? Yes, I realize that, Your Worship. I, it just seems like it would represent a greater percentage than 8%. If, if do, we have a, do we have a bigger map, Mr. Lee? I do have a bigger map here. So this will give you a... a So the block we're talking about uh, through the chair, John Drummond and Chabot, is the, near the southwest corner, just a little bit further south. Yeah. So, so what I see in yellow is R1, correct? Yes. So the remaining proportion of all the orange and the deeper browns that you see within the plant, those are all multifamily. So we have, as, uh, as part of the comprehensive development plan that we had at the outset, we have sort of the single family lower density forms adjacent to the existing communities that are predominantly lower density in Douglas Gun Estates to the south and then, as he's pointing out, River Bend to the north. But the bulk of the, the units are contained within those darker browns and oranges that are multifamilies. So, so through your color scheme on the, uh, on the sidebar, was there a, a reference as to the amount of acreages that each one of those different colors, different land uses, uh, how many acres that yes. each one of those represented? Is yes. that how you it, came to that number? Yes. How many acres was it that was R1? Was R1? Or hectares? If you give me a second. Well, we have, yeah, R1, you have to add them all up. I have the numbers right here. It's um, approximately 22 acres for R1, nine hectares. Nine hectares, that's it. And what's the overall area? 
overall for entire development, 300, over 312 acres. Okay, thank you for those points of clarification, Mr. Lee. Appreciate that. No further questions, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Alderman Marr, questions for Mr. Lee? Just uh, one or two, Your Worship. Um, Mr. Lee, it's very difficult to see this, but I'm wondering if there are any secondary suites on this lot, in, in this plan. Yes, there are. And can you indicate that for me, please? I, I can. They are. There, there, there are two parts of the plan. There's one to the north. There's, if you look at the start from the very north in the yellow, yes, right there, and then there's a kind of an intermediate yellow, right across the band. That's that's all R one S. That's R one S for accommodating secondary streets. And if you go to the south, yes, uh, down the second the second road south of the big boulevard ring, all the way to the south, right there. Yeah, that that sort that of that is also accommodating secondary bottled streets. Bottled brown bit is also secondary streets. Okay, and what? How many lots are there total that are that are accommodating that? Or use? secondary suites in particular? Mm -hmm. um, I just give me a second. Sorry. Looks like twenty or thirty. It's about 30, 34, 35. 34, 35. Yeah. And what percentage is that? Just out of curiosity. Uh, as part of the uh, residential overall. Yes. Oh, uh, just part of the residential. Thank part you. Part of the residential. Yeah. That math, I. It'd be basically 35 of 2,100. Mm -hmm. okay. So it'd be 0.2, percent. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, but there's a significant yeah. amount of multifamily. Yeah, it'd be 0 0.15 percent. 0 0.15. Okay, thank you so much. And of course, Alderman Marr, soon that discussion will be moot, right? <laughs> um, other questions for Mr. Lee? Very well, thank you very much, Mr. Lee. Thank you. Others who wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone who wishes to speak in favor? Anyone who wishes to speak against the proposal? Anyone who wishes to speak against? All right, we'll close the public hearing portion and go to, quest um, go to questions for administration and debate. Alderman Keating. Sorry, I was looking to move. Okay. All right, so move. Do I have a seconder? Alderman Stevenson, thank you. Um, any further debate on this one? Okay, so on the recommendations then, are we agreed? Any opposed? All right, first reading of proposed bylaw 112 D 2010, are we agreed? Second reading, are we agreed? Authorization for third reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? Third reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. All right then, that takes us to CPC 2010-131, the extremely poetically named neighborhood of residual area sub-area 2C. Mr. Cope. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, proposed redesignation affects land that is outlined in red on this location map. It is accessed from the uh, allowance for 69th Street Northwest via 144th Avenue Northwest, which is at the uh, uh, boundaries of the City of Calgary with Rocky View. Proposed redesignation will take the lands from the existing SFUD, which is Special Purpose Future Urban Development District, and redesignate the lands to DC direct control to accommodate accommodate a pits and quarries or a gravel operation on the site. Should note that the surrounding land uses to the uh, west are currently a gravel operation which is uh, in operation. Uh, proposed direct control district is necessary under land use bylaw 1P 2007 uh, to allow for the specific use and therefore is appropriate. Further, the dr proposed direct control district uh, has a couple of modifiers in, in it to ensure that an asphalt batching plant cannot occur on the site and that the gravel crushing and sorting operation is in operation only with respect to the material that is being removed from the subject site. In that respect, it is supported. And just a couple of, uh, from the access road at 69th Street, this is 144th looking west. And the next photo is uh, from the same location with one of the existing gravel trucks uh, lo looking uh, to head east back into the city itself. In the respect, uh, City Council or Calgary Planning Commission is recommending Council adopt the proposed redesignation to Direct Control District and give three readings proposed by law 113D 2010. Thank you, Mr. Cope. Questions of clarification for Administration Alderman Hodges. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. Mr. Cope, uh, <clears throat> deeper into the uh, write-up you have here in the agenda, 
is a, a reference to two single family houses in the area. Can you tell me where those are? I believe there is a single attached house. Actually, yeah, here we are there. Uh, directly to the north off of 144th Avenue, west of the access area. You can see one on the aerial photo. The other one is located, I believe, to the south of that uh, at the uh, extreme southeast corner of the site. I think you see the access driveway there. No, no, no. That would look like to be... Were there any comments received from uh, these landowners if they were notified about this? Uh, not at the time of it going to Calgary Planning Commission. Were they notified of the application? I can't confirm that without checking the file. Uh, again, this is one of those situations on a large land area where the signage itself would not have been terribly visible if they're not looking for it. However, it was advertised in the Calgary Herald. I'm sure it was. Um, Mr. Cope, um, have you ever lived near a concrete batching plant? No, I haven't. <laughs> Alderman Hodges, questions of clarification. That is a clarification. Is it not? If you'd like to answer it, Mr. Cope. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't. Uh, well, my, the point is, are there any ideas of noise mitigation measures on this for this, uh, pro this uh, site, this uh, future industrial complex? Uh, not part of this land use application. Certainly there will be requirement for development permit uh, following this process. If there is need for that, uh, there may be some consideration of berming that type of thing. That would be a development permit issue. Yes, but uh, other than the mention of mitigation, uh, you mentioned uh, there is a mention of noise and dust, but there is no uh, effort in the uh, put, that's been put into the bylaw to suggest to the approving authority how noise and dust would be controlled. No, there's not. Thanks, Alderman Harges. Uh, questions of clarification, Alderman Putmans. Questions of clarification, Alderman Carra. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just a couple of questions regarding the land use bylaw because I don't have it in front of me. Um, SFUD is intended to be future urban development, fairly open, placeholder, until we figure out what the highest and best use for the land is. And there's a bunch of discretionary uses in there. Um, and then I imagine this kind of aggregate, there is an industrial use that's catered to it. Why the DC? I just, I guess. The bylaw, the pits and quarries, which is the term in the bylaw, uh -huh. uh, can only be allowed on lands which are designated direct control. That is as per bylaw 1P2007. That's why we're using the direct control. Okay, because of and because of its nature with dust and noise, that type of thing. That is why it can only be occur under a direct control district. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Cope, a quick one for me. Um, you said there are existing aggregate businesses in the area. Could you just show us on the map where? Yes, actually, you can see that on this aerial photo. All those scraped lands uh, are currently uh, being a gravel operation. Access to that site is also using 69th Street and trails off there. That access area actually loops around and connects with 85th Street. Okay. And there is an asphalt batching plant as well as sorting operation on the site. And what about the bit on the southeast corner? Is that the same? Um, I can't confirm that. I didn't get down that far when I was doing the site inspection. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone here who would like to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone to speak in favor? Thank you, Your Worship and members of Council. My name is Don Schultz, and I'm the applicant for this proposed land use redesignation. I just have a few brief comments to reinforce the uh, presentation that Mr. Cope gave to Council. Um, this proposed land use amendment is consistent with city land use policy, such as the North Regional Context Study and the city growth management documents, such as the Suburban Residential Growth Study. Uh, more specifically, the North Regional Context Study does say that this uh, area will be future industrial and until such time as uh, urban industrial development takes place on this land, um, 
aggregate extraction is appropriate as an interim use. Uh, just to put this application in the context of the adjacent aggregate operations, uh, those operations are being conducted by inland aggregates Lafarge and Volker Steven. Uh, they cover a total of area of more than 1,100 acres or seven quarter sections of land. Uh, by contrast, our application covers approximately 40 acres. Um, similarly, uh, those three operations neighboring this site uh, have approximately 60 million tons of aggregate uh, left to be mined um, and the total amount of aggregate in our site is approximately 2 million tons. The uh, aggregate resource in this uh, proposed pit is intended only for internal use of the parent company which is ALSA construction. Uh, there are no sales or hauling uh, to third parties proposed in this uh, operation. Uh, currently, ALSA uh, purchases and hauls gravel from the adjacent uh, gravel operations. Therefore, truck traffic will simply be transferred from the adjacent Lafarge Inland and Volker Steven operations to uh, this particular operation. Uh, detailed mitigation plans have been submitted to the city through the land use review process and will be included in the development permit application. Um, I just want to reinforce what uh, Mr. Cope mentioned that the direct control bylaw has no asphalt plant um, allowed on this site. Uh, we are only proposing portable equipment for extraction and crushing of gravel um, and a five year temporary development permit. Um, after five years, we do actually anticipate that most of the aggregate will be depleted from this site um, and if there is any gravel left to be depleted, we would uh, reapply for a second development permit after the five years. We have met with and shared detailed information with the planning consultants uh, working for the adjacent gravel pit operators. We've also met with and sh shared detailed information with Bears Paw Christian School. Uh, which is located approximately 400 meters to the north of uh, this proposed site. Um, just to clarify one of Mr. Cope's comments, uh, 144th Avenue used to be the city limit. I, I believe that city limit is now extended further north um, due to the recent uh, City of Calgary annexation and so the Bears Paw Christian School is within the city limits although it was approved by the MD of Rocky View uh, about 20 years ago. In conclusion, uh, Your Worship and members of Council, uh, we respectfully submit that uh, the um, extraction of aggregate resources well in advance of urban development is in the City's best interests. I would be happy to answer any questions that Council may have as well. I have my client here, Mr. Wes Marcus, uh, from uh, the proposed gravel operator to answer any questions that I cannot answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shields. Questions, Alderman Hodges. Well, there's just a couple of things in the agenda here, Your Worship, uh, from CPC and so on. Uh, Mr. Schultz, were you at the CPC meeting? Um, Your Worship, uh, members of council, yes, I was at the CPC meeting. Okay. Because uh, in the original write-up that went to CPC, there was a comment that uh, truck traffic should be directed to uh, uh, Burma Road, 144th Avenue. An amendment was placed at CPC that's deleted that requirement. So. Which of the two roads will the uh, truck traffic be using? Through the uh, chair to Alderman Hodges, um, the original wording in the Calgary Planning Commission report was uh, placed in that report at the request of Rocky View County uh, to direct all of our traffic eastbound along 144th Avenue. Um, and uh, we are happy to comply with that request of Rocky View County. Um, I believe that uh, Alderman Lowe made the motion to uh, remove that wording from the Planning Commission report and I would defer to Alderman Lowe for uh, his reasoning on that. Uh, that's why I'm asking the question now. We'll get him warmed up uh, on, a, on a response rather than us uh, field questions uh, after the uh, hearing. Um, I uh, take it though that uh, 69th Street available, is available for use. Trucks could turn north to Burma Road or they can turn south 
down to 112th Avenue. Um, just for clarification, 69th Street Road Allowance uh, presently uh, is not um, operable to the south of our, our proposed pit. So our traffic would be directed northbound on 69th Street Road Allowance to 144th Avenue. Um, how it would get to 112th Avenue, if, uh, if that were to be permitted by the city, would be to go westbound along 144th and then southbound. And then south, yeah. On 85th. Yes, I just noticed in the finer print on the map, there's a closed uh, road allowance. Uh, do you know if your client plans any mitigation measures with respect to dust and noise, as is sometimes done now with the uh, um, gravel mining operations? Absolutely, Your Worship. Uh, our client uh, does intend to implement noise and dust mitigation measures. Um, this, in addition to being required by the development permit at the City of Calgary, is a requirement of Alberta Environment. And uh, we have included detailed information in our code of practice submission to Alberta Environment, which we've also shared with the city and uh, adjacent landowners. Have you discussed this yet with Alberta Environment? It sounds like you might have. Uh, yes, Your Worship, we have uh, had discussions with Alberta Environment and we have submitted our code of practice uh, document application to Alberta Environment for their review. I will refrain from making any editorial comments about the interests of Alberta Environment in enforcing their rules. Thank you, Your Worship. <laughs> Thanks for your uh, self-control on that one, Alderman Hodges. Other questions for Mr. Schultz? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone else in favor? Anyone wish to speak against this proposal? Anyone wish to speak against it? Ma'am? Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Lisa Rosenberg. That's R-O-S-E-N-B-E-R-G. And I live approximately seven kilometers from this site, but I'm a parent of three girls at Bears Paw Christian School. The school is located at 69th and 144. Um, I'm very concerned that there's no mention of a school in the area on this application. This school is a K-12 school and has no transportation. There are more than 500 students, approximately 300 families. I'm very concerned about the posted health warning signs. I think they were placed along, there's one at least, placed somewhere along 69th. You can't see it near the school. Um, very concerned about the possible expansion of this gravel pit for health reasons, the increased dust and noise when children are playing outside all the time for recess, for Z, what will the long-term side effects of this exposure be? Very concerned about the possible increased truck traffic on 144th, which definitely sounds like a reality. Many new drivers. High school students drive this road every day. I'm not sure they'll ever be my girls driving. Um, Last year, on the last day of school, there was a rollover at that exact intersection, 69 of 144. One of our staff and her daughter in the car with a two, I don't know what the technical term is, the gravel truck with the extra load, rolled into the ditch there. It was a miracle that no one died. I asked this council to consider that the fact that there is a school across the street and consider their health and safety and reject this redesignation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Rosenberg. Thanks for being here. Alderman Lowe, question for Ms. Rosenberg? Uh, just to thank Ms. Rosenberg for being here. And yes, I hear from a lot of people whose kids attend that school, which was actually, we inherited from the MD. And also the school has an incredible growth project on, clearly understanding where it was. The thing that always puzzles me, and perhaps you can answer, is that why doesn't the school have a transportation program and use buses rather than 300 cars a day? That's a very good question. I wish they were here to answer that. Um, I will state that I used to live in Cochrane for five years and I've moved closer to the school in the last year. 
and that I have been very supportive in trying to encourage the school to go that route, it's pretty much a dollars and cents thing. They have gone to the parents, they have, you know, tried to bring it in a couple of times, and there is an enormous carpooling effort, and that's probably, there's probably 200 cars in and out of there. I, I'm just guessing. The school probably knows better. You're also aware that uh, in discussions with the school and their expansion, we've talked about improvements to that intersection. The school will ultimately be paying for part of it mm -hmm. and we're looking for some improvements from the gravel hauling industry because we yeah. have a fund we can get into you're aware of that absolutely I am aware of that my, my bigger concern again I mean of course it, other applications that have come forward where they have talked about improving the road improvements that's a wonderful thing but it doesn't really address the health uh, the health issues the noise and the and the air quality yeah you're also aware I I believe Alderman Lowe said something along the lines of keep in mind that this is a land use and we'll deal with that at the development permit stage. And the concern, of course, is that we don't deal with that at the development permit stage. The approving authority does. And what's happening more often than not these days is there is not agreement met between parties at the land use stage that flows into the development permit stage, and it ends up in subdivision and development appeal board, which has two options. They can look at the actual technical writing of the DC, and then they can go and try and determine what council's intent was in creating that DC. And I think we've had a really good discussion today surrounding it, but all of this good discussion will not be reflected in the minutes. And so whatever technical nails that SDAB chooses to hang their hats on at some point down the line, uh, we are not going to have the benefit of this conversation and some of the things that we discussed there to nuance what our intent was through the minutes. And I'm just making that point because I think it's pertinent to what I said earlier and interesting to this case too. Thank you, Alderman Craw. Alderman Lowe, you want to close, I imagine. Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, well, I'm going to support the application. This is, this is very much like some of the other issues that have been raised in the past, specifically in regards to gas wells that have been identified in the city. And, and a report that had come out many years ago talked about the, uh, the quick and early extraction of resources uh, as quickly as possible. So this provides an opportunity to draw a resource from an area ahead of development. And the sooner we can extract this resource from this area, the shorter the timeline will be that people adjacent to it will be negatively impacted by it. Alderman Lowe correctly pointed out that part of the issue, of course, is the additional loading onto 144th Avenue. And we did hear the applicant state that he won't be adding additional volume to the roadways because either he'll be drawing it from this lot or he'll be drawing it from the adjacent lot. And if there is going to be an increase in traffic, it's going to be based on, on demand as opposed to having more opportunity to draw from multiple sites. So I'm going to support this. I'm going to support it on a number of different bases, but primarily uh, to look at earlier extraction and quicker extraction to be able to facilitate uh, redevelopment sometime in the nearer future. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Mr. Cope, can you confirm that? I've heard it a couple of times now, but that the applicant's suggestion is this is a redirection of truck traffic rather than a whole bunch of new truck traffic? I can not confirm that. We do have a, uh, a copy of a traffic study that was going to be submitted as part of the development permit. Uh, they are anticipating that traffic from this site will generate up to 120 vehicle trips per day. So that would be 60 in, 60 out. Uh, whether or not that's an increase over what is in the area now, I cannot confirm. I'm not sure if transportation may be Mr. able Vander to... Mr. I think, is in the audience. Perhaps he has something to say on that. Your Worship, um, 
Mr. Cope is right. The, the TIA that we've just been handed uh, that will be officially submitted as part of the DP uh, does indicate roughly about 120 daily trips uh, being generated from the site. If uh, what the applicant is suggesting is that those trips are currently um, going to the pits on 85th Street, then uh, the overall, I guess, further away from the site uh, Im impact to the, the road network would be negligible. Thank you very much, Mr. Vanderputten. Uh, Alderman Stevenson. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I think the, the, the options that we have is to uh, try and shut down uh, development of these sites or improve the uh, road network to handle it. The, I think the, where we have to go is uh, mitigation of the uh, things that affect the, uh, the neighbors, and that is the, uh, the noise, dust, the road traffic. But uh, shutting down the, uh, the sites is not an option. I mean, the more we uh, curtail the development of these um, uh, resources, the more we put up the cost of everything that happens in the city, from buildings to roads, uh, all construction is affected. If people have to draw these uh, extracts from other places a lot further out of the city, it increases the cost. So we, what we need to do, obviously, is deal with the road problems, and I think that uh, as a city, we definitely have to to do something about 144th, and according to um, uh, Alderman Lowell, that action has already been taken. So I will be supporting this application. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Alderman Stevenson. Anyone else before I call on Alderman Lowe to close? Alderman Lowe? Well, thank you, Your Worship, and uh, Council, thank you for your comments. Uh, one thing I didn't address earlier was Alderman uh, Hodge's question about my trying to take the all trucks must proceed eastbound clause out of the report. Two reasons for that, Your Worship. The first one is, as uh, I indicated before, we're doing some work up there to establish what the, uh, the, the aggregate hauling routes will be, and they're most certainly not restricted to eastbound on uh, 144th Avenue. That uh, restriction was put in there at the request of the county. Uh, that's inside the city. If the county wants to put a no trucking sign up at the city boundaries to the west, they're free to do so. But I think inside the city, we can determine uh, what, what the best options are for business. And uh, I can't imagine why somebody may want to haul aggregates west and down 185th Street from this location. But there may be a very good reason for it. And that's a business decision. But uh, we will address the, the gravel hauling routes up there. The other items uh, Alderman Hodge has pointed out are uh, the Alberta environment. and. Uh, to set process that we go through, it's under their control, and it will be addressed during the development permit stage. And uh, with that, Your Worship, I'm going to uh, close on it and ask for your support. Thank you very much, Alderman Lowe. So, on the recommendations of Council Report CPC 2010-131, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Hodges is opposed. So then moving to the related bylaw. First reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Opposed? Alderman Hodges. Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Opposed? Alderman Hodges. Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Very well then, third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Hodges. Thank you, carried. We now move to CPC 2010-132, and, and I do thank uh, the folks on this item and on the next two for bearing with us through the lunch break, um, but we will move forward now. So we go now to CPC 2010-132, Mr. Cope. Thank you, Your Worship. The proposed land use item is within the community of Beltline. Uh, the proposal is to redesignate the lands from the existing CCMH, or Centre City Multi-Residential High-Rise District, to a DC direct control district to accommodate an office use within the existing development. The existing development is currently a semi-detached dwelling with an attached rear access garage. The air photo showing the location of the uh, subject uh, site, which is one half of the semi-detached dwelling, shows a better indication here. The area is generally surrounded by primarily multi-residential and commercial type uses to the west as well as, as you can see here, the odd single detached dwelling, which are historic in nature uh, on 15th Avenue Southwest. The direct control district will allow for the right half of this semi-detached dwelling to be used for office purposes. 
The uh, has been no objections from adjacent landowners with respect to the use of the site. However, I should indicate that the community association is not in favor of the proposed redesignation. In that respect, CPC, considering all the factors, are, are recommending that Council adopt the proposed redesignation from CCMH to 3C Direct Control and give three readings to proposed by Law 114 D 2010. Thanks, Mr. Cope. Questions of clarification to administration. Alderman Marr on a question of clarification. Very well. Any other questions of clarification? All right, then. Is there anyone who is would like to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone who would like to speak in favor? Good afternoon, Your Worship, Council Members. My name is Bill Jofiu. I'm the uh, owner and the applicant. Uh, for if you need to know how to pronounce my last name, it's like Joe Few, many Joes, few Joes, Joe Few. Or you can call me Bill, doesn't matter. Uh, for the record, uh, corporate record, if I could, uh, your, uh, your worship, I'd like to submit a letter of support from uh, the neighbor at 1318 15th Avenue. Uh, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Uh, the reason for uh, me making the application for the to, is to comply with the City of Calgary new land use bylaw in the Beltline community, 1P 2007. Thus, I'm applying for the direct control district DC with the base district of CCMH, Center City Multi Residential High Rise District with a direct control to have an office in the said unit in the existing building only, located at 1320 15th Avenue Southwest. The above said lot is a few lots from the zoning of CCCOR, Center City Commercial Cor uh, Corridor District and is a quarter block from 14th Street. The office will be used in a minor nature only and will operate in the existing building. We do not plan to expand the existing dwelling unit inside or out in any way. In fact, the unit will remain and look like a residential unit. I do not believe this will affect the surrounding area of 15th Avenue as the property will read like a residential pop property. And again, the outside of the property will remain the same as it has always been since 1995. That's all, sir. Thank you, Mr. Jofiu. Uh, questions for Mr. Jofiu, Alderman Marr? Mr. Jofiu, thank you for your presentation. I'm curious, uh, I understand that what you're saying in terms of the reading of the street, insofar as that you, at this time, make no plans to put on commercial signage or to alter the exterior of the building in any way so that it from the street appears as though it is a residential. That's correct. There will be no changes at all. Well, the no. concern from the community, and I share, uh, is this creates a land use redesignation. So yes, sir. in the event that the building comes down at some point, it becomes a commercial building. That's one of the issues that I have, not necessarily for you when you are the owner of the property, but your heirs and successors. Have you any comments on that? Um, well, I understand your question, sir, but I, I, I do, I actually have conferred with my neighbor on the east side, actually two different lots, uh, on 1318 uh, and 1316, and uh, we've actually, uh, you know, discussed the actual designation is a CCMH. It's a multi-residential high-rise. Now, from my understanding, you can actually put a, a high-rise up there 30 30 floors or, or you know, at least. Uh, a very or, tall and narrow building, wouldn't it? Pardon me? It would be a very tall and narrow building yes, in, that, sir. in well, that case. Uh, we also were conferring with the, uh, the landowner behind us also uh, on uh, 14th Avenue, and uh, we're discussing a, a whole uh, 
He has about five lots right behind us. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, if we were going to take a look at uh, developing that any further, then of course we would, uh, you know, it would be totally different and uh, it would uh, be, you know, in, in, in the purpose of having the uh, high density uh, residential units in there. Mm -hmm. No, and I appreciate that. And it seems that you've uh, gone and, and done some neighbor consultation as well, Most spoken definitely. to the community association. Uh, no, I haven't spoke to them. Oh, I spoke not. to them. I spoke to them on phone, and uh, the individual, Mr. Owen, I believe. Yes, it was. I, I see that in the file that you you've had some interaction, not necessarily spoken to them, but uh, uh, you've certainly had some some contact with them. Yes. Yes, sir. I, I did. I actually I did speak to him, and he he conferred that he was in no disagreement with it at the first time that I spoke with him. Mm. And then I seen the letter that he did send in and say, stating that he was not in favor. Mm. Yes. Well, I appreciate that that uh, that you've you've put that effort in, and commend you. I, uh, I'm prepared to listen to the rest of my colleagues and hear what their thoughts are. Also, I wish I could package uh, verbal. Uh, verbal discussions too because the individual at 1316 is in agreement and the individual that has five lots behind uh, my property is uh, also uh, in favor of it so like I said I wish I could package a verbal agreement but uh, unfortunately we can't. I appreciate that thank you thank you worship. Thank you very much and Alderman Moore just for clarification um, in the proposed amendment it does suggest that office uses must only be located within the building existing on the site as of the date of passage of this bylaw so presumably and i think it does say that in the report as well if the building were to be torn down the uh, office use would no longer be permitted alderman chabot thank you worship mr joe thank you for being here today um so my question to you is similar in nature to what uh, Alderman Mars' questions were, and I'm just wondering why you would have chosen to go to this land use designation rather than possibly looking at a, a DC with that use that you're seeking primarily to be um, um, in compliance with as a, uh, as a permitted use. Sir, I'm not quite understanding your question because we are going for a DC. But a DC with CCMH, as opposed to what your current designation is, which is R1, right? No, sir. It's a CCMH. It's CCMH. So you're looking for what higher density, or? Uh, no, just for a. Uh, just for that permitted discretionary. Correct. Yes. Okay. So just looking for that use. Yeah, just for an office use in the existing building, sir. Okay. Sorry, I thought that was an R1 zoned area. I didn't. Uh, it was uh, at one time an RM7 Which until the higher. actual land use was changed uh, to the 1P2007. Okay, I didn't make any notes on this particular file, which is why I'm uh, not all that familiar with it. I usually make notes on things that I'm not supportive of, and uh, obviously I had no comments to put on this one. So. Thank you for your answer, and thank, thank you for you being for here. Thank you for the question, sir. Th thanks, Alderman Chippewa. Well, Mr. Jofi, maybe I can just ask, oh. since you raised it. When you purchased the property, it was RM7? Correct. And at that time, your understanding was the RM7 allowed you to have this office use? Yes, sir. And then the zoning was changed on you? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Alderman, uh, oh, Alderman Marr, you probably don't have more questions here, do you? Okay, in that case, I'll ask you another. Um, the office use you're looking for, will you get lots of sort of clients or customers? Will there be any traffic or parking impacts? No, I don't believe so, sir. Okay, great. Any other questions for Mr. Jofu? Thank you very much for being here, sir. Thank you for having me. Anyone else wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone wish to speak in favor of the proposal? Anyone wish to speak against the proposal? Your Worship, members of council, my name is Rob Taylor and I'm president of Beltline Communities. I'm here today representing Beltline Planning Group, the standing committee that deals with city circulations. With respect to this land use redesignation, Beltline finds itself in a highly unusual situation. This is the first and only one that Beltline Planning Group has ever opposed. Beltline Planning Group has, occupied, has operated for seven years now and for another three years before that as a collaboration between the former Connaught and Victoria communities. Why then 
would we oppose this application? Well, I'll start by telling you that I'm going to make a slippery slope, thin edge of the wedge kind of argument. I'm not really very fond of that, but it's necessary. It's necessary because the original intent of the blueprint for the Beltline, the document that council authorized to be the basis of land use and development regulation in our community district, has been incrementally stretched and formed first through the language of the ARP, then in the technical language of 1P2007, and then again in the CPC recommendation before you. It's necessary because this approval could well lead to others that would further torture the original purpose of allowing limited commercial units, uh, uh, uses within the small primarily residential areas of the Beltline on a discretionary basis. This is a discretionary use, so it seems entirely reasonable to return to the intent of the rules that we're working with here. The primarily residential district was created in the Beltline with two purposes. The first was to preserve the character of the existing residential areas south of 12th Avenue, North of 12th Avenue was intended primarily to be mixed use. And second was to accommodate certain kinds of commercial or quasi-commercial uses in support of that character. It's the second purpose that's relevant here. The object of introducing limited commercial unit, uh, uses into, into the primarily residential district was to support, and I emphasize that word support, two things that would enhance Beltline's primar primarily residential areas. One, compatible nearby neighborhood scale services for residents, like a corner store in the ground floor of a high rise and other similar things. And two, preservation and renovation of older historic or character buildings through reuse in low intensity commercial applications regardless of who might use them. For instance, accountants or financial advisors. Approving this application does not achieve either of these goals. This office use mid-block on 15th Avenue does not provide neighborhood services for residents, nor does it preserve a character or historic building that might otherwise be lost. While it's true that care has been taken that this mid-90s duplex will not look commercial, except maybe for the sign. The facts remain, this is not a character or heritage building. It does not provide a neighborhood service. It is a commercial encroachment, and it's one without a queer policy justification. One neighbor provided their endorsement because the appearance of the existing building won't change. That makes sense, so far as it goes. However, it appears that this, along with the loss of use if the site is redeveloped, is also the rationale of the Development Authority and the CPC. In Beltline's view, this rationale is not sufficient to justify approving a discretionary land use that could very well lead to further problems with commercial encroachments across the district. In our view, it's not okay to say that anything can be commercial so long as it doesn't look commercial. I would be pleased to answer any questions you may have, especially if they're about how the intent of Beltline's primarily residential land use concept became distorted, or if they're about the extent and nature of other existing commercial conditions on the block in question. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Uh, questions for Mr. Taylor, Alderman Marr. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. I must admit um, a little bit of surprise when I got your, uh, your note and, and that of Mr. Craig's, uh, because I think this is the first time since I've been Alderman that uh, the Beltline community has ever said no to anything. It is. Uh, from Mustard Seed, Halfway House, uh, the, uh, the spirit of, of Beltline has always been bring it on hasn't it? 
yes. been very, very uh, supportive of everything that's, that's come. So if this was a heritage building, for example, um, Beltline Planning Group would be supportive of it, then, would it? Would it not? Indeed. And if this was a, a live-work concept, Beltline Planning Group would also be in support of that? Yes. But in this particular instance, you feel that this is a, it's, it's really a commercial creep into one of the residential components of, of, of the neighborhood? It, very much so. And if I could put up this, or perhaps the map that's there would be fine. Yeah, that the image? Yeah. Note that along 14th Street there, the, we make the that commercial place? zone extends rather deeply into the block already. Um, that's because of two MERBs down on the corner, Wellington and Dorset. Mm -hmm. um, Wellington, at the west end of the site, um, is a long, rectangular, 17-story apartment building. Um, and it's oriented, the, the long, flat faces are east and west. So it divides off the strip mall from the residential part of the block quite nicely, the way it sits. It's actually a rather unusual planning success from that era in that respect. So introducing commercial in the western uh, part of the block, um, we would definitely see as an encroachment. Note also that the primary residential district there is quite small. There are four of them in Beltline. They're all quite small because our primary intent was to move to a high-density, mixed-use urban community. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there was a very strong desire to maintain the character of those older existing um, residential areas. So our fear is that this kind of encroachment will spread um, into the others. No, and I appreciate that. Uh, this application also does not have any mixed use or, or any of these things that, that uh, would make it more acceptable to the community. Is that not the case? That's correct. Okay, those are my questions. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, Alderman Marr. Um, Alderman Chabot, did I accidentally turn your light off? Did you have questions for Mr. Taylor? Alderman Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. I appreciate what you're saying. I um, have a question, though, and please correct me. But a few months ago, maybe longer, um, we had a <coughs> similar question come up with a development on 13th Avenue by the park. And I remember the planning department was very reluctant to put residential on the, um, I think it, I can't remember the name of the building. Well, I think it was Hotel Minor Centuria, is that the, what you're thinking And of? it seems to me the, the planning department wanted to put residential on the main floor of that because it was one of the residential precincts. And they were worried about erosion of residential as well. And the, the community supported that application, somewhat to my surprise, um, and, and asked for a, I think it was drinking establishment medium or large that was allowed there. So can you explain the difference so I can help, help, me, help me make my decision <laughs> I easier? Can, I can certainly try, but I'm going to have to wind back a bit in time. And I, I could be completely, I could have, um, my memory could be distorted, but I don't think so. Well, I, I, I'd actually, if, if you'll indulge me for a moment, I want to start in 2003. Um, when the blueprint for the Beltline um, came before Council, there are a few faces here that were present then. Um, associated with it were actually roughly eight authorizations, but the one I want to focus on was one that uh, provided for the community to regularly come forward with a report on the ongoing success of the ARPN to update it. Um, that didn't happen. And that's really, from our view, how we got into this jam, both with commercial encroachments and Hotel Minor. Um, I didn't mention Hotel Minor, but it, it, it largely because where 
from a policy perspective, we'd like to view it as a residential use. But I'm talking about the uses on the main floor, on which the, was where the debate was, not on the hotel use, because I agree with you. It's still, it's still, um, it may be nightly, but it, it's still a place to, to sleep. But I'm talking about the, the commercial at the ground level. And the administration was concerned about commercial at the ground level and wanted to preserve that. Yes, and, 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 and in, in that particular case, the reason I went back is in that particular case, we had had a desire over some time to make an adjustment. That particular site is on the, on the very corner of primarily residential. Mm -hmm. And we had wanted to make an adjustment to introduce more flexibility for that particular site with uh, with an application of the sort you describe in mind and that's really why we supported it i i from a, a purely logical technical perspective we probably ought not have because it was in the primarily residential zone so in the the eyes of the community then you you would see these sites as different um and you would like this i mean i i, I i've heard you um, well, one's at the edge and one is more central to, to uh, uh, the prim uh, primarily residential district. The, we had made the argument for quite some time that we need some additional flexibility around, around the edges, either to push primarily residential out or to pull a little bit more mixed use in. And that was accommodated um, in the ARP process but the specifics, the details of it, were not updated on an ongoing basis as, the, as development unfolded in the community. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Farrell. Alderman Carra with questions for Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Your Worship, and Mr. Taylor, thank you for your presentation. Um, you had the ability to sort of, through uh, Alderman Farrell's questions, backtrack a little bit and discuss, I believe you put the erosion of the Beltline's original intent with regards to their residential policy. Is there anything you'd like to add to that that's pertinent to our discussion today? That's pertinent to the particular land use or that's pertinent to the overall situation? Yes. The latter? I'm giving you the leeway. Take well, it. thank you, sir. I will take you up on it. Um, we would like to see those 2003 authorizations revisited. Um, and we'd like to see them revisited for a number of reasons. We, we believe that it, Beltline got in the game of improving the quality of community engagement um, with administration early on. Um, we believe we've found um, some formulas um, that are worthy of testing, and we really haven't had the opportunity to do it. Please apply that to this situation. Is it or not? Is it apl applicable? Well, it, it, no, it's really more appropriate to the, it, to, it, to the situation that uh, Alderman Farrell brought forward, um, because in this case, uh, the current community view on the on the nature and limits of this particular primarily re of this particular primary residential area remain the same as they were at the time that it was adopted. Okay. Next question: Can you, um, Alderman Marr, put it to you that if this was a heritage home and it was an accountant firm that wanted to move in, you would support it? Can you flesh that out so I have an understanding of the, um, the reason? Yeah, it's it's one of those two. A, a, a policy principles um, that are embedded in, in the ARP and emerged through the blueprint for the Beltline uh, process. Um, one was to allow low intensity commercial uses for the purpose um, of encouraging preservation uh, of uh, historic and character properties. Um, and the other was limited incur uh, incursions for neighborhood services, things like a corner store or a coffee shop um, in, on the ground floor of a high rise. 
beyond that, uh, it, the community had no intent um, to encourage commercial use within these districts um, unless one considers Hotel Minor to be a commercial use. As I said before, we tend to think of it as residential. Lodging being a subsection of residential. Um, can I ask another question? This maybe should have been better asked for the proponent, so I'll, I'll ask His Worship to jump in, or you can just, just... This seems to me to be the kind of application where it would have been a don't ask, don't tell type situation that wouldn't have long-reaching Im Im impact on the land use of the site, uh, what circumstances brought this forward? Concern about precedent. Um, I know that it's said and that it's, it's technically correct um, that one, one land use is not based on the precedent of a decision on another. Um, but in reality, I mean, all of us uh, it continue to be comfortable doing what we've done before. And on the ground, I, 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 a precedent plays a very significant role in what unfolds. Um, so our, our view is certainly that the, it, the perspective put forward by Hallmark, you know, it's not going to look commercial, so it will be okay. That's the condo neighbor across the street. Um, it, it, it is perfectly reasonable on the surface. And if it could be limited in some way to this one particular situation with a very clear assurance that we have a policy going forward, it, it might be fine. But we don't because that, that policy is, is bent um, in, in, in the implementation. It's, it's entirely possible to find the justification. Um, inside of it to do this and to continue um, doing it. And I would point out again that the primarily residential districts in, in Beltline were outlined the way they are because they're unique and they are very small um, as a portion of the, uh, uh, of the overall community district. There are uh, literally thousands of locations where this business could locate um, without uh, landing in the heart of one of the smaller, uh, uh, primarily residential enclaves in the entire community. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Kara. Any other questions for Mr. Taylor? All right, Mr. Taylor, thank you so much for being here and as always for all the work you do for the city. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in opposition to this proposal? Anyone else wish to speak in opposition? All right, then I'll close the public hearing and we will uh, move to questions for administration um, and debate. But first we need to get the motion on the floor. Anyone moving the administration recommendations? Thank you, Alderman Lowe. Do I have a seconder? Thanks, Alderman Jones. Alderman Lowe? Very simply, Your Worship, uh, we uh, had a pretty good go at this at Planning Commission. I'll move the recommendation of Commission and three readings of the bylaw. Thanks, Alderman Lowe. Others? I actually do have a question for Mr. Cope myself. So maybe I'll ask while the rest of the lights are coming on, Mr. Cope. Uh, Mr. Cope, we heard that the previous zoning designation for this property, RM7, allowed this office use is that your understanding uh that would be not entirely correct the rm7 did have a provision for office uses in the districts uh, however they were limited to uh major roads this is not considered a major road not considered a major road thank you Ald alderman Marr. your worship uh, now that it's been moved um i'm gonna have to I'm asking my colleagues to, to support me when I say that they do not support this application for the various reasons that we've heard the community speak out on. First of all, it is commercial creep. 
this is, uh, I understand that the, uh, the area of Beltline is not a, a community, a neighbourhood in, in ways that most of us would consider it. However, it is still a neighbourhood. It is still an area where we are encouraging Calgarians by the thousands to come and live, uh, to separate and have commercial ventures in the heart of a neighbourhood is something that would not be tolerated if we were talking about Mackenzie Town or if we were talking about Tuscany or any other suburban area. There is no supportive community or ancillary build, uh, function to this building other than the fact that, that uh, it is going to retain its outward appearance of being a residential building. This is something that uh, Calgary Planning Commission I know wrestled with and I know that administration has as well. But my community has spoken to me, and I will respond. It is commercial creep. It is precedent setting. And for that, I will not support it, and I urge you not to either. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Mar. Alderman Carra? <clears throat> yeah, this is a question for Mr. Cope. And what I would love from you, you gave a very brief report and recommended the movement from CPC. Could you give me a synopsis of this discussion or the point or how these points were addressed by CPC which led them to their proposal in a brief form like this is what we discussed and we realized this and this came into play but we made this decision based on this for these reasons and I would like to I, I'd just like to hear what CPC's reasoning was in brief. Uh, if memory serves me right and I could be corrected by either Alderman Lowe or Alderman Farrell. Uh, there was not a lot of discussion on this item at Planning Commission. Uh, the information that was presented is contained within the reports that are before you today as well. Uh, in this particular case, uh, I think the uh, impact was reviewed in terms of uh, parking potential uh, and impact on the, <clears throat> on the adjacent uh, residential areas. And uh, on that aspect, CPC recommended approval. Did CPC have this information from the Beltline in the form of a letter at CPC? Yes, they did. And that did not inform the discussion or debate of CPC? Uh, nothing of any major consequence, no. Okay, well, I think as coming out of the presidency of a community association that's also sort of received similar treatment and is very worried about commercial creep, uh, and understanding the position that the Beltline community is coming from, I will be supporting Alderman Marr and not supporting this. Thanks, Alderman Corral. Alderman Keating. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, going back to looking at the pictures, it looked like it was vacant, and if so, how long, and what were the previous uses, and was there ever an office in this building? I cannot confirm that there was ever an office that we didn't know about in the building. At the present time, it was for residential uses, uh, you can see a light on in the second floor level of the subject site uh, and I do know because I did have a discussion with the individual next door that the uh, left half of the building is occupied for residential purposes. Thanks Alderman Keating. Anyone else before I call on Alderman Lowe to close? Alderman Lowe to close. Well Your Worship, uh, response to uh, Alderman Koran with due respect to uh, Mr. Cope, there was some discussion at Commission. It, it did limit itself to the movement of commercial into a residential precinct, but it also acknowledged, if I recall correctly, the fact that there was an office there. It had been for some time. And uh, at, at that, if you take a look at the vote, I think it was 4-3, uh, it, it passed, Commission passed it. And if, again, if I recall correctly, uh, it was a use that it was existing. It wasn't altering the appearance of the building. It wasn't altering the residential precinct to any degree or extent. Uh, parking was not of an issue. And uh, so it, uh, that was the way, at the end of the day, Commission, albeit split, but Commission did, did view it. And uh, again, if you take a look at the report, you'll find I moved it. And, uh, Commission elected to support me on moving ahead with it on this basis. The, uh, I find Alderman Kraus questioning of the language and what CPC did around it 
kind of interesting. Um, and I'm not quite sure what to do with it. I'm also mindful of what he said, I think, in the last one about uh, uh, the difficulty that DAB has with bylaws that come to it. Well, DAB rules with bylaws and evidence, period. And that's, uh, <laughs> and that's sort of where it comes from. I spent long enough there managing that thing. So uh, it, uh, I'm going to mindful of, of your comments, and I'm not sure how we reflect that in a report to council, or necessarily even if we necessarily do. One of the things that CPC does, again for your information, Alderman Croft, is it will invite any member who votes either for or against, but generally speaking against a motion, to submit their reasons for voting to the secretary, to Mr. Cope. And uh, you will find my comments when I vote against something strewn throughout the records of CPC. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Lowe. To the question then, on the recommendations of the administration on CPC 2010-132, are we agreed? Opposed? Call the roll, please. Alderman Keating. Yes. Alderman Lowe. Yes. Alderman McLeod. No. Alderman Marr. No. Alderman Pincott. Yes. Alderman Putmans. No. Alderman Stevenson. No. Alderman Carra. No. Alderman Chabot. Yes. Alderman Collier-Cott. No. Alderman DeMong. No. Alderman Farrell. No. Alderman Hodges. No. Alderman Jones. Mayor Ninchy. Yes. That's lost, Your Worship. Your Worship, move to file the bylaw. Move to file. Seconder. Second. Alderman Pincott, are we agreed? Agreed. Oops. That then takes us to uh, CPC 2010-133. Your Worship, respectfully, are you going to call opposed on it? Sorry? Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I thought I did call a vote on the file. Oh, I'm sorry. Are we agreed to file? Any opposed? Okay. Opposed? Alderman Chabot. Thank you. All right. Um, so... Uh, that then takes us to CPC 2010-133. Uh, Good afternoon, Your Worship. Um, I'm Kim Hartley, and this is Mr. Maury Lowen. Uh, we are with the Land Use Bylaw Sustainment, and we'll be doing a joint presentation today on the Calgary Planning Commission's recommendations. Textual amendments before you introduce a new permitted use, contextual semi-detached dwelling in the residential contextual 1-2 dwelling RC2 district. As background to this amendment, in 1988, single detached infill guidelines for established communities were introduced. The land use bylaw was subsequently amended to make infill development discretionary in the established areas. Every new infill development was reviewed with discretion. By the early 1990s, the guidelines were updated and land use bylaw 2P80 incorporated the policy as permitted use rules referred to as modest development. Permitted use modest single detached and semi-detached developments were guaranteed approval if they met the rules. Discretion was only applied when an applicant chose to build outside of the modest rules. The Land Use Bylaw 1P2007 framework continued with the permitted use approach to encourage redevelopment by providing a permitted use envelope in the developed areas. The developed area comprises a large portion, portion of the city and is white in this diagram. 
When Bylaw 1P 2007 was approved, a contextual single detached dwelling was included as a permitted use in the developed area. The rules for setback, height, and privacy mirrored the policy in the low density residential housing guidelines and respected the adjacent homes. On February 8, 2010, Council approved amendments to simplify the contextual single detached dwelling rules to ensure the intent of the bylaw framework was achieved and to capture more permits as permitted uses. Homeowners may choose a permitted use process as a contextual single detached dwelling or they may build outside the permitted use envelope as a single detached dwelling. Their application is then reviewed in a discretionary process with guidelines, policy and sound planning principles applicable to the decision. On April 26, 2010, Council adopted several recommendations from an independent review of the bylaw and directed administration to amend the City of Calgary land use bylaw to include contextual design standards for semi-detached residences. Currently, semi-detached dwellings are a discretionary use in the developed area. To respond to Council's direction, we met with industry and community stakeholders three times, did an analysis of a year's worth of semi-detached development permits and evaluated the best practices of nine other municipalities. Based on the information collected and the feedback we received, the rules were developed. To ensure the approach is as simple as possible, the amendment provides permitted use semi-detached dwelling options in the same envelope as the permitted use single detached dwelling. Mr. Lowen will outline the proposed rules. Similar to the contextual single, the facade of each unit must be articulated. This means there's a porch or other element which projects or recesses. The principal front and rear facades of each unit must also be staggered, a minimum of 0.6 of a meter, that's about two feet. The front sap setback rules are the exact same as all other low density residential uses in the developed area. The setback of the two adjacent homes are averaged, allowing a 1.5 meter step forward. That's about a five foot step forward from the average. In this example, house one has an eight meter front setback. House two has a five meter front setback. We average those numbers, subtract a meter and a half, resulting in a five meter setback. The distance from the front property line to the rear of the building is building depth. Building depth changes to reflect the surrounding context. Building depth is based on an average of the two adjacent homes, allowing a 4.6 meter step back. That's about 15 feet. A building depth of 60% of the parcel length is always guaranteed. In this diagram, the two adjacent homes have a shorter building depth, so the 60% of the building of the parcel length applies. The parcel depth is 36.5 meters times that by 60%, resulting in a 21.9 meter building depth. In the next diagram, the buildings have larger building depth, and we'll use the averaging to determine the rule. House one has a 17 meter building depth, house two a 22 meter building depth. We add 4.6 meters, meaning the allowed building depth is 24.1 meters. At 926 square feet main floor area, a reasonably sized dwelling unit is accommodated in both examples. Both have room for flexibility in design or to address specific site constraints and allow for unique architectural variation. Maximum building height ranges from 8.6 to 10 meters, the same as all other low density residential uses. The rules addressing privacy and balcony location are also the same as the contextual single detached dwelling. In the low density residential districts, all narrow parcels require two motor vehicle parking stalls. The contextual semi-detached dwelling requires two parking stalls to recognize future subdivision potential. The garages for unsubdivided semi-detached developments always require a size relaxation to accommodate four parking stalls. A one square meter revision to the maximum garage size will eliminate this technical relaxation pre-subdivision. In the low density residential districts, parcel coverage controls both the building mass and the landscaping. The parcel coverage rule is the same as all other low density residential uses 
at 45%. Individual homeowners can then uh, choose how to landscape the other 55% of their lot. This diagram accurately reflects the space available on a parcel for landscaping. The land use bylaw does not include any regulations on how individuals should choose to landscape their yards. There is no indication that there is a long-term issue with landscaping. Oops, I'm missing a page. Apologies. It is reasonable that trees will be removed to allow for construction. Historically, new homeowners have landscaped their yards after occupancy and over time. Landscaping reflects personal preferences of the homeowner, whether it be a garden for vegetables or trees to provide privacy and shade. Testing shows that a 180 square meter, which is about a 1900 square foot house or dwelling unit can be accommodated to be built with the proposed rules. This dwelling size is consistent with the average size of, of semi-detached dwelling built in 2009. This unit size was confirmed through industry testing. Testing of development permit applications approved in 2009 indicates that approximately 40% of these applications would meet the proposed rule. These photos illustrate some examples of semi-detached developments built in 2009 uh, which meet the proposed rule. A reasonably sized contextual semi-detached dwelling can be approved consistently. Consultation with community and industry stakeholders confirmed that it is reasonable for a contextual semi-detached rules to be based on the current rules for contextual single detached dwellings. A letter of support from the CHBA as well as a letter from the FCC is contained in attachment two. The contextual semi-detached dwelling encourages sensitive redevelopment while providing predictability and certainty for homeowners and builders. We looked at the issue of landscaping and determined that the following elements would be required public consultation, and a citywide inventory of all existing trees on almost 300,000 low-density residential parcels. Decisions would need to be made on the type of bylaw required, likely separate from the land use bylaw, a landscaping permitting system, and opportunities for discretion and relaxations with potential policy guidelines. Staffing, likely arborists, public education so homeowners would be aware of the landscaping permit and requirements, fees and timelines, inspection, enforcement, and appeals. Your Worship, the Calgary Planning Commission recommends that Council adopt the proposed amendments, give three readings to propose bylaw 37P 2010, and direct administration to monitor for a one-year period the level and effectiveness of the proposed contextual semi-detached dwelling and report back to Council. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Hartley. Mr. Lowen, uh, we're still in public hearing, so questions for clarification to administration. Alderman Marr? Uh, Alderman Hodges? Yes, thank you, Worship. Uh, I find it interesting that the presentation made to us this afternoon is an argument that this is a logical continuation of the uh, previous uh, proposed bylaw amendments that Council adopted. But uh, my question is uh, related to the fact that this is, in fact, a fundamental change for the R2 district, or the RC2 district, sorry, across the city, and not a pilot project which the Planning Commission uh, motion would be best directed to, i.e. a review in one year. Are you seriously saying that if the, you find some real issues, as you did with a modest building envelope in the RC2 district, that you'd bring a report back to reverse this process a year from now? Having conducted all this change, encourage Council to adopt this change on a citywide basis? Your Worship, I think we're saying that we have um, some confidence from the framework that this was the direction to move towards a permitted use type of approval process. What we are suggesting is that it's reasonable for a semi-detached dwelling to be within the same envelope as the current contextual single detached envelope. And that would be the extent of our... Uh... Well, ma'am, uh, in theory, I agree with you. But the reality is, as I recall, the analysis presented to Council several years ago 
was that the number of applications that came in in the modest building envelope area was much less than the uh, applications you had to deal with on a discretionary basis. And that's why you don't hear much discussion about the modest building envelope anymore. I think, Your Worship, we agree. And since that time, we found that uh, there's been a change. We found that, um, I guess, the discretionary semi-detached dwellings are currently comprising about 38%, 30, 25% of our, um, of our infill development, which would include uh, other forms such as single and duplex. Mm. So um, with that, we found, and in, in talking with the communities as well, that there does seem to be an interest in this type of movement. Oh, Ma'am, I'm sure there is an interest in this. <laughs> okay. Now, in the realm of consultation, is there a problem with, and I've asked this before, to the chair, perhaps Mr. Watson would like to answer this question. Is there a problem with somebody picking up the phone and contacting a member of council? I don't rec recall any consultation whatsoever with members of council. I've got 12, 13 percent of the applications in 2009 in my area, but never once have I heard from the planning department. Sorry, through the chair, you're suggesting that there should have been a Discussion with members of council. You don't have to agree with us recalcitrant members of council, but at least there could be an effort. There could be an effort at communication. That's all I'm saying, Mr. Watson. Because um, we do end up dealing with citizen complaints on the issues. Well, absolutely. And through the chair, I, I don't believe this piece of work was confidential by any means, and certainly has gone through three times to the community and. Uh, through planning commission and now at the public hearing. Um, I apologize if we didn't extend personal invitations to have conversations. However, quite often members of council seek me out or seek out the staff and have conversations. Yes, that's true. But I think on a citywide uh, policy that's being proposed here that uh, it would have been a good idea to do that, Mr. Watson. Well, I think one of the things, if I could add so your So I await, I await an invitation now on the next round of uh, 1D207 uh, land use bylaw discussions. Well, perhaps you did do raise a good point. We are, as I've said before to this council, and I think it's, it's a very positive thing, we have been bringing forward almost every, I'd say every two or three months, changes to the bylaw right. in order to bring the bylaw up and continuously improve it. And I'd be happy to circulate the various amendments that are in the work right now and invite any members of council that have questions about it to, to sure. contact us. But in order that we can make this bylaw a real live document that actually meets not only the requirements of the community associations, but also the development industry and starts to lay the foundation for some of the things that we see in, in the new MBP, we have to continuously change and modify and I And I don't question it, Mr. Watson. I'd just like to be on the uh, list somewhere You'll be on a list on er, early, er, earlier, preferably, than after the fact. Thanks. You'll be getting a list. Oh, I think you're on the list now, Alderman Hodges. Um, Alderman Carra, questions of clarification. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. First off, great presentation, guys. I really appreciate the in-depth, sort of clearly articulated and laid out uh, approach that you did, and I think it's, I think it's a good example. Um, got a couple questions for you. Um, about public process. Can you tell us about the public process? Certainly. Uh, we held three meetings. Um, more than 80 community associations were invited. The meetings occurred near the end of August and into early or mid-September, I guess. Um, we received emails. We spoke with people. Um, we invited the Inner City Builders Council to participate, and they these were actually joint meetings, one of the first times we've done that. So. Yeah, can you sort of, I mean, not the fact that you held a meeting, but what was the nature of the consultation? Oh, the nature? It's all outlined in, um, I guess it would be an attachment to the CPC uh, report. There's details on what information was covered at each of the three meetings. In advance of the meetings, we set an agenda 
We also presented background material for the information of the attendees. After the meeting, we would send a summary of the discussions that we had, um, and that information was emailed to all of the 80 community association representatives. Um, we didn't hear back that we missed the mark on something or that we um, confused an issue. Um, and then we would proceed based on that with the next meeting, following with an agenda, holding the meeting, and then a summary of the discussions after that. So what percentage do you think going, can you characterize how much do you think uh, what you presented to us today changed as a result of those consultative meetings and hearing from on the ground community associations that are, that are there at the grassroots level? Well, we actually made, we went to probably pretty great efforts to not presuppose the outcome when we held our first meeting. They were asking us, uh, many community reps were asking us for our opinions. We purposefully held off so that we could get the opinions of the representatives and the industry stakeholders. Um, I guess quite a bit. Um, I think directly contributing um, discussions were held on the concept of staggering the units and on the concepts of unit articulation. Um, many of the communities didn't want uh, the buildings to appear cookie cutter. They wanted the flexibility for more unique designs to occur based on whichever community they represented. Um, there was also a lot of discussion on building depth. Um, we were able to provide some information, so those figures <coughs> changed a bit as, as we got input from, from concerned residents on that kind of element. So when you say those figures, you mean the, the kind of mathematical formula that you guys developed to sort of account for degree of articulation and depth from the street and those? More the, so the clarification on what the issue actually was. Um, is the rear yard amenity area more important than the front setback area? Where's the value um, in any change or, or dimension that we come up with? What is, the, what is the intent of the proposed regulation? Interesting, okay, one other question. You said you benchmarked against nine other cities. Which were those cities and how, what was? Oh, you have that, Maureen, you have that. What was the benchmarking? have a list. Sorry, it's a big report. Yeah, and I apologize for <laughs> not having those at my fingertips right now, or tip of my tongue right now. Your Worship, uh, we focused originally on other Alberta municipalities uh, as their housing base is about the same age as our own, so they're starting to see infill development in the same generations as our own. So we looked at Edmonton, Red Deer, Lethbridge, and Medicine Hat. We also looked at Burlington, Winnipeg, London, Mississauga. Uh, these are communities that we often look at uh, based on their size and demographic and the, the nature of their housing stock. We, we like to look at the similar communities each time we go out and look. We also did some additional research into Vancouver and Toronto. Their housing stock is considerably different than ours, but we looked at some of their other regulations as well. Like? Well, Specifically, communities did raise the issues around landscaping and we wanted to research. And we're back. We're still in the public hearing process, so we will take others who wish to speak in opposition to this proposal. Others who wish to speak in opposition. Yes, sir. Ah, and some copies. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Worship, members of Council. My name is David Baker. I'm the Planning Director of the Montgomery Community Association. Um, I did attend two of the three uh, community input sessions that were held and I, I have to say that uh, 
they were very, uh, very well held. They were uh, responsive. Uh, the uh, city planners listened, they heard, and they took very seriously the comments that, that the communities had. Uh, the reason I'm speaking against the proposal today is not for what's in the proposal, but what has been uh, omitted, in our opinion. So cutting right to the chase, uh, the Montgomery Community Association feels that uh, proposed permitted use rules for semi-detached dwellings will permit development which is not compatible with established community intentions for redevelopment. Quality of design, quality of finished material, and building massing may be easily compromised by developers seeking only to meet minimum standards. Our recommendations are that area redevelopment plans somehow be addressed in this process and that some sort of rules be made to uh, address minimum uh, massing and aesthetic considerations. So just for your context, Montgomery is situated in northwest Calgary. Uh, we share um, a River Valley location with our neighbors in Parkdale to the east, Bowness to the west, and Varsity to the north. Uh, Montgomery had in 2009 6% of all of Calgary's uh, RC2 development permits. Uh, there's a calculation which I did at the bottom of the sheet, if it could slide up. I'll read that one. Uh, these numbers are also based on um, uh, census data from, from 2009 showing the number of dwellings in each community. So I took the, the communities with the highest percentage and what it shows is that Montgomery's size combined with the percentage of development says that there is a very intense uh, pressure in Montgomery for RC2 development. Page four and five are a list of all development permits we have reviewed in Montgomery since 2006. Our ARP was adopted I think around 2007. Um, the simple point I wanted to make is at the, at the top of page four, uh, we have reviewed 45 semi-detached uh, homes, so that's 90 units. Uh, of those, 88.9% were built by developers. Single-family homes, we've reviewed 25. 24 of them were developed by the homeowner who owned the land or had already lived on the land or had bought and was moving into uh, the community. So only 4% of single-family homes are by developers. The simple point on this page is that there is a different motivation for constructing when you're building for yourself or when you're building for profit. And our community association has no qualms with profit. We have no qualms with, with new development. But there are uh, different motives and different decisions made in the process. Um, Page 1A, sorry, I shuffled this one back into the deck, is, is one page out of our area redevelopment plan, which in, in many uh, uh, aspects re refers to high quality residential development. Primary consider considerations are high quality design and attention to detail. The design, the aesthetic, the what does it look like on the streetscape, this matters. And this cannot be undervalued in this process. Just a very quick uh, history of, of, of our community for you all. Uh, Montgomery was originally subdivided in the first decade of the last century. It was largely undeveloped until the post-war era in the 1950s. Uh, the lots went for a relatively good price compared to what was in the city. Montgomery was a hamlet at that time. Many of the homes that were built at that time were seven and 800 square foot bungalows. Some of them, the ones who had more money, would have uh, cellars underneath or, or crawl spaces. A lot of them only had slab on grade construction. And of course, there were no services at the time, so everyone was on septic. This was, this was the origin of Montgomery. In the mid 60s, the city uh, annexed Montgomery, brought running water, street lights, paved the streets. But in the ensuing decades, from the 50s when this was built out, there were small lower end houses and redevelopment stagnated. Uh, Non-resident property owners took on the properties for revenue purposes and frankly let them run into the ground. And what we saw going into the late 90s in Montgomery was urban decay. 
Your time is up, Mr. Baker, but if you want to wrap up quickly. Uh, the development that happened in the late 90s was very simple. It had very little aesthetic value whatsoever. Plastic houses, essentially. Vinyl boxes, 15-year asphalt shingles, plastic windows. The lowest possible denominator of building materials that could be possible was what was going into our community. After our area redevelopment plan came into place, this has become the standard in the last four to five years for semi-detached housing, and this is fantastic. But this has come because we have directed it so, not because we've left it in the hands of others. If you would on the next. Not only in residential, but commercially, we have new commercial buildings, new apartment buildings, uh, doctor's offices, restaurants with patios. This is fantastic, and this has all happened in the last four years. The impetus, the, the reason that people are coming to Montgomery now is because the aesthetics of our residential streets have improved so greatly. People feel that this is the up and coming community. So, uh, the aesthetics matter. The, the, the lower uh, page is one done through the ARP preservation of existing trees, quality of aesthetics, use of materials, building uh, articulation. The, the houses above, which were done in the late 90s, would pass given the uh, proposed um, legislation that's in front of you today. And not only in Montgomery could these come back, literally these could be in any community in the city without any discretion. So our observation, our conclusion, established communities are somewhat like suburban developers. We don't own the land as such, but as community residents, we have that same vested interest. We work with a multitude of small business interests who invest and wish to profit from development in our communities while we, the community associations, maintain uh, the expectations for the overall common benefit. Suburban land developers, the, the karmas and the ones doing the, the, the outer outskirts, they know the importance of, of managing multiple builders and they put in place architectural controls for exactly these reasons, not just the footprint, they manage what they should look like because it, it matters to them. It gives the builders certainty that the guy's not coming in next door and putting up schlock, because that would undermine the value of the quality work that's being done. And Montgomery suggests to you that communities be given the same kinds of consideration that something, even on a small level, be done to address the aesthetics of semi-detached houses. Your Worship. Thank you very much, Mr. Baker. I've got a few people who want to ask you questions here, so we'll start with Alderman Lowe. Thank you. Um, during the first year experience with the RC1 contextual, did you, how many did you review then? I don't know that we've seen any. You don't know? Okay. No. So I guess my question is, have you had any failures with those? Uh, I, I don't think we've had any. I mean, we have probably 40 or 50 houses under construction right now, and I you know, don't walk around monitoring every one. So. Okay. No, it, come through, and honest. the reason the reason I ask the question is that one of the very important considerations about this is the fact that after a year, we, you know, we've, we've directed a commission, we demand directed the authority to go and review the progress. And so I think what we're looking f candidly for is examples of failure where something didn't work, where your horror story manifested itself. So uh, that, that's the genesis of my question about the RC ones. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Lowe. Alderman Carra. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, please pardon me. I'm suffering from a cluster headache right now, so I'm coming off like I'm asleep, but I'm not. I'm just in pain. Very interested in what you're saying. Uh, and I just wanted to thank you for your presentation, and thank you for making a very coherent uh, statement about the unbelievable value that community associations bring in terms of establishing the brand of their neighborhoods and protecting that brand and creating um, value for everybody. And I will be speaking to points similar to that in the debate, but I just wanted to thank you for your time and effort in coming here today. Thanks, Alderman Carr. Alderman Hodges. Uh, thanks, Your Worship. Um, Mr. Baker, maybe uh, you could just mention as part of your overview that uh, uh, I would say, give or take, 40% of the land area in Montgomery is RC2. Uh, that's correct, sir. Almost half. Mm -hmm. 
And so that's why this is the issue that it is for you and for the residents in the community. It's not as though, even though the majority of the houses are single family, in fact, the 40% of the land use is in fact RC2. That's correct. And it will become the, the face of our community in the future, what's being built now. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Hodges. Anyone else for Mr. Baker? Thank you so much for taking the time today, Mr. Baker. Very helpful. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition to this proposal? Anyone else speaking in opposition? Good afternoon, Your Worship, Council members and staff. I do have a, uh, a handout here that I would like permission to, to have distributed to Council members. Thank you. My name is Doug Roberts, R-O-B-E-R-T-S. I represent the Richmond Knob Hill Community Association. Uh, Richmond Knob Hill is a, uh, an inner city community that straddles Crowchild Trail between 17th Avenue and th 20, uh, 33rd Avenue Southwest. This picture I've put up is a picture that was taken from the uh, 26th Avenue Crowchild overpass. Um, we feel our community is currently on the front lines of residential redevelopment activity. Uh, our community has been the subject of over 60 development permit applications since January of this year. Uh, the community association welcomes the redevelopment activity and the resulting reinvigoration and renewal of our community. However, we've noticed one disturbing trend uh, is that developers often propose to cut down more existing trees than necessary to accommodate their projects and often fail to provide for adequate new replacement trees to be planted. To address these concerns, the Community Association has made the preservation and enhancement of the community's urban forest canopy one of its primary uh, objectives um, and priorities over the past year and to this end we uh, set a record apparently by planting 140 new public trees in our community under the city's neighborhoods program which we understand was uh, more than any other community previously had planted in the history of that program in addition we've also addressed the issue of retention and planting of trees in our comments on virtually every sub uh, every development permit application that we've reviewed in the course of the past year Unfortunately, our efforts in this latter regard have received minimal support from either development and building approvals or the Subdivision and Development Appeal Board, which we actually find very puzzling given that the Richmond Area Redevelopment Plan, the City's infill guidelines and the City's new Municipal Development Plan are all support the preservation of trees whenever possible. In the, ca in the case of the infill guidelines, the planting of new trees of equal value to replace any existing trees that cannot be preserved in the redevelopment process and the fact that section 35 of the land use bylaw states that the development authority must take these policy documents into effect into consideration when developing development perm when reviewing development permit applications despite this lack of support the community's efforts over the past year to promote the retention and planting of trees have actually been quite successful as can be demonstrated from the handout charts these charts summarize tree-related statistics gathered from the 37 development permit applications for residential redevelopment projects in Richmond Knob Hill, which have been approved by the Development Authority during the period from January to November of this year. I should point out 70% of those uh, applications were for semi-detached uh, dwellings. Uh, which seems contrary to the city's indication that semi-detached is I think in the 30 to 40 percent range uh, overall. Um, I'd like to direct council's attention to the second chart on the handout uh, which <clears throat> describes the Richmond Knob Hill private tree count. Um, just for your information this the way to read this chart generally from left to right the first column on the left represents trees existing trees prior to redevelopment the second column is what the developer has proposed in their development permit application. Third column is what we came back with in our comments uh, to the file manager. And the fourth column is what eventually was approved by development authority. Um, as you'll see from this chart, uh, left to their own devices, the, the developers are not overly inclined to preserve trees. The 70% uh, of the existing trees uh, would have been uh, removed in this process. And it's also important to note that we, when we put our comments back to the file manager, 
we only ask for trees that we feel are good candidates for preservation, i.e. they appear healthy and they appear to be outside of the building envelope. We don't ask for trees that are in the middle of a, of a proposed new garage or, or house to be, to be preserved. Um, our efforts, just in the pushback through the comment process, we've managed to uh, reduce uh, the, uh, or to preserve an additional 27 trees over the course of the last year and result in almost twice as many new trees planted, um, resulting in a 38% increase in the total number of private trees on these uh, lots undergoing redevelopment as compared to an overall 20% reduction in the total of number of trees based on the developer's um, proposals themselves. And just to look at the, the effect on the tree canopy, same kind of chart showing the impact on the tree canopy. One important thing to note here, the blue uh, charts, the blue uh, bars represent public trees. So you can see very quickly from this that in our neighborhood, public trees only represent approximately 10% of the total residential trees in our neighborhood. Uh, but as you see here as well, that the community has been successful in its efforts over this past year to reduce the decline in tree canopy on these lots undergoing redevelopment to 53% as compared to a 29% decline uh, if we had not been involved in the process or had an opportunity to have been involved. So our concerns with respect to the proposed rules that are before you for contextual semi-detached dwellings is that they do nothing to require or even encourage developers to retain existing trees or plant new trees and therefore provide absolutely no protection for 90% of our community's urban forest canopy. If the proposed rules are implemented in their current form, then a much greater proportion of the development permit applications for residential redevelopment in Richmond Knob Hill will bypass the community completely preventing the community from continuing in its current role as protector of trees. Our request to this point through those public meetings that took place in August and September to have these rules, something included to preserve the trees or help protect the trees or somehow address the tree issue, tended to be rejected for two primary reasons. One, it was pointed out to us that if they did that, then it would make these semi-detached rules different than the existing single detached contextual rules that were introduced earlier this year. Uh, and of course, those are not due for, re for review until next year. Secondly, the city legal department has apparently, is apparently concerned that the Alberta Municipal Government Act is not, doesn't clearly give the city authority to enact a tree protection bylaw that would apply to private trees. Our view is that both of these stumbling blocks could be easily addressed by first of all delaying the implementation of these proposed rules until after the existing single detached rules are reviewed. Um, and then secondly, in addition to any other recommended changes that might arise from that review of the single, the existing single detached rules, incorporate into both sets of rules or even better yet, into the land use bylaw itself applicable to all low, res res low density residential development, a landscaping requirement that would require adequate new trees to be planted unless sufficient existing trees are preserved. As a longer term solution, we would like to see Council direct City Administration to work with the, the province of Alberta to see amend, about amending the Municipal Government Act to include whatever additional language they feel should be in there in order to allow the city to implement a tree protection bylaw that applies to private trees. I would be happy to address any questions. Thanks very much, Mr. Roberts. Alderman Marr. Thank you, Worship. Uh, Mr. Roberts, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Uh, with respect to the contextual study overall, um, certainly I spoke to, to uh, Liz about this earlier in the week with regards to the trees, but is there anything beyond the trees in the contextual study that, that, that uh, Richmond Knob Hill is, is going to speak on? Or is this really just about the trees? We have concerns with other things that we feel are not addressed, adequately addressed under mm -hmm. the proposed rules, uh, things such as context, uh, drainage, um, are, uh, and overlooking. There are some aspects in overlooking, but we don't think they're adequate to address uh, the concerns in our neighborhood. We have decided, however, today to focus our efforts on the trees because it's we feel that that is the the primary area in which the proposed rules fall short. Mm -hmm. And you heard from one of the um, one of the developers today that was speaking about uh, about trees and how they try to preserve and feel that that has a significant impact on their on their ability to sell their product. Do you have any comments with regards to that? 
This is an example of a recent uh, development proposal that uh, was passed by the Development Authority. Um, as it turns out, uh, we didn't really know where these trees were because, of course, on the developer's original proposal, none of the trees were shown on the site plan. So it was hard for us to determine where all of these trees were relative to the proposed new dwelling and garage. Mm -hmm. We asked in our comments for the trees to be shown so that we could see where they were and then we could know which ones maybe were actually savable. Uh, and also to know what the caliper size, because it's our understanding that with a, a good sized tree spade, you can relocate an existing tree up to uh, 300 meters in caliper diameter, uh, 300 millimeters of caliper diameter, without the tree even knowing it's been moved. Um, as it turns out in this case, in, and we ended up appealing this one to the SDAB, they did finally provide us with a site plan that showed the trees, and as it turns out, all of the trees on this lot could have been preserved either in their current location or uh, through the, the use of relocation with a tree spade. Unfortunately, before we got to SDAB, they were all gone. Mm -hmm. And frankly, this is too common an experience for us uh, where developers seem, I mean, although we understand and we acknowledge there are some developers that are, that do appreciate trees and do try and plan around them. There are unfortunately quite a few who just view them as an inconvenience and something that's in the way. And as a result, their initial proposal, unless pushed, is to clear cut the lot. Okay, and that, that's interesting. Uh, and I appreciate your showing us some context. Uh, one other question, if I was to play the devil's advocate, whose tree is it? Belongs to the landowner. Right. Okay, well that is, uh, but you believe that by having a tree policy, if you will, we would be able to save potentially up to 70% more, is that what you're, you're suggesting? Well, we as a community association with apparently no authority at all have managed to save an additional 27 in our tree. 27 trees over the course of the last 11 months. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to see what we could do if we actually had the support of the city. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you do have the support of the city insofar as we, as you mentioned earlier, just uh, supplied through the Neighborhoods program 140 trees, which you also mentioned was the most ever. So I appreciate, I appreciate your, your comments and your thoughts, and I know that Alderman Pincott is proposing something, so, uh, and I'm proposing something in a moment as well. So, Your Worship, if you would recognize me at the appropriate time. Thank you. I sure will. Thank you, Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. Mr. Roberts, you do acknowledge the fact that um, if someone were to choose to remove their trees from their private property prior to even making application for a development permit, that that's within their purview, right? Yes, uh, yes, we understand that. So this wouldn't hinder or alter that in any way? No, and we have heard that argument made that if we put a tree protection bylaw in place, uh, something that applied at the development stage or redevelopment stage, that developers would be likely to come in and clear cut the lot before submitting their application so they don't have to contend that. To contend with that, what we would perhaps like to suggest as a, a route that might help address that is to impose a tree requirement that was sufficiently onerous that it would not require but encourage developers that if they happen to have a lot that already had trees on it uh, to enact, work around, leave those trees and as a result not have to, to buy and plant as many new ones. Mm -hmm. Especially if that um, recommendation could um, limit the need for vegetation based on the size possibly of the existing vegetation. Yes, that is correct. For example, one possibility, and this is just something that we've come up with ourselves, if there was a requirement, for example, on a standard 50 foot or 15 meter wide lot for a minimum of four trees with a minimum aggregate caliper size of 600 millimeters, that would require, if a developer wanted to just go out and buy new trees to plant, them to, to buy four 150 millimeter trees, which are six inch diameter caliper, which you can't get at Sunnyside. Uh, those you have to go to a, a, a tree farm to obtain, and they're relatively expensive to to obtain and, and plant, whereas if they already had an existing, for example, 300 millimeter tree, uh, a 12 inch caliper tree that they could save, uh, that would satisfy half of the size requirement and then they'd only have to go out and plant three 100 millimeter trees, which can be easily obtained and planted. Thank you for your input here today. Appreciate those responses. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Anyone else for Mr. Roberts? Thank you, Mr. Roberts, and thanks for these Thank great you. stats and all the work that uh, your community association is doing on this issue.
Anyone else wish to speak in opposition to the proposal? Anyone else in opposition? Hello? Request um, distribution. Madam Clerk will come. Your Worship and members of Council, my name is Karen Paul. I'm President of the Britannia Community Association and a member of the FCC's Urban Planning Committee. I fully participated in the consultations for Planet and the permitted use RC1 changes and I'm excited to be involved in Planet's first local area plan for the 50th Avenue Southwest Corridor, which includes the entire communities of El Boyo, Windsor Park, and Britannia. And these com communities support my submission today. So just how do we implement the Planet vision in order to achieve a more sustainable city? How do we preserve and enhance the character of established communities when that character is in large part defined by its public and private green spaces and tree cover. As a city, how do we double or triple our tree canopy, which is the 70-year MDP target, if the majority of the urban forest that we have is on private land? <coughs> Last Saturday, the, sil the city facilitated an all-day visioning exercise for the 50th Avenue LAP. My takeaways from that session were that our three established communities are expected to absorb 30% more population and jobs in 30 years, and a total of 60% more in 70 years time. Green was identified as a clear priority for redevelopment by the participants. There was buy-in for intensifying the peripheries, urban and neighborhood corridors and nodes, but the low density cores of these communities are to be preserved. So what will our communities look like in 30 or 70 years? Intensification will mean a loss of landscapable area that can support trees with wide canopy spans. Rooftop gardens just can't make this up. Infill development will mean that lot coverage will double to at least 45% the maximum allowed in the contextual permitted use rules. Double car garages, drives, and patios will further infringe on landscapable area. The combined effect of reduced side yards and two-story homes that cause shading will limit tree planting to columnar species that add little to the canopy. With at least 40% of infills targeted to fall within the contextual rules for single and semis, a huge gap is created in the ability of the city, community associations, and immediate neighbors to influence the tree canopy at the local level. The lack of landscaping in the permitted contextual rules unfairly discriminates between new and redevelopment. Greenfield low density, multi-residential, and discretionary infills all have mechanisms to address landscaping. In the latter case, communities and neighbors receive circulation of plans, have the right to comment and appeal. Streamlining city DP processes is great, but recognize that it erodes these rights. The net cost being a loss of key elements that define community character behind, beyond building footprint and massing, so one size doesn't fit all. The urban forestry section of the NDP clearly acknowledges the value of trees, many with real public economic benefits, including stormwater, energy, water, and air quality. The MDP sets policies that include trees on private land and the target tree canopy in local area plants. So the concern here is that without specific wording in the permitted use RC1 and RC2 rules, anything specified in the LAP will be ignored. Our community's first experience with a permitted use contextual single infill illustrates these concerns, and I would be happy to elaborate this on this later. I take real exception to the statement in the September 14th consultation summary that a rule that would require the replacement of landscaping would be gratuitous, as landscaping can be altered prior to and after new home construction. This is true, but the time to influence trees is precisely at the time of redevelopment. A tree cutting bylaw, as is implemented in many other progressive cities, is a different matter. But what is needed here in regards to contextual infills is bylaw wording linked to the development permit application and made a condition of occupancy. It should set a minimum standard for suitable replanting, meaning appropriate species selection and planting location, given grade changes, obstacles, exposure and existing landscaping, as well as protection measures for private trees during construction. If a homeowner wishes to go beyond that, great. Our city is changing. We're moving away from our rural roots, inherent knowledge of tree culture, and the dream of owning a big patch of land. Recognize that a tree is not just private property. It can occupy the neighbor's air and ground space. 
It may impede that neighbor from planting another tree on an adjacent side yard, and it certainly adds to the collective vista of the streetscape. Perhaps it is time for the city to take a more paternalistic view toward our urban forest to achieve the greater good for our future citizens. In conclusion, the planet vision won't be realized without attention to the issue of trees on private land. And keep in mind that in achieving the tree planting target, the city's long-term tree maintenance costs will be contained if the majority of the urban forest continues to be located on private property. And also, there is already provision for construction site visits by urban forests for public boulevard trees. So they could just add on the uh, private inspections at that time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Paul. Alderman Pincott. Um, thanks, and thanks for being here and hanging out. Um, so you've only spoken about trees mm -hmm. in response to this. Uh, and I think we talked earlier about how if we're going to do something around trees, it can't just be around RC2, that it needs to be a, a, a broader policy, which I think you agree with. Because ultimately, Britannia doesn't have any RC2. No, we don't. But I'm speaking again on behalf of the LAP area, which includes El Boya okay. and Windsor Park. So, so, so what's before us today are RC2 contextual guidelines. Mm -hmm. If we're going to address your concerns, uh, and I do have a motion arising actually from outside of this, because just looking at it within RC2 doesn't address the challenge. It certainly doesn't do anything for Britannia. Uh, would you be supportive of that, of, of, of looking, of addressing your concern, not within the RC2 contextual, but more broadly than that? Uh, yes, I would, okay. but it would also be nice to have something in the RC2 um, change that would at least protect trees that are to be retained, that are identified on the site plan as being retained. Um, and again, I speak to the uh, experience that we've had with our, our first RC1 permitted use contextual. Okay. Um, and other than, other than in Britannia or I, I, this example of trees around RC1, do you have or and the RC2 contextual guidelines? Do you have any other comments other than just the trees? Trees is our main concern. Okay. Um, the the setbacks, I guess, our, our communities are defined by the green space. Yeah. And the setbacks um, that are allowed within the um, uh, new contextual rules for singles, um, and I assume they would apply as well to the, the semis, uh, are way beyond what our community standard is. And that doesn't mean what's built today. It's beyond what our community standard is that we're tolerating for, for new development in the communities. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ms. Paul. Alderman Marr? Okay, we'll hold that then. Anyone else for Ms. Paul? Thank you so much for being here, Ms. Paul. Others to speak in opposition, please. Others to speak in opposition. Uh, good afternoon, Your Worship, members of Council. Uh, my name is Bob Van Wiegen. I'm the urban planner with the Federation of Calgary communities, and I've heard a lot here this afternoon have scribbled all over my remarks, so hope you'll forgive me if I occasionally stumble across them. Um, uh, as you know, as the Federation, we can't speak for every community on every issue, and there will be differing opinions, but we do try to offer a community perspective. You have my letter, initial letter to Planning Commission, and as you've heard, many community associations are still uncomfortable with contextual permitted infills. Uh, we've heard that Contextual rules that apply across the entire developed area of the city might not actually serve the context of very different neighborhoods and situations. Planner discretion and community input is the way we've traditionally filled this gap between bylaw policy and context on the ground. A different way to do this might be to develop community appropriate overlays in the land use bylaw that incorporate local policies as objective standards that bring ARP policy and bylaw implementation closer together. Um, I've talked about this before, but more and more we, we observe a gap between um, local policies that are often left many years out of date and bylaw implement, uh, bylaw, and what's in the bylaw and how things are implemented. Um, this was recommended in last year's land use bylaw and process uh, review report. And um, I'm going to just read a quote out of that. I hadn't planned to do so, so I, I hope I have the time. Um, this is from the Clarion report. 
At present, ARPs are considered during the review of discretionary approvals within Stream 4, but an alternative is available. Some cities revise their bylaws to incorporate important aspects of approved area plans into objective standards that apply to particular types of development or particular areas. Those standards become part of the bylaw and bylaw checkers confirm their compliance during review. This approach would require the city to decide what portions of ARPs it intends to make objective requirements and which portions are non-regulatory goal or aspiration statements. This change would put the City of Calgary closer to the mainstream approach, allowing adopted plans to apply to both permitted and discretionary uses. Some expansion or variation on this sentiment might address some of what uh, Mr. Matsui and Mr. Baker alluded to earlier. Um, I'm going to move back to my comments. Um, last April, changes were made to the single detached infill envelopes so that they would capture about 40% of applications. The last few months is probably not enough time to judge success in the eyes of communities, and the annual review is scheduled for this spring. Nevertheless, these contextual permitted use for semi-detached was developed based on these rules starting in August. To the extent that permitted contextual rules entice builders to build modestly, that's a very good thing as the large size of infills and loss of mature landscaping are common issues. But there's no review by planners, they're not circulated for comment and they can't be appealed. They also don't have to, to adhere to ARPs or the infill guidelines. Therefore, it's very important that the bylaw rules be careful to require those things that are most important because these will be the only rules for the estimated 40 to 60% of semi-detached infills. And that is a change. Uh, we've talked quite a bit about the issue of trees. Um, from a higher level perspective, in, which are not included in this, even though uh, they were a very important part of community context, nor is, as we've heard, opportunity for dialogue between community planner and applicant that might positively influence trees. From a higher level perspective, a core indicator of Planet Calgary is percentage of tree canopy. According to the MDP, the 1998, the canopy cover was 7%, and the 60-year target is 14 to 20%. And as we've heard, an estimated 60 to 90 percent of trees in urban forests are on private land. I expect the majority of plantable private land in Calgary is low density residential. Soft mature trees that are lost from infill development happens. In order to address the MDP target, I suggest the city needs a tree strategy including for low density infills. This is reflected in the urban forestry section of the MDP which calls for quote, an increase in the retention and planting of trees, bushes and shrubs on private and public land and encouraging the planting of trees and green spaces part of new development. Another policy is to quote, further develop pre tree protection and planting measures to ensure maximum conservation of existing trees in the site design and layout of new buildings. Given the MDP canopy targets, the apparent need to consider trees on low density lots to meet the target, given the support provided by further policy development in the MDP, and given the diminished opportunity to influence tree retention and planting due to the greatly increased number of permitted use low density infill applications, uh, we recommend that Council do pass a motion uh, to work with uh, internal and external stakeholders to investigate the issue of tree retention and planting, particularly in low density permitted use contextual infill developments, and make recommendations and policy amendments to Council no later than the spring because we don't want to wait any longer than is required to get something actionable and I think the industry would feel the same way. Uh, thank you. Thanks Mr. Van Wiegen. Uh, questions for Mr. Van Wiegen. Alderman Marr, that's for later or now? Go Question. Ahead. And again, this is uh, interesting that we have this huge contextual study and, and what we're hearing from the communities and from the FCC strictly on trees. Virtually everything else you're good with in the report, is that right? So if we were to, to create an amendment or do something specifically for trees, for the most part, what I'm hearing is that you're, you're quite happy with it. Well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me back up a bit. I guess there's a couple of things. Uh, the, first of all, I, I think that the, the, the tree thing is something that was seen as, as sort of like uh, an obvious and graspable issue that we might be able to affect some positive change on that would really help communities and it's also has some cover under the municipal development plan so that's that's very that's very positive um, what uh, what we also heard for example from from 
from Mr. Matsui, Mr. Baker, and I've heard, I've heard from others as well, is more generally um, concern, about the, uh, concern about the contextual uh, infill, permitted infills, and I, I guess other permitted uses potentially as being insensitive to uh, local area policies and local rules. I could come here and say, uh, well, let's not, you know, let's keep this all discretionary. Uh, but I've also heard from communities that they're not too happy about how discretion is being applied. When they have discretionary applications, many of them uh, express concerns that uh, it's the bylaw that's, that's really what rules. And uh, discretionary, the discretionary review, the infill guidelines and the ARPs are not as effectual as they, as they should be. So, so what am I to say? I, what, I have, what I have said is pointed out uh, one thing that we found very interesting um, in the land use bylaw and process re review report, the Clarion report, um, that uh, talks about a way to um, sort of bring policy and bylaw together again in a way that seems to, it seems to have been pulled apart and is perhaps not being well served now. Uh, that's probably a bigger project than you want to tackle today. Uh, but uh, I, I hope it's uh, addressed in the near, fu near future. It would be a, certainly a refocusing of efforts. It might be a, a, a game changer, potentially. It's certainly worth talking about. Uh, but, uh, but today, it'd be, it'd be very nice to have some, some satisfaction on, on the issue of trees. Thank you, Alderman Mark. No, I appreciate that. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you for your comments. Thank you. Um, thank you. Anyone else for Mr. Van Wegen? Thanks very much, Mr. Van Wegen. Anyone else wish to speak in opposition to this proposal? Anyone wish to speak in opposition to this proposal? All right, then I'm going to close the public hearing and move to members of council with debate and questions for administration. Alderman Marr. Thank you, Your Worship. It seems I was just up here. Uh, I have two questions, one for law and then one for planning. Um, and if it, with your permission, I'd like to begin with law. Uh, Ms. Flowen, with respect for this being on private property, what, what ability would we have as a municipality to be able to um, create some sort of legislation enforcing on private property, enforcing a, a, a tree policy, if you will? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Uh, thank you, um, Your Worship. It's an interesting question, and um, there's a number of challenges because uh, in terms of regulating new vegetation and new trees, um, that, of course, can be accommodated under the um, Municipal Government Act pursuant to the Land Use Bylaw. Mm -hmm. um, that's not a problem. Uh, you run into some practical difficulties, though, in terms of implementation and monitoring and enforcement. Um, which we can get into or discuss if you wish. Um, but in terms of regulating the protection of trees, that becomes a little bit more difficult, um, much like heritage buildings. Mm -hmm. um, I am aware of some municipalities in different provinces that have what are actually called heritage tree protection bylaws. Mm -hmm. And they have very different enabling legislation than we have in Alberta. Um, it can create great constraints on the redevelopment of property. And that's something that needs to be thought through, much like we have under the, heritage, the uh, historical resources uh, right. legislation. And so there are some jurisdictional concerns to address. Um, beyond that, though, provided that we could get over that hurdle, again, there's some practical implementation problems. Um, once you create a system that would regulate um, th these types of trees and protecting, protecting um, existing trees, uh, we run into enforcement issues, and we need to be able to ensure that once we create expectations with that kind of legislation that we can actually follow through on it. And it may appear simple at first glance, but there are um, many different legal issues, and I don't mean just in terms of jurisdiction, I mean the practical enforcement of it. Um, right. That okay. becomes a problem. No, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Uh, well, with regards to that, is a, a municipal has any municipality at all in Alberta using the same MGA that we are? Do they have? Is there any jurisdiction that you're aware of that has a, a municipal tree protection plan? 
Your button's not working. Uh -oh. Still not working. Let's talk about it. I'll show you. Um, Your Worship, I'm not aware of any not. municipality in Alberta. I'm not aware of any municipality in Alberta that has um, a bylaw per se mm -hmm. in terms of policies. Honestly, I've I've never looked into that. I don't know if there's voluntary policies that perhaps other councils have. I'm I'm not sure. But again, without the power of a bylaw behind it, um, it's questionable in terms of its uh, enforceability. That's not to say it wouldn't be effective, um, but it would really depend how it was structured, what they were trying to achieve in terms of determining its effectiveness. Right. No, I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Vaughan. Um, Mr. Watson? Okay. Thanks, Ms. Vaughan. Mr. Watson. A quick question for you then. Were we to look at some form of way to provide some form of protection for trees. Is there some way that we would be able to, through planning, incentivize development and redevelopment and protection of trees through that process? Have we looked at that? Have we considered it at all? Well, through the chair, of course, there are ways that we can incentivize or try to encourage this. <clears throat> the question becomes whether or not through regulations you want to do that. And I, I pick up on Ms. Flone's point, uh, once we set up rules and regulations, there's got to be enforcement, there's got to be resources, there's got to be ways of doing it. Um, nothing's impossible, it just takes tax money and the ability to hire people to undertake this work. Mm. Okay, so this would be done uh, for, from an enforcement, well, we don't even know if it's legal, first of all. The second issue is we don't, we don't know how we would be able to enforce it in a practical sense, but from an incentive perspective, I'm very reluctant to say what people can do in their private property or cannot do on their private property, but I, I do appreciate the fact that we want to retain as much of our tree canopy as possible. So I'm looking for you uh, and your department to see if there's some way that we could reach out to redevelopment and ensure that there is some way to incent development and redevelopment to keep and preserve that, that uh, level of, of tree canopy? Well, certainly there's ways, uh, and, and through the uh, one presentation from one of the community associations, we, we saw that through their work, there's been a lot of encouragement. Um, we can certainly encourage that also, but again, it's a matter of respecting the rights of private property owners mm -hmm. and how far you want to impinge on that, I, I think with the creativity of Ms. Flone and, and others, we can probably come up with something that, that could be done, but once you're doing that, then you're, you're into the other side of that. If you want this to actually happen, there's gotta be resources and enforcement to make it happen. Um, this is all part of, uh, Mr. Van Wiegen talked about uh, Planet, or, or the, the Paul, I believe, before that. Um, We've got to find a way, I would suggest, that redevelopment is not at a disadvantage of new greenfield development. Mm -hmm. And the longer or the more we layer on policy and procedures on redevelopment in the inner city, in the developed area, the less chance, frankly, Council, you're going to see a switch between greenfield development and redevelopment. And I'm certainly, we want to work with the, the community association and the FCC over the next number of months talk about how we can do that but uh, this layer of policy and regulation on top of regulation uh, all affects the length of time it takes for a single family house to be built in the inner city versus a single family house on the edge and if that is the direction you want Calgary to go in council we can certainly continue in that direction right now but I, I think there are bigger bigger things we have to look at over the next number of months and thank you, Ms. Watson. And, and currently that is lagging behind in from Greenfield to inner city about eight months, isn't it, on average? Well, it, it depends. I mean, in a Greenfield development, you do not have to get a development permit at all. Mm -hmm. Whereas an inner city development and a redevelopment application is about eight months, which is... Uh, well... I'm, I'm, it varies, I understand, but... I'll let, Ms. Hartley, we've made some great strides over the last number of the last year and a half, but certainly on some of these, depending on 
the size and then some concerns that are expressed both by my department and by the community associations. These can take a long period of time and then there's the appeal process potentially after that, which again adds on top of that. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roshan. Thanks, Alderman Marr. Alderman Pincott. Thank you. Uh, one of the things we, we heard was that we, uh, we've done the, the change to RC1 and it hasn't been a year yet. So how, I mean, anecdotally, hearing from some people that RC, the, the changes that we made to the RC1 contextual um, is, is going very well. Uh, so what would be, I guess, what's, what is, what's the, the logic behind not waiting to see a year or some results out of our, the, the changes in RC1 so they could inform changes to the RC2? Ms. Hartley? <laughs> your, your Worship, we actually were uh, in, in the late summer beginning our review process in the singles and started looking at some very important issues with single detached and, and we have to address how we're going to engage the communities once again because their involvement is very important. Um, however, the independent bylaw review did happen in April and Council did make a notice of motion uh, requesting that, that the contextual semi be addressed. So we've began looking at the contextual single and we can tell you that numerically they are hitting close to their 40% target. Qualitatively, we need to talk to the communities and to our planning staff to see qualitatively how those homes look and we have to get to that stage. But right now we're responding to council's notice of motion to create a contextual semi-detached bone. Okay, do you anticipate, go back to RC1, because I, I do think it's relevant. Um, do you anticipate that, uh, that there might be changes that we may need to make to the land use bylaw after a year? Uh, probably not based on what the industry is hearing, but what we're hearing from communities. There were a lot of things that were discussed during our engagement with communities and industries over the contextual single, and some of those issues have arisen again over the contextual semi. Just some of the same concerns are there, and there's definitely some things we're going to be looking at. But right now, I think it's premature for us to suppose what we might be looking at. Okay. Uh, from your community, from your engagement, your stakeholder engagement on this, did you target communities that were RC2 to, and invite them to the table? So, uh, so when we, so Ramsey was at the table for that and? Ramsey was invited. I don't believe they made it to any of our sessions. Okay. Uh, a gentleman from Inglewood who couldn't attend any of the sessions did send us a very detailed. Okay. okay. I, I did check. The largest slice of the pie is Altador, which is mine, and uh, they were involved in, in this. Um, now, what about, uh, and I asked this question about the RC1 as well. Uh, because one of the one of the concerns that we hear from communities and community associations, I will make that distinction, community associations, uh, is the the loss of the ability to comment on development permits. And one of the things that was asked, uh, and I believe it was Ms. Paul, uh, around being circulated just for information, not even for comment, but just for circulation, has that been undertaken at all? Do you know? On 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 applications that fall within the guidelines in our permitted use? All of the uh, permitted use applications uh, will be circulated to the community associations for their information. Right. That is currently in practice. And that is happening with the RC1? That is happening with the RC1. Okay. And that, so th that will continue as well for the RC2? Correct. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, now, we've... It, it, I find it interesting, in your presentation you rarely touched on trees, and, it, and trees are the things that we've heard the most. I mean, right from the, the proponents, the, build, the builders spoke about trees and how they would love to see trees be protected, and you know, they will work to see trees be, be protected. Uh, what are your comments on all of the talk about trees, and, and, and how, have, how do you feel that you've addressed them in in the proposed changes? Um, your worship, maybe we haven't addressed them as well as they should have been because of the limited scope of our direction. Right. Um, we do see a real issue with purposeful legislation. If you can come in in advance of any of the requirements, like a development permit or you can get a demolition permit, 
we want the legislation to be meaningful and purposeful. So some of those um, preliminary discussions regarding trees and their protection on private land um, were related to the opportunities that are available to the developer or the homeowner now. They can take out trees on their own land if they see fit. Reset, okay. Uh, so then from a planning perspective, you would see any anything to do with something like trees would have to be legislatively driven to be applicable at a planning level? I think as Ms. Fulham has suggested, it should be investigated. Um, I'm not 100% convinced that this might be the correct spot for it okay. because of the limited scope of the research. Um, there was no consultation. We didn't advertise that we'd be looking at trees. Okay. I mean, it's a much bigger question. And yeah. I think it, if you've decided that that's where you'd like to go, um, we should look at it with the MDP mandate, urban forestry, tree canopy strategy. I mean, there's that's where I suggest it might be a separate bylaw from land use. It might okay. not be. I don't. All right, or or something that then could inform, and we could actually at a subsequent date make changes to Correct. guidelines. Correct. Okay. Great. Um, I will be following up if you would recognize me for a motion, a motion arising. Thank you. Happy to do so, Alderman Pincott. Alderman Carra. Um, thank you, Your Worship. I've got a question just about sort of procedure. Ian Cope is the CPC. This, this report's coming out of CPC. And Ian Cope is the secretary to CPC who presents. But in this case, we have a department that's a proponent of something presenting in Ian Cope's stead. Mr. Watson. Through the chair, Your Worship, Alder McCraw, that's absolutely right. Not so much the department as proponent, but the department is reporting on what CPC. They were at CPC. When we have technical policy issues, we usually get the authors of the policy issue. Now, had CPC gone the other way, they'd be standing here recommending against the work they'd done. And that, that's simply a matter of getting the people with the best knowledge in front of you, Council. That's interesting. Mr. Cope cannot, isn't able to, uh, He's able to do the sort of more run-of-the-mill land use items, but in terms of the kind of work that Ms. Hartley and Mr. Vaughan have done, that's expecting a bit too much from them. Well, Your Worship, I think what would really help Council is if we have a subcommittee and we have a Calgary Planning Commission and that discussion is made, then it would be very helpful in the report that's made to us get a sense of what was discussed in synopsis, what issues were sort of addressed through that discussion, and then why the decision and the recommendation or the refusal was made. And I think that would really inform a better discussion and might even streamline this process. And I, you know, with, I, think they, I think these guys gave an excellent report on the project that they were bringing forward, but I'm not convinced that that brought us CPCs issues and decision and the reasons for that. And I think that that would be unbelievably helpful. In, and I don't know whether that's a move forward statement or, or what. To the chair, if I might, the, the, the three members of the Planning Commission that are also common at this table, of course, are Alderman Lowell and Alderman Farrell and myself. Mm -hmm. Certainly in, in any of those cases, if you wish now, I, I suspect you're thinking of much more of a hard copy addition to the report or something and, and we could look at that I, I don't think uh, thank you I don't think it has to be a hard copy report and I mean I guess I can ask um, I can ask you three but you three are standing here now as members of this I mean Alderman Farrell and Alderman Lowe are sitting here as members of this council and not wearing their CPC hats at this point you are not wearing that hat and we have a secretary for CPC who's specifically tasked to that who it would be very helpful if we heard what CPC discussed what their discussion was and the reasons for their you know because these these are very nuanced issues point taken thank you thanks Alderman Carr Alderman Hodges 
Uh, Your Worship, I asked questions earlier. I have ideas for a motion, but I don't know at what point you want to accept a motion. We don't actually have a motion on the floor for the recommendations yet, Alderman Hodges. So are you going to be amending this motion or are you going to be doing something else fun and exciting? I, uh, I have ideas on amendments, but I ha have an idea that uh, there's more than just a, uh, the amendments I have in mind. And that's why I would like to propose referral back to the administration for some further consultation with the uh, players that we've uh, seen here today and heard from here today with the report back to council not later than April of 2011. I don't see any particular rush to, um, for this to be approved uh, today. I understand all of the arguments that uh, I haven't quite understood yet about uh, this speedier process. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Watson has said the department's improved its uh, processing of applications in the last year. I think that's uh, by and large true. And so I don't see a big rush to be doing something today in terms of an approval. All right, so then I'll take a motion to refer this to administration to return to council, did you yes. say? Yes. No later than? April 2011. No later than it's coming April. April, 3, April 2011. Do I have a seconder for that motion? To refer. Alderman Chabot. All right, we've got a motion to refer on the table uh, to refer this to administration to come directly back to council no later than April 2011. On the motion to refer, Alderman Lowe. Uh, Your Worship, I have oh, a Sorry, Alderman Rogers. I have a, a page of amendments, half a page of amendments that uh, I asked the uh, department to, to work on on Friday afternoon, not the two uh, staff members that are uh, at the podium. And I'd like, as part of the referral, to send these amendments along with the referral to them so they can contemplate uh, these changes and discuss them with the stakeholders that we've heard from today. Sure. I think, I think any member of council can send uh, their ideas and suggestions should the motion to refer be successful. Hmm. All right. So on the motion to refer, Alderman Lowe. Well, Your Worship. Council was quite anxious to have RC2 contextual put into the same stream, if you will, as RC1. And that, that, that's exactly what we've done here. We know that the RC1 view is in progress, I believe, and we're getting it back. And I'm, I guess I'm going to assume and look for a nod that if there's any glaring errors in that, they'd be applied to RC2 immediately. And I'm, I'm seeing concurrence with that. So the, the difficulty I have is, you know, the one person I had an opportunity to ask from the community if, in fact, they had any horror stories about the RC1, they didn't. So there's, there's, a, there's a history trail, as short as it is, of success. I think there's an avenue here to continue the success with the RC2. A year from now, we've asked for a, a report. We know that if there's a, a you know, a, a review of it. Uh, we know that if if there's big problems with the RC1, they'll be applied immediately to the RC2 and incorporated in that report. Meanwhile, I think it'd be more appropriate that as a, a motion arising, the requested amendments be put in so they can be considered uh, a year from now with the follow-up report. There's an imperative here for the industry to get on with it. And that was the genesis behind the whole thing. That was the genesis behind the RC1. So uh, it's, uh, I'm afraid what I'm hearing here a little bit is, you know, we're, we haven't quite thrown the baby out with the bathwater, but we've walked up to the door with them both in the tub. And uh, I, I think I would like to see us move ahead with what we have and thoughtfully make changes as we go and as we gain experience with this. And again, I'm, I'm, I hearken to what Alderman Pincott says, that a lot of this issue circulates around trees, not the other issues. Alderman Carra doesn't agree with me, but I think there's sufficient protection in what we're doing, particularly given since every application is circulated for information. So the communities have an opportunity to comment. Thank you, Your Worship. Oh, you can, you can always write a letter, Alderman Carra. On on the motion to refer, on the motion to refer, Alderman Marr. Thank you, Your Worship. I had, uh, I had actually drafted up a, a, another motion to refer, which is interesting, it was to come back to council, or not to come to council, but 
to committee. Um, I think the committee is where this work belongs rather than in council. Uh, I, will, I will vote against this referral to come directly here. I think it belongs at the, at the committee where we can have a discussion with the, uh, with the, the communities. I can't amend a referral. We can't amend a referral. Oh, can we amend a referral? We cannot. We can only as to time. Only as to time, Alderman Marr, not to as to whom. So I would, uh, I would request that members of council, if we are looking to refer, if we do want to have a meaningful dialogue with our communities, then let's do it instead of having it come directly back to us. Let's have it go through our normal process. Let's have it go to committee and then come to council through the right steps. Uh, vote against the referral and then I will put mine. Thank you. Your Worship, uh, in the interest of time, I will amend my motion to ask for it to go through Community Services Committee, but Second. nevertheless to be back at Council not later than April 2011. To, to which committee, Alderman Hodges? CPS. Not LPT? Uh, we're doing talking about urban forests. Well, I hear a plea to, to should go to CPS, so that's what I move. Well, you, you, you can't really do that, Alderman Hodges, so I think uh, what we should do, I was, I was about to let it go, but I think uh, Ms. Vaughan will uh, get mad at me if I do. So um, given that, I think what we'll do is we'll take the one on the floor to come back to Council. Should it fail, I'll recognize Alderman Marr or yourself to go again. Uh, on the motion to refer, Alderman Carr, on the motion to refer. Uh, before I start a major soliloquy, I'm just going to ask, uh, <laughs> should I wait until yes. this one fails? Yes. I will wait until this one. Second. <laughs> Alderman Carr, if you ever say, should I start the soliloquy or wait, the answer will always be the same. <laughs> Alderman Farrell on the motion to refer. All right, then. Um, so. On the motion to refer, oh, Alderman Chabot on the just, motion to refer. Just on a, a point of procedure, what is before us? Because the motion that I seconded, I don't believe is the motion that's before us now. Yes, it is. It's, it's, it's still the same, Alderman Chabot. Motion to refer this item to council, returning no later than April 2011. Thank you for that, Your Worship. Thank you. So on the motion to refer to administration to return to council no later than April 2011, are we agreed? Agreed. Opposed? Uh, we'll have to call the roll. Alderman Farrell? No. Alderman Hodges? Yes. Alderman Jones? Yes. Alderman Keating? No. Alderman Lowe? No. Alderman McLeod? No. Alderman Marr? No. Alderman Pincott? Yes. Alderman Poopmans? Yes. Alderman Stevenson? No. Alderman Carra? No. Alderman Chabot? Yes. Alderman collier No. Alderman DeMong? No. Mayor Nenshi? No. It's lost, Your Worship. Thank you. Alderman Hodges. Okay, Alderman Moore. Sorry. Sorry, I didn't hit my light, Your Worship. I apologize. Uh, Madam Clerk, I have a, uh, I believe we have something for the screen. Council, this is very, very similar to what um, Alderman Hodges and I were discussing a few moments ago with you, uh, uh, glasses. Um, now, again, it's to refer to SBC and Community Protective Services. Since we're talking about trees in context of communities, I was, uh, I thought that that was the appropriate committee. I'm, I'm prepared to, I'm prepared to, to you listen to your wisdom and move it to whatever community that you feel is the best one. But I wanted to make sure that we had the opportunity to speak to our communities, especially, and not being limited to the FCC, Alto Door Community Association, Winston Heights, Mount Pleasant. These are the ones that, that were most affected in terms of the sheer numbers. Uh, Ward 8 was represented here as 10% of the overall development permits in the area. I think that we owe it to our communities to be able to have a meaningful engagement with them to talk about this in consultation with the, uh, with the uh, administration and to return to 
I think it should go through council and return no later, or to council no later than April 11th. So I'd be looking for your guidance, Your Worship, as to how we want to be able to, since we haven't set our, our SBC and council agendas, then I think it should be able to hit the SBC first and then council no later than April. So I'd be looking for your guidance. Uh, I think the language you've got there will give you some flexibility to get to the SPC at some point before April, so long as it's on a council agenda in April, if that's your intent. That is my intent. I kind of, and, and you're, and again, you, you don't want to change it to LPT, huh? Your Worship, I'm prepared to uh, to stand by an amendment that, that uh, one of my colleagues was prepared to suggest. Um, I was preferring community protective services, given the fact that this was dealing a lot with urban forestry and things of that nature. Which well, is, as you know, we can't amend a referral motion, but if you were to say you meant LPT before you sit down. <laughs> yeah, okay, fine, fine. Uh, of course, I, through the slip of my pen, were meant to say land planning and transportation. All worship. right, so that should read SPC on land use planning and transportation. Do I have a seconder for this referral motion? Alderman Collier Cart, thank you. Um, okay, on the, oh wow, that's a lot of lights. On the referral motion, Alderman Carra. <clears throat> thank you, Your Worship. And now beginneth the soliloquy. <laughs> Five minutes. Five no. minutes. Um, Honestly, no. What I want to do is I want to ask, as we debate this, I want all of my council colleagues to seriously consider what this referral means, because I'm sort of up in the air as to whether we refer this or not, because I don't know what we're sending back and what we're getting to. And with that statement and that request to my council colleagues, I'd like to just make a couple of points to this issue in general. Um, I think we all agree that we need a streamlined process. You know, we need a streamlined process uh, for industry. Uh, we need to support the competitiveness of inner city redevelopment and inner city growth as opposed uh, with, with regards to greenfield growth. That, that is without question. Um, but you know what we also have to support? We have to support uh, the streamlined process in terms of council's time. And even more importantly than that, we have to support a streamlined process with regards to volunteer time. Because the sort of the, Alderman Pincott made the suggestion that communities want more and more engagement. And I think that we can equivocate that with the idea that community volunteers want to put in more and more volunteer time. And as a, a, a community volunteer myself, I can assure you that I personally don't volunteer because I want to put in more and more of my personal time. I volunteered because I was passionate about issues that mattered to me, that mattered to my community, and I ended up putting in as much time as I needed to, and a lot of times that was in the context of a situation where I would have preferred a much streamlined, a much more streamlined volunteer process, and I'm seeing some nods from the volunteers in the audience. Um, the other thing that I sort of want to speak to here goes to the public process. And the reality is when you're a community volunteer peddling influence, trying to support something that you're passionate about against a machine that's set up to maybe not hear it or maybe not do it, you will always say, yeah, it was a great public process and or it's a great public process but, and I'm not always sure it's always a great public process. I know that they have to say that if they want to get anywhere, but I'm not sure that they're always engaged in a great public process that really listens to what they're saying. Now, we heard some great uh, presentations today from community volunteers who obviously deeply care about their community and have amazing things to offer. And I mean, I think the tree <coughs> thing, let's not, let's not consider, the tree thing is not the issue here. The tree thing, is one point that is brought forward by some very caring and very plugged in and very innovative community volunteers. But it's really about how do we streamline a process to develop the kinds of communities we want to develop and make the development of those communities competitive with further and further sprawl. Uh, and I, I apologize for using that term. Um, I mean, we, we heard some great Montgomery made some great points. Ramsey made some great points. It's about community character. It's about establishing your community brand. 
And that gets me to my final point, which is that we have a one-size-fits-all approach that's being very expertly applied, but it's a one-size-fits-all approach that doesn't fit the multiple things that we can't take a one-size-fits-all approach to. We're trying to take a one-size, we can't take different communities are different, different areas within each community, neighborhoods are different. Different community associations, what they bring to the table, where their expertise lies, where the volunteers have passion and skill, and the competency of those, those volunteers to bring their message forward is, is totally different. And we heard from some very conscientious industry players here, but not all industry players are that conscientious. Right? And, so, and then on top of that, so I, I question what a referral is going to do here because I think what we're talking about is a fundamentally different approach. And so I would love it when you guys make your statements and ask your questions to ponder that and help me work that out as to whether I support this referral, which is, which is essentially the opposite of streamlining our approach to streamlining the city's approach, or whether we, uh, whether we vote this down or whether we support it. But all of it, we understand we have to do things differently. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Cry. I was about to warn you that you were getting away from the referral motion, but you brought it back right at the end there. Alderman Farrell on the motion to refer. Thank you. Can I ask a question while that's on the floor? Um, thank you. The improved quality we saw from Montgomery, some pretty um, pointed examples of improved quality over the years. And I'm I'm wondering if you believe that that was the development permit process that, or, or simply a change in how infills are being built. It's my understanding that the quality of infill design has improved dramatically over the last decade. Alderman Farrell, I'll allow that yes. question, but really motion to refer at this point. It that is. I had like my main, light on before like Alderman Mar put yes, but his the light on, and it was to ask questions about the item itself. He, he asked that I recognize him as soon as the vote ended, so I did. So yes. we'll allow this one, Alderman Farrell, but these are really main motion items. It is. Um, it, it will determine whether I vote on the referral or not. Okay. But okay, I will ask this one question. I do have several others, but. Your Worship, uh, the examples that were shown are very interesting because they actually showed a lot of that history about infill development that's happened over the years. The first examples, the really for lack of a better word, ugly horrifying. houses. Yeah. <laughs> horrifying, yeah. Mm. Those homes were built prior to 1988 when we needed a development permit to build an infill. I'm here saying no. And in 1989, we then implemented the, first it was the narrow lot infill development guidelines, and then in 1994, we had the infill housing guidelines that we're familiar with now, or the residential infill housing guidelines. Uh, so in one, way, in one respect, the rules and the policies have changed because the houses that you first were shown and then the ones that you were later shown, the vinyl siding ones, one was built under the infill guidelines, the other ones were not. You notice the latter uh, houses were much more re respectful to setback. It was more a quality of design issue that came in. And I think that uh, it, it's hard to give an equatable number to that because so much has changed. But yes, materials change every, every few years. We're now still seeing acrylic stucco. In the 80s, we saw cedar. In the 50s, we saw stucco that had glass in it and then we saw brick. So there, there's a lot of different things that have gone on here. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'm reluctant to support the referral, but I think it might be worthwhile. I, I would like to see these contextual rules applied to SEMI. I think we have been talking, I mean, we just came out of budget discussion where we talked about doing things differently and streamlining the process, and here we have an opportunity to do just that. Um, I do believe that we are seeing improved quality simply because infill is becoming a more standard form. And we want to have it as easy as we move into the planet discussions to develop in the inner city as it is to develop greenfield. And in fact, the opposite is, is true. Um, it's very interesting. I come from a community association background and I was uh, hired by Hillhurst Sunnyside to be their, their advocate, planning advocate. And we um, started out by wanting to preserve the historical context of Hillhurst Sunnyside, another old community with lots of historical buildings. Um, and in our distorted view at the time, we, uh, we thought Victorian 
was what we, so we want, we got a lot of, and encouraged a lot of gingerbread and things. We realized after that, that, that it had nothing to do with Hillhorse Sunny side. There's nothing Victorian about the community. And in fact, um, it was just a style that we liked at the time and um, maybe less so as the years went by. Now the community is welcoming contemporary design, some really unusual things, some things that are fairly quirky and some flat roofs. And in this historical community, it uh, it, it looks kind of neat because it's just an interesting mix of a community that develops over time and reflects the era of those particular developments. Um, I think the question of trees is a really important one. And I, I um, that's what is encouraging me to support the the referral, is because of that, the urban canopy, I, I um, it is so, vitally important to health of this community and also to the economy of these communities. And surely there's got to be a way to encourage that within our process. Um, and maybe it needs to be something that is encouraged citywide. And, and if, if we don't want to isolate it, that, that would be my reason. And then if there's a way to encourage quality. But what is quality? Um, I think we want to allow some creative uses of different materials because as we heard materials change and styles change and I don't want to be a taste sheriff either um, but as far as April is concerned I think it's a reasonable delay um, but I, I fully expect that we see some contextual rules in April. Thanks very much Alderman Farrell. Alderman Lowe on the motion to refer. Very briefly Your Worship my comments from the last referral are equally applicable to this referral and uh, while I appreciate Alderman Farrell's comments uh, I'd ask her to think hard and first about her first thought, which was we need a streamlined process mm -hmm. if we're going to keep this going. And what I see here happening here is exactly the opposite. So please uh, say no to the referral and we can get on with it. The stop gaps are in place, the process is in place, the innovation is in place, everything we want's in place, just a little will to do it. Hmm. Alderman Hodges on the motion to refer. Worship, uh, there's been a lot of uh, good comment today from um, all of the uh, stakeholders, and I don't see any problem in the referral because the idea is that those uh, comments that weren't before us when the agenda was sent to us are now before us. And I think, um, picking up on one of Alderman Farrell's comments, if we want to move forward generally and redevelop in the inner city, somebody has got to start listening to the people who live in the inner city. Otherwise, you're going to have a continuous issue of argument, uh, Your Worship, time and time and time again. When you have a community that's 40% RC2, this is a very important issue. This is not about something happening in Cougar Ridge or something happening in Southwest Calgary or something happening in Midnapur. In Montgomery, it's the single family houses that are mo mostly in the RC2 are surrounded by other RC2 properties. and. De redevelopment standards are improving, but there's no downside in a referral that comes back to Council in April 2011. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Hodges. On the motion to refer, Alderman Pincott. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm a couple of things in the referral. It doesn't actually go to administration. It just goes straight to committee. So there is no administration component to the referral. It just is referring what is before us to committee to hear from committee again. It's also directing, not directing, that you will be there. So just want to point that out, uh, that the, the consultation in the referral is happening at the committee level. So uh, I just want people to be clear on, on what the referral is is saying here. Uh, it's not asking administration to go out and do more. It's saying that the further consultation will be at the committee. Uh, the second piece that I'm challenged with is, uh, I'm not sure about this, but there is no Altador Community Association. So, uh, no, there isn't. Uh, so I just, uh, as part of that, I just, uh, I just point that out, that there is no, so Altador Community Association, please don't show up. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, so I just want to be clear that the referral is just sending this to committee and for us to hear members of the public at committee. 
Alderman Marr will address that in his close on the motion to refer Alderman Stevenson. <clears throat> well, that's, that was my point. I, I'm, I agree with that the LPT uh, is the place rather than CPS, but I just, I'm really confused as to how an SPC can do consultation. I mean, the only thing the SPC can do is exactly the same as what we did here. Anybody wants to come, come here. And I, maybe this means that, um, that Alderman Chabot as chairman has to go out and start consulting with all these people. I don't know. I, Second. I, I think it, it's confusing to me why we would do it this way. So thank you. Much as I love the thought of an Alderman Chabot road show, um, <laughs> Alderman Putman's on the motion to refer. Um, thank you, Your Worship. I was hoping this might be a brief sonnet, but I think it might go a little further. Um, I'm under, I, I assume that when we referred to SPC, we would have the opportunity to engage with administration for support. I'm not sure if that's a reality or not. Mm -hmm. Perhaps that's a question. Um, secondly, I'm going to ref support the motion to refer because I have a fond hope that there might be a middle ground between the interests of the community associations and their need to preserve the community as so well put by a number of community associations this afternoon and the needs which I think are imperative to streamline the process. Is there a magical common ground that we could find? Have we completely exhausted the process in seeking that ground? And is it appropriate to wait a few more months to find that common ground? And I guess in my judgment, it is worth waiting a few more months to seek that magical place. Thank you. You make it so easy, Alderman Putmans. <laughs> um, thank you. Alderman Hodges, you've spoken on this already, but your light is on. I think we all know what the motion means, in spite of the literal reading of each word. That isn't going to lead us anywhere either, the literal reading of each word. That is leading us down the garden path. Um, thanks, uh, Alderman Hodges. Anyone else before I call Alderman Marr to close on the motion to refer? Alderman Marr to close. Thank you, Your Worship. Well, I just assume that uh, we would be able to interpret or get an interpretation from administration. What do you think this means, Mr. Watson? Do you, do you think that this means that... You're closing, that it's too late. This is still a... Uh, well, I'm, 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 I'm speaking widely and openly. I don't think that any of us around the table, with the exception of maybe uh, Alderman Pincott, thinks that, that we want Alderman, uh, Alderman, Alderman Chabot to do any kind of consultation at all. Um, obviously, the intent of is is that we want to be able to hear from our communities. Alderman Lowe and Alderman Farrell were able to do that at the CPC. We were looking now to hear from our communities. We went through this election process where we all, or I think all of us, campaigned on greater transparency, more involvement, greater advocacy for our communities. If I look at my, uh, my little chart here, um, South Calgary, and you're right, South Calgary and Altador is one and the same in terms of the uh, in terms of the community associations, but here it, it shows a, a massive difference in terms of how many of these permits are being brought forth into these, these communities. If I look at just my portion, just in Ward 8, it's 16% of the applications just in 2009. That's a huge amount. What I would like to do is honour the fact that we have community representatives here that have volunteered basically their entire day to come and hear and speak to us about this issue. I think they deserve an opportunity to be heard in a fulsome way where we can have their opportunity to, to discuss all of these with the industry, with administration, and the communities at a committee rather than just having a, a, a brief public hearing and they get five minutes. I don't think that that's real community consultation. So that's my close. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Marr. So on the motion that you see on the screen to refer this item to LPT to return to council through LPT no later than April 2011, are we agreed? Any opposed? Call the roll, please. Alderman Pincott? Yes. Alderman Putmans? Yes. Alderman Stevenson? No. Alderman Carra? Yes. Alderman Chabot? Yes. Alderman collier -Cost? No. Alderman DeMond? Yes. Alderman Farrell? 
Alderman Hodges? Yes. Alderman Jones? No. Alderman Keating? Yes. Alderman Lowe? No. Alderman McLeod? No. Alderman Marr? Yes. Mayor Nenshi? No. That's carried, Your Worship. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, do you want to do your motion arising, Alderman Pinkot? Isn't it kind of moot now? Oh, yeah, I don't think you can do it now because it was referred. All right, I'll allow it. Thank you, Worship. I have a motion arising out of this last item, uh, and I have emailed it to clerks. A great de a degree of what we, uh, we heard from the communities was around trees. Uh, and uh, so I have a, a motion arising to, uh, that's up on the screen now, to, uh, to actually have a look at trees. We can't, we can't address uh, trees in just one that uh, are not appropriate, then we don't go down the path of having, of going out and, and engaging. So this is, is very clearly uh, written to be in two parts, uh, to, to have a look at both our public and private. At the end of the day, we may hear that this could inform the land use bylaw. This could inform some of the very things that we heard about today. Uh, so I hope that you will support this motion to, uh, to do some work, to look at our options, bring those options back to us, uh, and then should uh, there be an option that we like, we can do some further consultation on it by, by the end of next year. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Pinkott. Do you have a seconder? Alderman McLeod, thank you. And just FYI, Alderman Pinkott, you found a great reason to add yet another page to the procedural bylaw because there is a uh, not de defined term in here. But that's okay. I'm going to allow it. So on the motion arising, on the motion arising, Anyone? Alderman Carra? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I totally... I but I couldn't. <laughs> I missed that. Alderman Stevens. <laughs> he said vote quick. Okay. <laughs> I, I guess I, I, just being a new alderman and understanding sort of the budgetary considerations that we're in right now and just asking administration to come up and do this work. I just, I just like a, a sense from administration about where they are in terms of their workload and what this does and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, well, through the chair, Alderman McCraw, because we're talking of the urban forest, which is really the urban forest, uh, forestry part, which is actually Dr. Hargis Farmer's area, which I would think would probably take certainly some of the lead in this. Uh, certainly will be additional work. Of course, the last motion may, the referral is going to be additional work. So, I mean, that's what you have an administration for is to do work. I doubt if this is going to uh, break the bank, as it were, but it is going to take some more work, given that we're coming back uh, May. I mean, depending on what is council decides, we could be coming back by the end of the year. Certainly, when we come back in May, we can certainly discuss whether this is going to be a make it or break it thing but absolutely I mean that this is the challenge that council legitimately does all through the course of the year is comes up with good ideas and adds more work on top of the existing work program okay thanks mr. Watson Alderman cry answer your question yes Alderman Marr your worship um, I hate to be difficult. I really do. Uh, you're right. That's true. I don't. Oh, um, Mar, let's let's be honest. The, here. Well, should we be honest? Uh, my question now is that if we're going to refer this back, should this not go back as a one bundle to the one that we just referred? I understand, which is exactly why I wanted to refer it to CPS in the first place. But um, I think that this one starts to go into a slippery slope if we if we don't bundle it with the with the report that just left can I if on I the LPT train if I may put words in Alderman Pincott's mouth because I'm good at that I think Alderman Pincott's point in bringing this motion is precisely what you're saying is this is not about semi-detached dwellings mm -hmm. this is a much bigger issue and he deliberately is attempting to separate it from the other issues on semi-detached dwellings fair Alderman Pincott okay well 
<sighs> it's a great tree canopy debate that's never occurred yet. The great tree canopy debate. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank it you will be a fulsome discussion or a toothsome discussion. Yes. Well, it sure won't be toothsome. Uh, Alderman McLeod. Thank you. Um, I think we've heard significant issues raised around the, um, and I understand it's called a tree canopy. It used to be just trees to me. Um, but, but I think if we can um, raise these issues between uh, community and protective services and planning, then we actually elevate the conversation and create a bridge, and I think there's some advantages to doing that. Thanks, Alderman McLeod. Uh, anyone else before I call Alderman Pincott to close? Alderman Pincott. Closed. On the motion that you see on the screen then, are we agreed? agreed. Opposed? All right, carried. Last item in this section then, item 8.1, Brentwood Station Area Redevelopment Plan, Land Use Redesignation Deferral Request. Flipping to it now. Uh, are you moving it, Alderman Farrell? Second. Yes. Alderman Marr seconding. Alderman Farrell, do you want to say anything about it? No. Just, I think we just need a little bit more time. Isn't that the case? Yes, uh, I think that's you. right, right, Mr. Watson. Uh, so then we have a motion to uh, defer this and it return to council, I think, no later than 2011 June. All right, so Alderman Hodges on this uh, deferral request? Uh, yes, Your Worship, I have no problem with it because we don't have these uh, bylaws uh, in front of us today in any case. It's a request for deferral. But to the chair, again, Mr. Watson, a humble plea. Could somebody engage the ward alderman? Though it says Brentwood, it will involve the art of uh, varsity on the south side of Crow Chow Trail. That's me. Okay. Still. The only time I hear about this, these things are by rumor. I heard this was coming on as a rumor in October. It's good to, it's good to have rumors, but it's better to, have, to, to be communicated with. <laughs> Uh, I think that uh, you have been heard loud and clear, Alderman Hodges. Yes, Mr. Watson? All right. Uh, on Anyone else? On the motion to defer then, are we agreed? Any opposed? Very well. That ends the public hearing portion of this meeting. Thank you all. And we'll go into the regular portion of the meeting. Oh, uh, no, we don't. <laughs> we close each individual item. They're, they're gone already, Alderman Mark. Um, all right, as we play a little musical chairs here. Uh, um, as we do that, Your Worship, I wonder if I could beg your indulgence to uh, on the agenda. Um, absolutely. Why don't we do that now? Okay. Uh, Your Worship, I uh, sent you a note up. I've got a must 10 meeting here at uh, 7 o'clock, so I'd like to uh, table items 8 1, 10 1 1. 8 1 eight one's done already. 8 1's done already, sorry. 10 1 and uh, 10 1 2. And, uh, then to uh, bring forward and deal with uh, 10.2 and 10.22 and 10.23 uh, as there are bylaws attached to them and we can get that done before supper while I'm here. Okay, so um, the motion then is to table items 10.1.1, 10.1.2 and 10.2.1, Alderman Lowe? No, we can do all three if I know. Okay. So 10.1.1 and 10.1.2 until after we consider 10.2.3. In other words, we're just moving the um, finance and corporate services forward. Do I have a seconder? Thanks, Alderman collier -Cart. Any discussion on this? Mo oh, no motions to table or non-debatable. So on this motion to table, uh, are we agreed? Any opposed? Too late. Um, okay, so that takes us then to item 9.1. Uh, the council calendar, Alderman Jones. Your Worship, uh, on... Uh, yeah, we need everyone here for this one, for 9.1, you mean. All right, so we'll just talk slowly until Alderman Poopman's there. He is. Alderman Jones. 
Your Worship, no, thank you for noticing. I didn't notice. Your Worship, on the calendar, I'd like to move the table until December the 13th meeting of council so that the procedure bylaw subcommittee can meet this Friday so that it be talked about then and then be brought forward next Monday. Thanks, Alderman Jones. Alderman Stevenson seconding. And I, and I do think that was the, the purpose of not approving this in the first place. So we've got another motion to table then. Motion to table item 9.1, the 2011 council calendar to December 13th. Again, a non-debatable motion. So on this one, are we agreed? Agreed. Sorry? Uh, I have another item that would, if we're tabling, that would like to, I'd like to have looked at at the same time for, uh, is it on today's agenda? It, no, it is, it is on the calendar. We ha uh, there is another conflict that I would, if we're tabling, I would like to just send, yeah, bring it, bring it forward to the procedure subcommittee, um, drop, drop a note to Alderman Jones and I'm sure they'll consider it. Okay. Thank, thank you. Okay, so sorry, we were in the middle of voting when you did that, Alderman Pinkott, but that's all right. Um, so on the motion to table, are we agreed? Any opposed? Very well then. So we are now at 10.2.1. Uh, Alderman Lowe. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I'll move uh, the recommendations of all the Finance and Corporate Services reports, and I would uh, ask, to ask you to call the uh, associated bylaws with uh, 10.2 and 10.3. You're moving them all simultaneously? That's the way we do it. All right, then. Do I have a seconder? Uh, Alderman collier Cart, thank you. Uh, any discussion on any of these? So Alderman, uh, Alderman Lowe has moved 10.2.1, 10.2.2, and the recommendations in 10.2.3 all together. So any discussion? Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. Well, respectfully, if we can actually call them by the actual report numbers, that might help me in assessing what it is that I'm voting on. Happy to do that. So it's FCS 2010-21. Uh, this is the first one we're dealing with, Your That's Worship? That's the first one, 23 okay. and 24. Okay, so on, on FCS 2010-21, Your Worship, if you could uh, call the recommendations separately. I, um, I'm not necessarily supportive of some of the adjustments that are being proposed in here, so... Or Happy something. to do so, Alderman Chabot. Is there anything you want to say about that? We've uh, we've kind of spent the last uh, week or so debating some of these uh, things that are being proposed in here. So I, I'm not going to debate them further, Your Worship. I'm just uh, would like to be on record as not being supportive of some of these recommendations. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Um, thank you, Alderman Marr, on this motion. Okay, no problem. Um, I think anyone else on these three recommendations? So I'm going to, well, three reports. So I'm going to call them separately. Okay. So Alderman Lowe, did you want to close? I'll close on them individually, Your Worship, on the FNCS 2010-21 closed. Okay. So then, on FCS 2010-21, administration recommendation number one, receive for information attachment one, are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? Very well. On recommendation number two, receive for information attachment two, are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? On recommendation number three, approve a one-time draw from the FSR if necessary to mitigate an overall city tax supported unfavorable variance, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Two. Alderman Chabot and Alderman Marr are opposed. Number four. Approve the 2010-2011 capital budget adjustments as identified in attachment three. Are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? Alderman Chabot. And number five. Receive for information attachment four, the summary of the operating and capital budget Adjustments previously approved by Council or approved by Administration for the period April 1 to September 30th, 2010. Are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Alderman Chabot is opposed. All right. Um, Alderman Lowe on the second report then. It's closed, for, uh, Your Worship, if you'll give three readings to Bylaw 58M 2010. Thank you. All right. So then first, on the recommend, this is about the changes to the boundary of the Inglewood BRZ. 
On the administration recommendations, are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? First reading of the bylaw then. First reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? We, we should be have to call this before second reading. Oh, before second reading. I'm sorry. I thought you said after second reading. I apologize. For this particular one, um, because of the business revitalization zone regulation, before we get to second reading, we do have to ask if there are any taxpayers in the zone and people who would be taxpayers under the change in boundaries who wish to speak to Council today. Anyone? I apologize, Your Worship. I was supposed to bring that to your attention. No, Mr. Tully did too, but I misheard him. I thought it was before third reading. Is there anyone who would like to speak to this who fits those categories? Very well. In that case, on second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? agreed. Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Very well then, carried. And the final report, Alderman Lowe? Uh, closed, Your Worship, and I'd ask for three readings of proposed bylaw 1M-2011. Thank you. So on the administration recommendation then that we uh, give three readings to the proposed business tax bylaw, are we agreed? agreed? Any opposed? Carried. On first reading then, are we agreed? On second reading, are we agreed? Authorization for third reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? And third reading, are we agreed? Very well. Thank you. Carried. So we will move back. Oh, Alderman Lowe? I was just going to uh, lift from the table the tabled items and bring them forward and deal with them. Thank you. I don't even think we need a motion on that because we said we'd do it right after we considered this one. So, um, Very well then, we're flipping back to the CP and S reports. There we are. So, strategies and options for Southeast Recreation Opportunities, report CPS 2010-55. Yeah, it is a deferral request. Alderman Marr, are you moving that? Your Worship, I will uh, happily move all of the recommendations from uh, Community Protective Services from the committee. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Thank you, Alderman Keating. Uh, any discussion on either of these reports? All right, Alderman Marr, you want to close? Closed on all, Your Worship. Thank you. Then on the recommendations in CPS 2010-55, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. And there we are, 56. I'm sorry, I just was missing the number there. On the recommendations in CP 2010-56, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. All right, then. Takes us to reports from LPT. Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh Happy to move the recommendations of uh, the committee, although I'm not necessarily supportive of all the recommendations. That's my own personal opinion, and therefore, as the chair, more than happy to move the recommendations of committee, but happy to introduce and close in on any and all items. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Do I have a seconder? Uh, Alderman Marr, thank you. Alderman Stevenson. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, at committee, I moved uh, some amendments in. I made a mistake on one. I don't know whether this can be done as a friendly one or not, but in uh, number uh, four, uh, it says including, uh, on the second page, it says including exploration of options three, four, and five. It should be, op it should be options three, four, and six, uh, because number six deals with community enhancement where Number five uh, deals with local improvement, so I just made a mistake. So it's just the wrong, wrong number in there. Can will, will you accept that as friendly, Alderman Chabot? Alderman Alderman Moore? Okay. okay. So well, that then should if, be three, four, and six then. Three, four, the and six. One. Yeah. And, uh, and if I can speak to it now, then um, uh, this this is something that takes me back um, quite a number of years. I've been working on the what I consider to be a major looming problem for this city with the uh, screening fences around communities and the inability of the communities to be able to um, keep them up and um, keep them looking consistent because uh, the way it's set right now, uh, one neighbor can let his fence fall down, the next one paints his pink and the guy after that paints it black. So uh, we're trying to come up with a solution 
in two forms. One is ongoing, in other words, what are we doing with the future development um, and future subdivisions, but also to try and help the communities on what they can do ex with the existing perimeter fences. And as you'll read in the report, there is uh, a couple of hundred kilometers of uh, these fences around the city. We're going to be running into more and more problems with them. So I have asked to have this referred back. That's what this motion is all about, so that we can try and um, come up with something. I was not happy with the way it was handled, and so that's why I made a motion at um, committee to refer it back, and then I will be working with the um, administration on it um, before it comes back the next time. Uh, so thank you, Your Worship. I encourage uh, my colleagues to, to support this. Thank you. I'm going to, in that case, uh, Alderman Stevenson, we're going to call them separately, if that's all right. And Alderman Chabot, your intent was to put all four of them on the table, yes? Okay. Uh, Alderman Carra, on these? Yeah, I just want to reiterate my uh, colleague, Alderman Stevenson's uh, sentiment that this is a looming problem. I think it's sort of almost a canary in the coal mine type situation. And, and uh, I look forward to the report on this committee, and I just want to uh, reach out to Alderman Stevenson to please keep me in the loop and allow me to uh, be of any support to you as you sort of lead this process forward. Thank you, Alderman Carra. Anyone else on any of the LPT items? That's 68, 62, um, 67, 71, 76, on any of them. All right, then, uh, Alderman Chabot to close. To close on 68, Your Worship, um, you'll probably notice that I didn't support this in committee. Part of the reason that I wasn't supportive of moving forward or, again, revisiting this whole um, perimeter fence issue um, or, and or screening fence issue is because administration had indicated that the majority of this fencing lies on, on private lands. And... Uh, so it would be somewhat problematic, but if, uh, if Alderman Stevenson believes that there's some value in uh, exploring this further and, and uh, initiating some additional work, uh, and he's willing to, uh, to uh, take the lead on that, uh, who am I to uh, begrudge him on taking on additional work? So I will be supporting it, Your Worship. Now, considering you'll be very busy with the road show, Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. All right, then. So uh, on the recommendations of the SPC on report LPT 2010-68, recommendation number one, direct administration to extend the revised screening face maintenance program to 2014, December 31st. Are we agreed? Any opposed? On recommendation two, approve roads capital program various street improvements as the source of a $100,000 annual limit for funding the city's portion of maintenance. Are we agreed? Any opposed? On recommendation three, receive private screening fence maintenance options for information purposes only. Are we agreed? Any opposed? All right, and on recommendation four, direct administration to reconvene the discussion group. Are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Farrell is opposed. Go to close on 65, please. I think this one's pretty straightforward, Your Worship. There wasn't, uh, I think, a need for further debate on this issue, so closed. Okay, so on the recommendation of the SPC that administration meet with the war ward alderman and then the community to discuss alternative measures to a traffic circle at Country Hills Boulevard and Royal Birch Boulevard Northwest, are we agreed? Yeah. Any opposed? The people following along at home, Alderman Collier <laughs> Cart. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Hey, we crashed the website last week, as you know. On number 62, Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. Well, there was a number of recommendations made by committee. It was identified um, on the status of outstanding motions that, that these were not, um, could not be amended by the committee and therefore had to be forwarded on to council for council to further ratify. So the recommendations that are before us from the committee essentially will look at making some of those changes. Uh, 
So, members of council, if you want to debate this further uh, beyond what we've discussed in committee, I'd be more than happy to address these issues uh, as they come forward. But uh, on the basis of the fact that we had significant discussion on these issues, uh, I would uh, encourage council to, to further support the recommendations of the committee. Thank you. I'm going to say that that was not your close because Alderman Hodges' light is on. Uh, just uh, briefly, Worship, uh, in the interest of time, there's 12 or 15 reports coming in on December 15th. So mm -hmm. the brief, my brief question as it was at committee, have we still got the 15, maybe the clerks are looking a little startled, uh, are the 15 reports coming in to LPT still in the pipeline for December 15th? Uh, that's a good answer. The, the whole uh, I was just going to turn to the chair. And the answer whole is idea no. yours to, is to split them up a bit. There's some that don't need to be there, I don't think, on December 15th. Some are status reports. Others are more important reports. But there's a whole group here that were due otherwise, due, going to be due December 15th. And it also looks like the effect of this motion would be to move at least three of them off of that date. So, All right, then. Any further discussion on this one? So then, on the SPC recommendation, which is to change a bunch of dates for things that are coming back to the LPT, are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? All right, then. Number 67, Alderman Chabot. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Now, oh, I think I skipped number six. I'm sorry, Alderman. Number 66. Oh, yes. Sorry for that. Um, well, I, uh, I'll just open with the... Uh, uh, with the, um, I guess, congratulate the administration on coming forward with so solutions whereby there, we don't need to have a whole bunch of throwaway infrastructure and uh, leave it open to the floor for further debate. And if, uh, not, if I don't need to, happy to close on it as is. Anyone else? On recommendation number 66, then, that we approve the administration recommendation. This is the one about Calgary Transit fare payment options. So on that recommendation, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Hodges is opposed. All right, uh, number 67. Oh, Alderman Keating and Stevenson. Sorry, I, I missed your lights there. So on 67 to open, Alderman Chabot. Yes, thank you for allowing me that, Your Worship, because uh, I think in this particular instance that the recommendations are somewhat misleading in regards to the outcome of the vote and I will be uh, asking administration to look at the vote record specifically on this issue when it comes back to committee uh, for the uh, approval of the minutes because uh, my recollection of the, the motions as they were placed were that um, I had moved or I had voted against the amendment as opposed to uh, voting in favor of this recommendation. It, the, the way it reads on the roll call for the vote, it says that I voted for this and then everyone vote, voted against, it was against the amendment and then subsequently it was further amended and this is the motion that is before us now, is the three recommendations from committee. Um, now having said that, Your Worship, I, uh, I'm not necessarily supportive of the direction that the committee has uh, put forward and so I personally will be voting against it, although I'm still putting forward the recommendations of the committee. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Alderman Stevenson. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Worship. Um, as you know, uh, a number of us were in Edmonton for the uh, AUMA conference, and I, I chaired um, a meeting with the Minister of Transportation addressing the crowd, uh, Luc Ouellette. And so uh, at one point, uh, and I know that um, Alderman DeMong and um, Alderman Keating were there in this particular meeting, and I asked um, the Minister of Transportation about the turnover of uh, Deerfoot Trail and what the, what the plan was. And I know that our administration has been talking with their administration, but I want to make it clear what he said, because there was a big crowd, likely 150 people or so there. And he said that in any case where um, a ring road is built around a community, then they turn back the, the the old road, and he said uh, they, there'd be nothing done until at the time that the uh, ring road was completed down to Deerfoot at the south, which is which is what this report says. But then he went on to say that um, that they always um, 
uh, sign an agreement to look after the road for 17 years after it's taken over and uh, that um, everything would be at their cost, including upgrading and um, maintenance and everything uh, up for 17 years, right? Now, if uh, I know Alderman Keating's got his light on here, if if anybody, if he or, uh, or Alderman DeMong understood it different, I think he was very clear about that, that it, that it was a 17-year um, agreement. So I just wanted to throw that in there because it uh, it looks as though we're saying here that, that we don't want to resume the responsibility. I don't think we're going to have any choice about taking it over at some point, but if they will uh, continue with the upgrades and do whatever is necessary so that at the end of the 17 years that the road is right up to what it should be, then I don't think it's going to be as much of a problem. So thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Alderman Stevenson. Alderman Keating. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I do follow along those lines and I, I concur that that was the discussion. Um, during this committee meeting, it seemed to say that uh, we will not talk about the fact that the Deerfoot will be part of Calgary. At, at that time, I, I wasn't quite exactly sure which way we were going, but I did vote against it, even though I, I strongly believe that the city of Calgary uh, has to begin, that eventually it will be ours, uh, regardless of whether we say it will not be or not. Uh, and I would like the uh, sort of get the mind shift that we start working on the inherent problems with the Deerfoot and fix them before it is ours. Yep. Thanks, Alderman Keating. Alderman Collier Cart. Well, just to emphasize, uh, this is the reason why Alderman Lowe and I brought this notice and motion forward together last year. Uh, we were concerned about a lot of the issues that we were hearing with regards to this. It was very, very clear at our committee that members of committee uh, are just not, uh, we want to clearly convey your worship and have you convey on our behalf that we're not interested in assuming responsibility for the Deerfoot at this time. And we don't want that process to be accelerated and cast upon us. Uh, sooner than uh, they think it can happen. So I hope members of council will support the recommendations before us. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Collier Carton. I did, in fact, make it clear at my first meeting with the Premier that this was an office warming presence I did not want. Uh, um, there is you. one I do want. Uh, anyone else on this item on number 67? Alderman Chabot to close. Thank you, Your Worship. And, uh, and I do appreciate the comments from some of my colleagues, specifically in regards to their discussion with the minister, um, my discussions were somewhat varied um, in regards to uh, the way I understood how the transfer was going to occur. And my understanding was that uh, typically the province does continue to operate to uh, provide, I thought it was 15 years, so again, there's a two year variance there um, in operations, maintenance, and repair, not necessarily for upgrades. And as identified in this report, there's uh, somewhere in the range of around $700 million worth of upgrades that will be required uh, over time to accommodate the uh, transit uh, or the, uh, the safety and, uh, and efficiency audit that was initiated by myself and Alderman Collie Urquhart some time ago. Um, so in light of that, uh, I don't think necessarily that we can say no to passing it or to re-accepting the responsibility of it from the province. Um, so I would ask that at the very least, Your Worship, they call recommendation number two separately because I'm not prepared to support it in its current form. Happy to do so. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. So then, on LPT 201067, relating to the potential transfer of Deerfoot Trail to the City of Calgary, recommendation number one to receive the report for information, are we agreed? Any opposed? Recommendation number two, direct administration to clearly convey to the province the City of Calgary is not prepared to resume responsibility for Deerfoot Trail, are we agreed? agreed? Any opposed? Call the roll, please. Alderman Chabot? No. Alderman collier -Cost? Yes. Alderman DeMong? No. Alderman Farrell? Yes. Alderman Hodges? Yes. Alderman Jones? Yes. Alderman Keating? No. Alderman Lowe? Yes. Alderman McLeod? Yes. Alderman Marr? Yes. Alderman Pincott? Yes. Alderman Putmans? Yes. Alderman Stevenson? No. Alderman Carra? Yes. Mayor Nenshi? No. It's carried, Your Worship. 
Thank you. Uh, on recommendation number three, continue discussions with the province on the basis of recommendations one and two. Are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Chabot is opposed. All right, then. Uh, that takes us now to number 71, I believe. Independent review of the land use bylaw and related processes. Alderman Chabot to open. I'll just open it to the floor, Your Worship, and address any issues that are identified in my close. Very well. Anyone have any comments on this one? Alderman Chabot, to close. Close, Your Worship. Thank you. On the recommendation in LPT 201071, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Hodges is opposed. All right, carried. Thank you, Alderman Chabot. We now go to the reports from the Audit Committee. Alderman Pincott. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to move the committee recommendations of AC 2010-73 and AC 2010-79. Thank you. Uh, Alderman McLeod is seconding. Uh, any discussion of these? Do you want to open them separately, Alderman Pincott, or? Opened and closed. <laughs> I, might, I might have waited just a second to see if uh, anyone else had anything. All right, closed. On the recommendations then on <laughs> getting close to supper, Alderman Pincott. <laughs> On the recommendations in 2010-73, the functional analysis of the City Auditor's Office, uh, are we agreed with the recommendations of the Audit Committee? Any opposed? Alderman Chabot is opposed. And on number 79, Real Estate Portfolio Audit, are we agreed on the recommendations of the Audit Committee? Any opposed? Very well then, carried. Never let it be said that we can't whip through stuff when we want to. This now takes us to items directly to Council. We'll start with 11.1, .1, Notices of Motion, 11.1.1, Report 44, Council Report Templates. Alderman Marr. To it. Unfortunately, this my electronic agenda is not working very well. I've got to scroll right down. Uh -huh. Well, do you want to come back after? No. Are you okay? Very well. Hang on. It takes a second. I've got to. Do you have a hard copy? It's not my fault. Thank you. Um, Your Worship, uh, I'll just introduce this briefly. We have had a, a, uh, a template that has been given to us by our administration that we've been using for the last several years. It's been brought to my attention that we used to, as a, uh, as a municipality, have a variety of different reports which included significantly different and more information. In my research and the work that my staff has done, we have been able to ascertain that there is a variety of different parts of information that, that, that I would like to see in our reports, which would include uh, a more varied and reasoned discussion that would allow us to have multiple scenarios where alternatives would exist, which if we were doing a major capital project, I would like us to be able to have an opportunity where we get all the information that, that uh, administration has weighed through. Normally, when we have a recommendation, it's just the recommendation from administration. I'd like to be able to see what other options were out there. Cost implications, uh, operating and capital op uh, cost implications, public consultation, if it, if it was done, we should be able to understand what our communities were saying how the administration went forth and, uh, and did a, a community consultation. The funding sources, these are things that, some of the ones that are existing in our reports, but I'd like to see justification for recommendation, variety of other major, major uh, issues uh, that are not currently on our template. Now, what I've been discussing with Mr. Tobert was the creation of a report where the administration, we would select a report and it would be compared with the new template. So council would have an opportunity to see two versions, one as is, or what we were normally doing, and a second report, which would detail much more fully some of the objectives that I've outlined here. So your worship, uh, I hope that that uh, explains what the intent of it is. I know that uh, in my discussions 
with the administration. They have a better understanding and better of idea of what I'm trying to achieve here. Better information, especially when we're talking about major capital projects like the Southeast LRT, like the 96th Street underpass and, and others. So uh, I hope Council will support me on this and I look forward to the discussion. Uh, do we have a seconder for Alderman Mars notice? Uh, Alderman Keating, thank you. Uh, Alderman Chabot. Hey, thank you, Your Worship. Um, well, I almost hate to do this, but I, unfortunately, being as it's before us, I have no alternative but to, to uh, pick at this a little bit, if you'll permit me, Your Worship. Um, in regards to previous council direction, um, in cases whereby I find that the material is insufficient to properly assess the, the recommendations of, of the committee or council, um, and so far as looking up previous council direction, I, I have staff for that. This, this motion essentially offloads the obligation that I think I have to, I, I guess, do my due diligence. So I, I can't support that. Background, that kind of falls in with the previous one, whereby I get my staff to gather as much background information as I can, where I find that the reports are maybe not as sufficient as they should be. Triple bottom line analysis, although it may be argued that the triple bottom analysis that is currently on our reports may not be as sufficient as it should be, it is does form part of the current um, um, reports. Uh, risk assessment is something, uh, I guess, that we could be doing beyond what we're currently doing. Again, there may be some costs associated with that. Multiple scenarios and alternatives with detailed reporting on ramifications of each. That sounds to me like a horrendous amount of work that goes far and beyond the scope of what's currently done through the reporting process and, and would have some very significant budget implications, at least from my accession, uh, assessment of it. Uh, cost implications, that, that's already currently identified on our reports. Triple bottom line also assesses what the cost implications are and what the funding source is. So that's another one that's a little ways down the line. Operating cost implications uh, where applicable, I think we're already doing cost implications of capital expenditures as well as cost implications of decisions that are made. And, and if it's not included in the report, there's always one member of council that will stand up just like I am now and say, can somebody please tell me what the cost implications are going to be at this report? And, and if it's not included in the report, um, I'll be happy to do that at every single opportunity. Public consultation results. I don't think we go out for public consultation on all issues. There is a requirement under the Municipal Government Act that we must uh, undertake public consultations in a number of areas. And so to suggest that we should be doing this on every single issue, I think we'll be here till next year just trying to deal with the things that we're supposed to be dealing with this month, Your Worship, so I can't support that. Um, cumulative budget implications. I know there was at some point where we had asked what the cumulative budget implications were going to be and whether or not we could have an update of that on a regular basis. So if I may um, maybe engage Mr. Sawyer on this, is this something that is planned on being um, reported back on? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, there was some previous council direction, and we actually do include cumulative impacts in our quarterly reporting. Thank you for that, Mr. Sawyer. Justification for recommendations. I think that's what the report's all about. Now, I could be missing something in some of the reports that I've read, but typically there's cause and effect and um, things identified by administration on what the implications are going to be um, on either approving or not approving the recommendations from from administration. So I, this, while it it seems to look at addressing some things that one member of council feels are deficient, the one thing that I think that may not be particularly reported on here is multiple scenarios and alternatives with detailed reporting. And to me, that would have significant cost implications associated without having some idea of what that would entail. I can't support any of this. Sorry. Thank, thanks, Alderman Chabot. We've got about a minute before the break, but I see Alderman Lowe is next on the list, and I know he suggested he might not be with us after the break, so. Well, thank you, thank you, Your Worship. Actually, a lot of my concerns are very similar to Alderman Chabot's. Um, the 
when I looked at it, um, on another board I sit on, some of the committees of which I attend, uh, will deal, as a subcommittee, will deal in detail with some parts of this, then the end result comes to the board. So when I looked at this, I, I, the, the one that uh, got me was multiple scenarios with alternatives and detailed reporting of ramifications of each. Uh, you know, it seems to me if I'd, it's probably a good idea to have the scenarios that were examined listened, the recommended scenario detailed. If I want more information about the other scenarios, I agree with Alderman Chabot, I simply have to pick up the phone and get it. That's, that's part of my job. So I guess my question, Mr. Tobert, is, uh, and maybe Mr. Uh, Mr. Logan, if we did the 96th Avenue underpass, how thick would that report be to satisfy this, which is probably going to be as complex a one as we're going to deal with for a while? Your Worship, that's exactly why I asked for the second page, the insertion, because otherwise this would be a rock exercise. Yeah. The message I heard was, I don't like the reports the administration's giving, make them better. And so I said, okay, in order to narrow the gap between expectations, I wanted to actually bring a report in, show a before and after, so that we could deal with expectations to say, here's how much detail will suffice, because otherwise we'd just be shooting darts at a board. Yeah. So I, it's a hard time. The, the report that we could have brought providing alternatives to what happened near the airport would be quite thick. Yeah, and I, and I guess it's uh, without having the authors and the experts explaining each one to you as you went, uh, would be pretty heady to get through on a Sunday night at home. So but having said that, Your Worship, um, you know, I, I, my inclination... Point of procedure, Your Worship. Sorry to interrupt, but point of procedure. Let him finish his I, sentence. Well, I just, before the gavel goes, I'd like to make a move to uh, motion to extend this to finish this item. Waive the procedure bylaw. Sure, you, you could do that if you like, but why don't we let Alderman Lowe finish? And uh, before so I bang the gavel, I'll, I'll listen to you. The, uh, I guess my, I think the reports we have, generally speaking, are good. There's probably some incremental improvements that we can do. But I think this is far too far to go in one quantum leap. Regardless of what the reports say, we still have our jobs to do. So I'm, I'm not going to support this. Uh, procedurally, I think when we're doing that, we can take a look at the, the, the content of them as part of that. Thanks, uh, Alderman Lowe. Alderman Marr? Your Worship, I understand that uh, Alderman Lowe has another meeting to go to, so I would like to waive the procedure bylaw and extend this item, make sure that we finish it so he can participate in, in the discussion uh, if it pleases council. Do we have a seconder? It's not quite the correct motion. You are changing the, re you're changing the time to recess until, this, until consideration of this item is complete. Okay, um, do I have a seconder for that? Alderman Hodges is seconding that. So, all in favor? Yes, sorry, are we agreed? <laughs> Chairing a different different committee for a second there. Are we agreed? Any opposed? Call the roll, please. No, and it needs a two-thirds, right? Alderman Farrell? No. Alderman Hodges? Yes. Alderman Jones? No. Alderman Keating? Uh, yes. Alderman Lowe? No. Alderman McLeod? No. Alderman Marr? Yes. Alderman Pincott? No. Alderman Putmans? No. Alderman Stevenson? No. Alderman Kra? Sure. Alderman Chabot? No. Alderman collier -Cott? Yes. Alderman DeMong? No. Mayor Nenshi? No. It's lost your worship. All right, then we are recessed. We will be back here at five minutes after seven to complete this uh, and... 7.20. 7.20, sorry, 7.20, uh, to complete this and, re and our next...
And we're back. I have four on my speakers list, Alderman Farrell, Pincott, Kara, and Keating. Alderman Farrell. Thank you. Um, well, I do think that there's some interesting ideas here, but um, to expect that every report should include all this information perhaps is what I, Alderman Mara said not everyone, not every report, and I don't think that's really clear. It's, it's a, there are some interesting ideas here. These are really um, pieces of information that should be part of a thorough report. And one of the reasons we brought forward the whole idea of an executive summary is when I got on council, um, we didn't have executive summaries. We had, in some cases, 20, 30 page reports, and the recommendation was usually at the back. And uh, so we asked for something that would be bring forward the salient points. Uh, I th think it's been helpful, but perhaps we need to now look at the next iteration. Uh, I'm going to suggest that we send this back to the governance committee to look at um, to look at the contents of this. All right, so you're making a motion to refer this to the procedure, it's now called the Procedure Bylaw Subcommittee. I'm gonna call it the Governance Committee because I think that's what it should be. I I'd rather do that too, but I think in the motions, in the minutes we approved the other name. All right, in my head I'm calling it Governance. <laughs> me, me too, Alderman Farrell. All right. All right, so we've got a motion to refer this to the Procedures Bylaw Committee. Um, would you, sorry. <laughs> it's all right, sorry. Um, and do you have a time you want it to go there or to come back here? Alderman Farrell? I'm not sure when their work will be done and when they're going to report to council, but I imagine the governance committee will. Why don't, why don't we give them until March to report back on this particular issue? That would be fine. Okay. All right then, so we've got, we've got a motion on the floor to refer this item to the Procedure Bylaw Subcommittee to report back to Council no later than March 2011. Do I have a seconder for that motion? Seconder for the referral motion? Thanks, Alderman Hodges. All right, on the referral motion, I'm gonna ignore the lights. Just wave at me if you'd like to speak on the referral motion. Alderman Jones? If we're gonna get it back that way, can we also have associated costs with it as well? Sure, we can throw that in. That's all right, Alderman Farrell? Okay. Um, anyone else on this referral motion? Alderman Pincott? Uh, I'm not clear. Uh, I think this is work for administration, not for the procedure bylaw committee. Because I don't think the procedure bylaw committee can come up with what the costs would be on this. So I, I do honestly believe that if we're going to do this, this is there's this is work for administration to do, uh, and 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 costing it and sort of filling it out. I so. think the I think the thought, Alderman uh, Pincott, is that it go right away to the procedures bylaw committee who um, refine it a little bit and then presumably would send it to administration to work on once it's been noodled on a bit more. I think that's what I heard Alderman Farrell say. If that's all right with you, Alderman Farrell. Um, others on this referral motion? Alderman Carra? Well, I think the point of um, this motion is, is a couple fold. Um, not the referral motion, but the actual motion. And so I'm going to speak to the referral motion As to time. In, in that regard. Um, I think the importance is to have. Uh, I mean, I've made the point several times today that I think we needed a more uh, nuanced and comprehensive report from CPC. And I partially want that for myself. And I acknowledge Alderman Chabot's point that, you know, that's our job, is to stay on top of it and send our staff after it. But I think in the spirit of transparent governance, we want to have something that is readily apparent and understandable and accessible to the people watching at home and the people who come out. And so we want to make, I think the point of this is, is not to have more and more information, but to have better and clearer and more concise information. And um, I think it's important to have that discussion and to make that statement. And if council feels that 
it's best and most effectively addressed at the governance. Uh, what are we calling it now? Not the governance. The procedures bylaw subcommittee. Then maybe that's where we do it. But I, I applaud Alderman Marr for bringing this forward because I think it has to be addressed. Thanks, Alderman Cry. Anyone else on the motion to refer? Alderman Stevenson. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> well, there may be some areas, well, there are some areas for sure that we'd like some more clarity on the reports. I think we're trying to kill a mosquito with a sledgehammer here, and it's going to be costly for all of us. So I will not support the referral. I would like to vote against the referral, and then we can kill the motion. Thank you. But not with a sledgehammer. Thanks, Alderman Stevenson. Anyone else on the referral? Okay, uh, Alderman McLeod. And then Alderman Keating. <coughs> Thank you, Your Worship. I was just gonna say, I'm not sure that the referral or the actual motion here are that much different because they're both asking to come back with a report on what we might do differently. So I see it as same, same. <laughs> the only difference, Alderman McLeod, is where it goes. So uh, does it go back to the procedure bylaw subcommittee or straight back to council? Other than that, same, same. Yeah. <laughs> Alderman Keating? I was hesitating because I was going to maybe wait till the next one, but I think they all fit together, uh, similar to Alderman McLeod said. Um, I would hope that everything listed here is pre-done in any report, because any good report should have a number of these and probably all of these things done in it before it comes to us anyway. So including some of them, I don't think should be any what of a cost. Um, so as a referral, I think we should vote on it and move forward. Okay. Anyone else on the referral motion? All right, on the motion to refer then. Do you wanna close, Alderman Farrell? Okay. On the motion to refer then, are we agreed? Any opposed? Call the roll, please. No. Sure. Sure. No. 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 Yes. 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 No. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Back to the main motion then, Alderman Pincott. Thank you. Um, while I appreciate the, uh, the desire for better reports, um, <clears throat> as I look at the motion, or it's on my computer, uh, as I look at the motion, I, 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 I can't help but think that if we want to see our administration grind to a halt, this is probably the best way to do it. Uh, have them report us to death and tr have to work on the kind of things that are in there, things like <clears throat> detailed scenarios and uh, rat justifications, ratifications for everything in within reports. I agree with Alderman Chabot. A lot of that is work that we, uh, we as members of council can and should be doing uh, of our own accord. Uh, it is part of what is what I would call our due diligence and offload trying to offload our due diligence to administration certainly doesn't help to streamline and expedite anything so and it's certainly uh, if if this does proceed uh, then I certainly hope that uh, any of these uh, potential report formats would include uh, costing because if I do recall, uh, last year there was a, a, uh, a, a number thrown at us for just a standard report. Every time we asked for a report, how much sort of a ballpark. And uh, I, think that, I think that we'd see that escalate uh, exponentially, most likely. So I won't be supporting this. Thank you, Alderman Pincott. Alderman Carra. Um. 
I spoke to some of the things that I think are pertinent to this motion when I was referring to the referral. Um, I will uh, agree with Alderman Keating's statement that you know, a lot of these things should be addressed before we get a report to council. And what this is really about is the report to council. And I mean, I don't want to see something that's larger and larger and larger. I want to see something that's more and more accessible. And I think if you flip the green page over, and you look at now, therefore, now be it further resolved that uh, council directs administration to prepare and submit directly to members of council at the earliest opportunity um, a test case that has the way it's currently reported and maybe a look at how it could be done differently. And we can start refining it from there. But I think I would hope that everyone can agree that our current reports to council are not as helpful as they could be, and they're certainly unhelpful to people who aren't paid to be experts in them. And that's the public who we want to be more and more open and engaging of. So I think there's enough room in this uh, motion to accomplish that, and I encourage everyone to support it. Thank you, Alderman Kara. Alderman Keating. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, going back to further comments, the writers of any good report would include these, and I would suspect a number of different areas. Um, I do want to, I guess, raise the question as saying is it's not my, I could be wrong in saying it's not my job to do my due diligence and research and all of those sorts of things, but I would suspect, again, that most of the research and all of these things are done in any good report before it comes to us. So if it's there, make it readily available to us, and I would propose that it is my job to discern that information coming forward and making a qualified decision on that aspect. Uh, therefore, I will support it. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Keating. Alderman Jones. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just a question for Manager Tobert. You're the one, and you and your jams are the ones that are going to have to do this. How do you read this? Mr. Tobert. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> well, we will see after we do the test case. Um, I honestly think that we do do a good job on the reports you have. And any time that you have a question on a report that we currently have set, submitted to council or have over the past year, you call us and we give you additional information. I mean, are we trying to fix something that's broken or not? Well, that was exactly the reason for my question. Is that, Do you think that we already do this or? Should we do the test case and go from there? That's a very difficult question to answer. That's, that, that's for council to decide. I think you should ask yourself, are you happy with the quality of the reports that you see to help you make your decision on this vote? Okay, let me ask it in a different way. Do you think there's gonna be an associated cost with this? We will do more work to provide you with more information if that's what you want. That costs more money. Things will cost, take longer. Yeah, it costs more money, and do you have the staff to do this? Things will take longer, because we don't have more staff to do this work. So it's the same amount of staff doing more work, because it takes more work to put more in the report, simply put. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Jones. Alderman Stevenson. Thank you <clears throat> again for um, GM Tobert. The, the first resolved is very uh, direct it's it's directing you to do these things how do you see that resolve um, compare uh, working together with the further be it resolve can you explain to me what you have to do on this first report sure. well that's the whole purpose of the second now further be it resolved because if this was asked for in every single report every single report would get much much longer even the small ones would get much much longer so, you know, we actually had a discussion at the lunch break about or, uh, whether or not we needed to, when council commissions report, they should actually give us, do you want uh, the heavy, medium, or light? Because then we're really talking about expectations on reports and how much detail do you want? Because we're here to give you what you need to make good decisions. But if something's not in a report, we can call you and you get it for us, right? And you do that now? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Stevenson. Anyone else before I call on Alderman Mar to close? Alderman Mar to close. Uh, before I close, I've just got 
a couple of quick questions for for the administration, uh, because Mr. Tobert, you, you can't really, Alderman Mar. Will you allow you, it? You've already spoken worship. on this item. Okay. Well, I can I can move right along. Uh, if council has a look at the first resolve, it says such information to include, but not be limited to. Most of the information, you're right, is already there. Yes, there is previous council direction. What I'm saying is, we want to make sure that we're receiving the information that we need. So obviously, we want to be able to be. How do we get to this this place? How? Where, what's the background? What is the risks? The triple bottom bottom line analysis that I see right now uh, is very light. I would like more detail on that. Uh, multiple scenarios and alternatives. Obviously, we're not going to ask this for absolutely every report. We are, we're not going to anticipate that if we were doing a uh, a name change, a street name change, or a road closure, or something that's that's quite simplistic. Usually they will say triple bottom line assessment, risks, none, things like that. It's a one-liner. It's, it's a syllable, for crying out loud. We're not actually asking for council to reinvent, or sorry, administration to reinvent the wheel. When we are talking about a billion dollar project, for example, the West LRT, when three years ago, probably pretty close to three years ago today, newly elected Alderman Connolly and myself were asked to work with our communities on a brand new West LRT, a billion dollar system. Would it have been helpful to have more information? I think it would have been. And many of you know that a lot of the changes that were made in West LRT were as a result of a report that appeared mysteriously in my mailbox. This is something that I want future councils to have to be able to avoid. How would this help it, Alderman Chabot? I think that what we would be able to see is providing the information is given to us in a timely way to with alternatives. It, well, it was, it was, a, it was a, a mysterious report, certainly. But uh, it eventually made it to, to the light of day. And I think that that's something that we want if we're making decisions on the best, uh, sorry, for, for Calgarians ensuring that we have the best information, we will trust our administration to send it to us. Clearly, we're going to need them to be able to vet and choose which of the reports are, are in need of these alternatives, how we got to where we're going, justify the recommendation that they're making. Alderman Stevenson is, is preparing for a major, major infrastructure project in the uh, Northeast the airport tunnel or the 96th Avenue underpass as we like to we like to refer to it now don't you want the best information have you been able to get all the best information that you've been requesting for throughout the entire term because I seem to recall many times you going back and back and back and back for more information so I think this is exactly what you want this is exactly what we need and especially when many of us campaigned on greater transparency. People that are picking up the agendas at home want to know, how did you get to this decision? This tells them. It's very transparent. It's better governance. It's just the right thing to do. And uh, I'd ask for a recorded vote. Thanks, Alderman Mars. So a recorded vote on uh, notice of motion. Um, I've forgotten the number, but you all know what it is, on council report templates. Eleven one point one. Well, NM twenty ten forty four. That's what I was looking for. No, it doesn't. It's here. You believe in the clerk? On the recorded vote, Alderman Ma for, Alderman Hodges for, Alderman Farrell against, Alderman Kra for, Alderman Collier-Cart for, Alderman Chabot against, 
Alderman DeMong, 4. Alderman McLeod, 4. Alderman Pootmans, against. Alderman Keating, 4. Alderman Stevenson, against. Alderman Jones, against. Alderman Pincott, against. Mernenshi, 4. It's carried, Your Worship. Thank you. Alderman Collier Kurt. Your Worship, on the next item, uh, it's this urgent matter of business on the Police Commission. Ah, not yet. Motion arrived. Oh. We've got, uh, we've got 11.2 first, which is the one we added on the Louis Station briefing. Oh, well, uh, yes, but I was just hoping that we could discuss this item in camera because there's a letter to circulate for members of council before we go in to brief you on a bit, a bit of background in camera. So I was just going to say, let's not deal with that urgent matter right now. Okay, so the best way to do that, Alderman collier cart is yes. why don't you give me a motion to table um, item 12.1 until after the in-camera session. That's what, that was what I intended. That's exactly <laughs> what I said. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you. Worship, on a, a motion, uh, of, on a procedural motion, if we're going to do a motion arising on the last motion, should it not be immediately following the motion? Did you have one? I would like to put forward. Oh, so Alderman Collier Card, I'm going to put you I'll on pause. I'm sorry, Alderman Chabot, I didn't ask. Go ahead. Thank you, Worship. Um, on that last motion that was approved by Council, I think uh, we need to provide further direction on that to uh, direct administration to also provide some cost estimates on providing these this format of reporting on an ongoing basis. Okay, Alderman Jones is seconding that. So you just have a simple motion that administration also be requested to provide cost estimates uh, arising from um, arising from notice of motion 2010-44. Correct, Your Worship. Very well, and Alderman Jones is seconding. Any debate on that matter? Okay, on that matter then, are we agreed? Any opposed? <coughs> Carried. Now, Alderman collier Cart. Thank you, Your Worship. I would like to table the uh, urgent uh, matter of business 12.1 uh, till after the in-camera session, and if M Madam Clerk would circulate the letter uh, uh, on behalf of the Chairman of the Commission to members of Council now so they can see this. Very well. Do you have a seconder on that tabling motion? Alderman Marr? Any dis oh, no, it's not debatable. <laughs> so on that motion, then, to uh, table uh, item 12.1 until after the in-camera session, are we agreed? Any opposed? Uh, Alderman Hodges is opposed. All right, very well then. Now we move to section 11.2, uh, Louise Station. I'm proposing council that we uh, play this one as follows. We'll ask Mr. Stevens to make his presentation. Council will have the opportunity to ask him questions. Uh, I'll then accept a motion to accept his report for information and you'll have a chance to debate it then. Um, I'm gonna rely very closely on Mr. Tully if there are issues that Mr. Tully suggests, given pending litigation or other matters, are better dealt with in camera, I will just alert you to that at that time. All right? So, Mr. Stevens. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship, members of council. And appreciate the opportunity to be able to uh, review on the slides. How's that? I can do it from there. I can I can flip back and forth if that's okay. Sharing. Much better, thank you. Oh, how's that? There we go, we have connection. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship and members of Council for the opportunity to be able to brief you on this uh, file. This, uh, this is a, a project that has uh, 
created safe, affordable housing and uh, some municipal facilities in uh, downtown Calgary. It's been referred to at different times as different kinds of files, and I'll tell you why that is uh, in, uh, in just a moment. But you can see, you're familiar with the, the project. It's up and operating now. It's success, uh, the project was successfully incorporated into a mixed use and a mixed income development model. The uh, project really consists of two sites, and this is the uh, 838 Fourth Avenue Southwest site referred to as the Louise Station site. The other uh, property that we're going to talk about in a moment refers to Eau Claire. So that's why you're seeing them uh, referenced in, in uh, two different ways. The site that is uh, currently up and operating is has 88 units of affordable housing, 116 units of, of market housing, a, a fire and EMS station, three floors of office at grade and supporting retail along with uh, four levels of underground parking and that's, that uh, underground parking is a significant issue that we'll come back to in, uh, in a moment. The other uh, property is a 727 First Avenue Southwest or the Eau Claire uh, property. It's a 10-story, uh, 72-unit affordable housing building but built back in uh, 1970. And uh, you'll see throughout my presentation that in uh, approximately 2005, the Calgary Housing Company began discussions about whether or not uh, they were wanted to continue to operate that facility and what they would do uh, with that building. Uh, the uh, the uh, replacement property at Louise Station was uh, built and then the um, property at Eau Claire could then be vacated with the tenants uh, moving out. I wanted to uh, provide uh, you with the same context that I provided uh, land committee with and this was not just a uh, affordable housing project that just kind of dropped into our plates on uh, in 2005-2006. Uh, there was a significant amount of history that uh, predated uh, this this transaction starting all the way back in uh, 2000 when um, there was a status report on homelessness and affordable housing initiatives quite a lengthy report that went uh, to committee and uh, the key result coming from that report was a direction to the administration to go out and uh, seek partnerships joint venture opportunities and really uh, seek opportunities to uh, partner with private the private sector and the not-for-profit sector in the development of affordable ho housing initiatives. This was an attempt and a direction by Council to the administration to really transform the way we were doing affordable housing, to get away from the traditional model of just bending in land and walking away. It was really a way to do something new and innovative by involving the uh, private sector uh, and uh, not merely just rely on the government and the not-for-profit sector. In July of uh, 2002, report 2002-57, there was an additional update, the corporate affordable housing strategy where we took some of the earlier direction from two years previous and uh, began uh, to develop a strategy that uh, council endorsed to increase affordable housing through the reprofiling of existing stock, which is what happened on this uh, file, and to seek revised operating agreements with the province of Alberta, again with specific reference to do so in the context of a new partnership opportunities is a, as a way to leverage what uh, limited resources we had by way of land. This was uh, followed again in uh, 2003, report 2003-44, the Corporate Affordable Housing Implementation Plan. And uh, the key outcome uh, of this report, again, was the first time that we really saw the direction from City Council to start talking about 200 units of affordable housing every year. That was the first time we saw that goal emerge. And uh, they said, what would, council said to us uh, as a result, what would it take, how much money would we need in order to leverage money from the province to create 200 units of affordable housing every year? Uh, those uh, discussions were then uh, moved forward and uh, many of you participated in, uh, some of you who weren't even on council who are here today. Uh, participated as part of the Mayor's Roundtable on Affordable Housing. There were two sessions in November 2003 and uh, the first session had approximately 50 representatives from the development industry, building industry, the finance industry and the not-for-profit sector. And there was some outcomes uh, of um, the first session uh, leading to the second session where over 77 people from the same industries joined together with the outcome of trying to figure out a way that we could organize the way things were happening. There was some work being done in the not-for-profit sector, there was work being done in the government sector, both municipally and provincially, 
and there was a desire to coordinate uh, what was happening. And so the key result of that was the uh, City of Calgary uh, was asked and did approved funding for the establishment of a quarterback uh, position, which was really the first step seen towards facilitating the delivery of affordable housing through new and innovative means. It wasn't, again, this was the first step to really move away from that uh, traditional model. And many of you will know that uh, previous Alderman Longstaff was the uh, first quarterback that was uh, retained and uh, served as uh, with the Calgary Homeless Foundation. That's where the position resided based upon uh, funding from the City of Calgary. So working now in consultation with uh, the private industry, uh, I should say that as part of that uh, uh, Mayor's Roundtable, that's where we got our first look at this project. The, uh, Louise, uh, the, Louis, the Louise Station project was uh, something that was discussed uh, as part of these some hundred and uh, over, well over a hundred people coming forward to look at the various opportunities. It was publicly discussed as an opportunity and uh, seen or, or uh, given to the administration to see whether or not this was something worthy of uh, further pursuit. So in 2004, we brought a further report uh, forward saying, okay, now we have direction from the publicly held uh, process through the Mayor's Roundtable. What kind of funding do we need in order to have a sustainable resource management plan going forward? And uh, Council uh, provided that to us, and um, it was provided to us in, in uh, two phases. Uh, and that was when we began to see the real evolution of API funding um, through the uh, province of Alberta. In uh, 2005, we got down to the specific details. We were able to cost units. We were able to determine what the cost of wood frame versus concrete, those kinds of things. We could really see how much money it was going to be required in order to um, uh, either acquire or construct affordable housing. The, uh, this issue became uh, so important uh, at the uh, initiative of Alderman Hawksworth. Uh, I remember being at a strategic planning session with the City Council where they began. Th this was a fairly hefty price tag. In order to ensure that we were going to try and build 200 units, there was a fairly hefty price tag because, again, provincial funding was only providing a portion of the funding. And so there was some discussion as to whether or not the City of Calgary was going to be able to afford and uh, sustain its effort to create these 200 units uh, every year. Uh, and it became such an important issue that they were incorporated into the overall corporate goals uh, to initiate 200 units of affordable housing in 2006, 2007, and 2008. And City Council at that point in time made a considerable uh, commitment to match the funding, to provide their 30% to match the 70% provincial funding in order to move this program forward. Uh, at this time, there began to be discussions, as I referenced uh, early, with the Calgary Housing Company. I know some of you were uh, sitting on Calgary Housing Company at the time where they began to talk about uh, the asset at First Avenue and uh, what would be done uh, with it. And in CHC 2005-49, the Audit and Risk Committee actually uh, uh, put together a task force uh, specifically to deal with the future of 727 uh, First Avenue. And uh, in 2005, 54, uh, that was when a Calgary Housing Company came back with recommendations that uh, based upon the previous discussions of council to find a private sector partner and to get into the reprofiling of assets, that this asset was a primary, um, provided a primary opportunity to be able to do that. The social setting, many of you will recall, was uh, some substantial uh, social programs, uh, social pro problems that were happening uh, at that uh, location, uh, unfortunately culminating in a, mur in a murder suicide that uh, threw the community uh, for a loop as well as the administration to really determine what was uh, going to happen. So uh, although I didn't sit on, was not sitting on CHC at the time, going back and reviewing all the information, I can see that the decision and the recommendation coming forward to council was really in uh, three different areas. Uh, there was the, the social part of that. The operating model was not working. The uh, property was throwing a severe loss every year. Uh, the uh, revenue coming in uh, was nowhere near the amount required in order to meet the operating costs of uh, 727 First Avenue. And so ultimately the uh, recommendation was to reprofile that uh, property. And um, there was some discussion about whether or not uh, or how much it was going to cost to actually deal with the renovation of that property. 
And uh, depending upon whether it was eighty or ninety thousand dollars a unit, you could be spending anywhere from five and a half to approximately six and a half million dollars on an asset that uh, had a val had a market value of approximately three point eight million dollars. So between the operating costs, between the, uh, the capital value of the capital asset, and the social problems that uh, were happening there, I believe that was the basis of the recommendation ultimately to come forward. Um, get rid of the building, be able to provide and reprofile that site, and uh, at that point in time, the discussions around the project that I'm briefing you on today really began to um, uh, pick up. In 2006, there was a, a financial plan, financial update given to City Council with respect to affordable housing and the strategic financial plan. Uh, there were opportunities, uh, the administration had been asked to go back and find additional opportunities for funding, so we had brought back uh, pieces of land that we could look at uh, selling to create money for the addition or creation of affordable housing. Uh, with respect to the specific uh, transaction, there began to be discussions in early 2006, uh, discussions and negotiations, independent uh, appraisals uh, were commissioned. Uh, but I can tell you that um, at that point in time, City Council had just approved a new real estate bylaw. In consultation with the industry, uh, we had heard that some of the frustrations that were there was is that uh, when the private sector, private individuals were dealing with city council, often lots of money was spent, spent was, uh, money was spent on appraisals. Um, it was a lot of work done bringing a potential real estate transaction to the city of Calgary, only then to be presented to city council, and city council would say, what was the basis of, of this? So we went back and redid the process. We cut six weeks out of transaction times. We were really trying to figure out a better way to do the real estate transactions and what we did, we introduced a new method of disposition we called it and said before the parties run out and spend a whole bunch of money on transactions, let's come to City Council right at the outset. and Let's find out whether or not the basics of the transaction are what Council uh, would ultimately, uh, w whether or not they would consider that would, that would be a good opportunity for us to, to do. So in um, uh, on LAS 2006 144, uh, that uh, report, a publicly available report, was brought uh, to City Council for discussion where we laid out the general terms um, of the agreement. We, had, we were in very early on in negotiations. We had had some appraisal information, but we said, here's the general concept. New, pro new properties will be built at the 4th uh, Avenue property. The 1st Avenue property will be sold. The building will be demolished. This is how it will be funded. Here's generally what we know. Would you like us to proceed? And uh, with some specificity, um, City Council said uh, yes. And uh, in that uh, report that was discussed both at Land Committee and publicly at City Council, uh, there the important uh, parts was is that there was approval to do a direct negotiation with the developer at the time. And uh, we were to use independent appraisals to be able to do the verification of the valuations. And I can tell you that throughout, that has been the case. Uh, the valuations of the First Avenue property and the Fourth Avenue property have both been based upon independent evaluation, valuations that were discussed, discussed extensively at, uh, at Land Committee. Uh, in uh, shortly after, once we got council approval to uh, continue on, there was some concern raised over the varying amounts of the appraisal, differencing, differences of opinion in the valuations. And so what the administration did is we went back out to the independent appraiser and got an updated valuation. We got some facts updated and we got another independent appraisal confirming the value at $4.2 million. The actual negotiation actually ended up giving the citizens of Calgary $4.5 million. So we got more money than what was set out in the independent appraisal at the time. There were actually three independent appraisals, two commissioned by the developer, one commissioned by the City of Calgary. Now, the other important part of the method of disposition is, is that that is traditionally the date that the administration sets for the valuation of land. And the reason for that is, is that the City of Calgary has no authority, nor do we speculate in land. So we try, as best we can, to nail down the price of a future option at the time that City Council gives us the approval. And that was, in this case, approximately October of 2006. That was the date of the valuation, because we do not speculate in land. So on a future 
a transaction, of course, the land values can go up, the land values can go down. We do not play the market when it comes to real estate. And where we can, we try and fix that date as of the date of the approval of City Council, which was October of uh, 2006. So the updated appraisal information uh, was uh, provided. Uh, we then uh, came back uh, to uh, City Council a second time. We uh, had been uh, further down the line with uh, discussions uh, and negotiations with the developer, and we came back to City Council uh, Land Committee and City Council a second time in a publicly discussed report in 2007-111, where we had moved the process further and said to City Council, we have a little bit more detail, we have some initial designs, we can see how the fire hall is going to be integrated into the overall process. Would you like us to continue? We've not gone out to tender any of the, uh, the, uh, um, the buildings or anything like that. Would you still like uh, to uh, continue? And I can tell you that at that point in time, there was some initial indications. And I remember a fairly lengthy debate at land committee over three specific items. Uh, the amount per door, and I think I referenced this at the very beginning, the cost of this uh, transaction per door and we went through the pro forma several times because of the audit cost of underground parking. This was four, grounds, four, ground, uh, four floors of underground parking which had a significant impact on the cost of these units. So we went through the pro forma several times uh, with City Council. That was the first number that we talked about. The second number was the option number and the third number was the valuation for the 4th Avenue property. Long discussions, long debate in land committee. Uh, over that information because I distinctly remember the discussion about why these units are costing $320,000 a door. And quite frankly, it was they were different from the other projects that we were doing at Crestwood and a couple of the other projects, primarily because of the underground parking in the downtown. So again, 2011, um, 2007-111, uh, Council said, uh, yes, go ahead, continue on with the negotiations. Again, public document. The only document that wasn't public at the time was the heads of agreement because it was still evolving. We were still in negotiations uh, and that was the document that uh, was not made public. The uh, final report again for the last time in 2008-73, we came back a third time to City Council because uh, what had happened is that when we had actually tendered the project, in order to get the lead certification that we wanted for the fire hall, the cost had gone up approximately $2 million. So we came back to City Council and said, we have a budget, but we need an appropriation if you'd like us to get the Leeds standard. Um, we've tendered, but we have not made any commitments yet. Would you like to proceed uh, with the project? Before we make any commitments, uh, would you like us to, to, to proceed? And at that point in time, we got final uh, approval to go ahead and uh, complete the transaction, uh, which, uh, which we have done. Um, at, uh, uh, following the completion of 2008-73, uh, 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 the City of Calgary engaged a, uh, uh, a quantity surveyor, a uh, firm by the name of uh, Cuthbert Smith, that uh, we used in order to ensure that the uh, allocation of costs between the market housing and the affordable housing was kept separate and distinct. Uh, this is a firm that was used by banks for mortgage processing and uh, financing. Uh, and we used them, and every invoice that we received from the developer, we had reviewed by an independent third party, the quantity surveyor, to ensure that the cost that citizens were paying were for the two uh, buildings that were going to be owned uh, by the citizens, not the market uh, tower. So the, uh, that takes us to uh, where we are today. The, uh, the project at um, the Louis Station has, was completed. The affordable housing tower was officially opened in uh, February 2010 and a few months later in May 2010 the, um, the uh, fire station was, was officially opened. Uh, with that I think I'll conclude uh, your worship and take any questions that uh, members of council might have. Thank you uh, very much Mr. Stevens. Um, I was just about to say I have a whole bunch of questions and I don't see any lights on but Alderman Collier Carp beat me to it. No go ahead I'll go at the end. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stevens, for your presentation. Uh, can you uh, confirm uh, whether or not at 8 FAR um, it should be at 21,500, 5,135 square feet for about 172,000 uh, square foot building? 
<laughs> that's in your uh, that's in your documentation. Not not at this so moment. At I, I'd so be happy at eight F A R, or could one of your staff uh, flesh that out for me? If we had the right numbers, we could probably do some work. I see James working on some now, but I'm maybe I take can your simplify direction, it. Maybe I can yeah. simplify it more. Uh, where did the 12,000 square foot of land for the uh, market tower at Louise Station come from? Uh, maybe I can add, add a little clarification, Mr. Stevens. I, I think I understand what Alderman Collier Card is asking. The price that um, was paid to us for the Louise Station land appears to have been calculated according to LAS 2007-111. Um, on a $227 per square foot for 12,000 square feet approximately. However, at the 8 FAR, it seems that the building is considerably larger than that. So was the square foot number wrong or the price per square foot wrong or dot, dot, dot? Uh, Your Worship, you. is that the... That's I don't have that level of detail here. I can tell you that, again, the, uh, the independent appraiser that was used, that was the basis of the information that we used. It was for the uh, Fourth Avenue property that you asked, is that right? And for the Louis Station Yes, property. so yes, uh, independent appraiser was the one that went out, gave us the information, uh, had done some analysis and review of the FAR in the area, but I, to be honest with you, I don't have that calculation sitting here right now. Uh, there are a number of questions that we have that if we were to ask uh, to go away and have these questions answered would probably be the best way, Your Worship, to, to do this. Um, can you, uh, are, are you able to comment on the fact that uh, in the engineering report uh, that, uh, that the city-owned 72-unit affordable housing complex was in poor condition versus an engineering report that said it was in good condition? Uh your Worship, as I understand the uh, reports, there was one report that talked about the building being fairly sound structurally, but there was two issues that were evolving. The systems were in terrible need of repair. I think members of council will recall the a huge additional cost of security that was put into the building and the operating costs. And finally, there were systems, if you, go, if you drive by the site now, you know that many of the, this building was built in 1970, so many of the systems are actually on the ground floor. And if there were a flood, you can actually see it's actually built below the floodplain. Now, there were serious concerns that if that were the case, it would shut down the building. So some of the costs that were involved dealt with moving some of those base systems up to the roof or one of the top floors, resulting in losses of affordable housing units. Uh, so, so you may not have the detail on this question either, but uh, another question I had was... Um, based on your comparison of effective land values by component, um, the appraisal was commissioned and completed by Durant Consulting, and the effective date of that report was May 10th, 2006. Uh, and this was about 14 months before the approval of LAS 2007-111. Do you recall that, or is that something that we should get answered later? No, uh, no, Your Worship. The effective date, as I indicated, is the date of the method of disposition. That's the date that Council actually approves the transaction, and that's the date where we try and avoid speculation. So I, I, I said, I think I said earlier in my presentation, the uh, the valuation came back at 4.2 million, part way through 2006. The date that Council actually gave approval was October of 2006, and so the amount was adjusted an additional $300,000 and moved from 4.2 to 4.5 so that we could set it at the date that council actually gave us the initial approval, which was October 2006. Okay. Uh, so I, I was wanting to have you comment more on the parking and the parking stalls and uh, the arrangement uh, that occurred there uh, in relation to the affordable housing component with the parking stalls. No? I'm not sure I could in what respect. I'm not. Sir, I'm going to call your cut. Do you want to try that one again? Yeah. It's I was just, working my way through the numbers on yeah, the last one. It's, it's just this, this, this is difficult. I think what's best is probably to uh, bring forward a motion, and then if we all have questions, that we would submit them to whoever is going to review this as opposed to, you know, the
this back and forth. And I, I, think, I think you're likely right, Alderman Collier. Right? So it sounds like the questions are at a level of detail that uh, we're not going to get answers on them tonight. Yeah. Um, so I'll just ask other members of council Thank to you. think about what Mr. Stevens can legitimately answer for us this evening. Uh, Alderman McLeod. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, perhaps my question falls in the same category because it's about parking. Can you tell me how many um, parking stalls per unit um, as compared to, no, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, any sense of what the incremental cost of the parking was in relation to the unit cost? Um, I think, I haven't gone specifically, I believe that the parking that one of the reports that I had seen, it was in the neighborhood of 35000 $40,000 a stall. Pardon me? At the time. At, at the time. And I, again, that could be order of magnitude. I remember the discussion at land committee talking about a significant increase to the $320,000 per door being significantly related in the pro forma to the uh, cost of parking. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Alderman McLeod? And that, of course, just punctuates another issue that of affordable housing in the core area and the requirements for parking. It's an ongoing problem. It's good to see that the city has the same problem as the uh, nonprofits do in providing that parking. Thank you, Alderman McLeod. Alderman Putmans. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Um, yeah, exactly, on parking as well. This is four stories below grade. My understanding is that going down four stories, lots become significantly more than $35,000 unit. Do you have some sense of what they were approaching in terms of? Not with me. I, I'm recalling from memory the de, lo, fairly long discussion we had at land committee about that pro forma and what the impact of the cost of parking was. I could be off by hopefully not a big magnitude, but, but I distinctly remember that discussion at land committee. Thank you. Um, Your Worship, then are we going to prepare quite, what do you know, what, have you, have we figured out a process for I think all of us would like a little more detail. And yeah. we'll probably all have a lot of questions. What will what will the process I, be? I do have a process that I will. That's actually that Alderman Collier Urquhart and I have a process that she'll suggest uh, going forward. But let's get out the questions now that we can, uh, and then we'll have an opportunity to talk about those. Alderman Moore. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Alderman Putmans and Alderman McLeod went quite along the same path that I wanted to go in terms of the parking, because that seems to be one of the major discrepancies in terms of the land cost and how we ended up at 300 and some odd thousand dollars per door. Uh, one of the other questions, you had mentioned that this was in the floodplain and it was a 1970 or so building. Were there any other I issues with the building that would have required us to, to, to demolish it rather than to, uh, to restore it? Can you speak to that a little bit? Was it, had it been flooded before, things of that nature? Um, no, I, I think the answer to the last question is no. I'm looking around because I think some of my colleagues maybe had more, uh, have more an understanding of actually what happened in that Eau Claire district than I do. I don't believe there was ever a flood. I do know that it was close. I do know that there was a worry one night during a winter thaw. I, I do remember seeing that in one of the reports, um, but I don't know if it actually ever came to be that there was a concern. Mm -hmm. Again, the discussion really resulted around how much uh, additional money do you want to spend on an asset that was had been valued at about $3.8 million. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, not at the time, I can tell you now having gone into the building and knowing there are asbestos problems and challenges that probably weren't taken into account at the time, but would have to have been taken into account. And you have to, you have to understand that at the time, the provincial money did not you couldn't use provincial money to renovate units. Was there? Oh, that's interesting to note. You, yeah, that, that you you either bought or you either bought or built. That was the provincial funding program at the time. And that was one of the the requirements in order for the city to move forward. You would have had to have this money, the provincial money, because that represented what percentage of the cost? Uh, it was about twelve million dollars of the total. Uh, which represents what percentage? I think it was twenty-eight seven. About $28 million using round numbers, so $12 million of the 28. Okay, so almost half, about 40, 45%, give or take. Yep. A fairly substantial amount. Okay, my next question. Uh, you mentioned asbestos uh, and, and some other issues. Was it also post-intention cable, or is it... A, or, uh, or, do you I, remember? I don't know. You don't know? That, that, that's not something that's been in the reports that I've seen. 
Okay, because that obviously has uh, has implications in terms of safety of the building and things of that nature. Uh, now, many buildings of this vintage, this era, had uh, their utilities located in the main floor, but in the basement. Where with where was the utilities for this? In the basement. And in the basement. And in the event that there was a flood, it would render the building virtually useless. Is that not right? Um, yeah, I th yeah, more than virtually, I think it would be useless. Okay, and. Now, you mentioned the program where the city of Calgary, uh, sorry, not the city of Calgary, the, the province of Alberta, it is very clear and public in those documents that you could not proceed without having a new building either purchased or constructed. Re renovating uh, existing units. This was, this was a goal of the province to add to the housing inventory. Mm -hmm. Not to not to change the existing inventory. It was about buying or building. Okay. My point was was this is that information public, yes. mm -hmm. and it has been for yes. some time. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm interested in hearing what the rest of my colleagues are going to say, but uh, that's a very very interesting point. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Mar. Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Worship. So there was a mandate to provide X number of units per year. And this was one of the projects that had come forward for council to consider. Was there, was there other projects that had come forward that were delayed or put off as a result of moving forward with this project? No, as I indicated, um, when council gave us the direction and actually incorporated, excuse me, <clears throat> incorporated the goals of 200 units uh, per year. They put their money where their mouth was. They actually gave us, so we were actually involved in other projects, Crestwood, Vista Grande. There were other projects that were going on at about the same time. They might have been further advanced, but there were other projects that we were doing to add to the affordable housing inventory. Okay. Probably best to stay standing, Mr. Chief. Um, so there were other projects, some of them were considerably less per door, right? Yes. So this particular project, um, as you indicated, there was some, some debate in committee as to the cost per door. And uh, I, I think part of the debate, of course, was what is considered to be affordable housing. Um, but this formed part of achieving the 200 units per year. It, it did. There was difference in cost of parking, as I indicated. This was not at grade parking. And this was concrete. This wasn't. Um, Wood construction. There were some others that we were involved in that was, there were word construction, so the costing was different. Okay, so council gave approval in May of 2006, and the. Sorry, October of 2006. Okay, that's when the decision was ratified by council, right? And it was based on an appraisal done in May? Or is that the way I understand yes. it? Yes, so uh, just to run that again, we had done some initial appraisals early in 2006 at 4.2. Later in 2006, when council actually gave us approval that was the date that we wanted to set so we weren't speculating in land that yielded the adjustment from 4.2 million to 4.5 million to take into account that difference but prices were escalating quite a bit around that time anyways right uh, yeah, well yes so the fact that we were able to get a little more a little bit more money is more reflective of what was going on in the market than anything I think that's fair okay so now, there's been some suggestion that in, what, in 2007, 2007, 111, what exactly transpired at that point? That's when we entered into a, a contract agreement to build the new units? No. So 2011, we had come back with a status report and attached to that was a heads of agreement saying we're still negotiating. Here's what, a, we've got some design now. We've spent a little bit of money. We haven't actually gone to tender, but we've got some designs. This is what we think it's going to look like. This is how we're going to integrate with uh, the EMS, we had been out to the community, we had done some community consultation, and we were now reporting back to say, do you still want to go? Um, this, these, this cost is going to be significant. We've not expended too much cost now. Uh, do you still want to proceed with the project? Okay, so meanwhile though, as far as the sale of the building, that, that deal was pretty much written in stone. Couldn't alter that agreement. Which building? The Louise building, the Fourth Avenue building. No. No, the agreement had not been signed. They just, that, that had not transpired yet. But it all formed part of the whole. Part of the whole, that's right. And this, again, at that point in time, no formal commitments. We were back to council saying, do you want to proceed? We've been out to the community. Um, 
We're still negotiating. Here's the heads of agreement. We talked about the three numbers that we discussed at length in camera, but, but that it, the, the transaction had not uh, closed. So 2008-73, what was that? LES. That was when we came back a third time and said, now we've gone out and we've cost it. The developer has gone out and tendered information, and we now have the costing on what it's going to get us to have leads fire hall. We're still not committed. Do you want to go? Our recommendation was to go and count. That's when council said go. And after that, that's when we started to finalize everything, and that's when we were committed. Okay. So here, as costs were escalating in around that time, would it not have been possible to renegotiate the price at the $4.5 million on the 4th Avenue bill? Or is that part of the whole negotiations that was you, ongoing? You, you always could. And, and let's be clear about that. If council wants to give the administration direction to speculate on that, we could. We could let it go. We could, we could determine whether or not land values go up or go down. But at that point in time, those were the number that had been negotiated. We discussed it at committee and said these are the negotiated numbers based upon the independent appraisals as of that date. We're sticking to our desire to not speculate, and that's the number. See, I wish the school board worked on that same premise because the David D. Elton site we could have bought at $1.98 million at one point and ended up paying $6 million for it. School board. Anyways, those are all the questions I have for now. I'm certainly looking forward to uh, looking up some of these reports and see if I can put together in my own mind as to why I voted the way I did and why we didn't uh, ask administration to speculate on it, although I understand that that's not the business that we're in, Your Worship. I think ultimately um, there may have been some decisions that Council made that could have potentially uh, got us more money for that facility, from the sounds of it. Anyways, I'll listen to some more discussion. Thank you, Alderman Chabot. Alderman Carra. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just scribbled something here, and I don't know if it's amusing, but I think it's sort of highlight something that I think should be sort of put into mind. I have systems upgrade for a 1970s building, X million dollars. Moving those systems from the below the flood lane to the top of the building, X million dollars. And then revamping a structurally sound circa 1970s social housing building into something livable for its tenants, uh, priceless. And I think that that's something that doesn't go into these valuations, is the fact that the social housing of that era might have been structurally sound but it was you know, heroic genius architect planners experimenting on human guinea pigs, mm -hmm. and they were failures. Yes, they um, and so how you evaluate that is, is something to consider. Thank you for your presentation. I'm glad you came. Um, this is very similar to the report we received in LAS in camera. And at that time, the big threat was the pending lawsuit um, and I, I don't mean, to, but right now we have a new sort of thing that's come up. There's the, the Calgary Herald report. They've hired an independent consultant. They feel this independent consultant feels like we got hosed to the tune of five to ten million dollars. Um, rather than try and pull individual numbers out of you, I'm going to try and do what I did in camera and just ask you to give us your best guess as to what the basis of those numbers are and what that evaluator is thinking and why they might be thinking that and maybe explain the gap between what you're presenting to us and, and, what, and what you're getting. Um, you're welcome to answer that, Mr. Stevens. Mr. Tully says it's okay, but understanding that this is a guess on your part. Yeah, understanding that it's a guess. Mm, my apologies. I have to stay still. Um, I, it would be again, I'm not an appraiser. And the basis of that, as I indicated at the very beginning, there were two things that we brought to City Council as the basis of the deal. One, a direct negotiation with the developer, and two, that both transactions would be verified by an independent appraiser. So I've reviewed the appraisals, I've cross-examined appraisers in my past, I have a fairly good understanding. Um, but to speak to what went into their valuations, um, I it would be a guess. I can tell you from Calgary Housing Company's point of view, the concept that you had about the social part of that building was really a key consideration in 
moving forward on the project. Yeah, I, 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 I appreciate. I'm not asking for you to sort of give me a different appraisal or different. I'm, so, I mean, I guess what I'm asking you is that what the Calgary Herald's report is coming down to is a totally different appraisal than the appraisals we were basing our deal on? Or is it something else in your estimation? We're veering closely into uh, speculative stuff. Okay. Um, Alderman Carra, but Mr. Stevens, if you want to try. Your Worship, I would prefer, th I think there is an issue of, um, it would be an in-camera issue to, be, to discuss with regard to that. All right. Okay, thank you. Alderman Pincott. Well, thank you. And Alderman Krav was asking similar questions that that, uh, that I wanted to ask around the, uh, I mean, kind of the nub of the thing is is uh, people feeling that there's different appraisals out there, and that, uh, and so if those questions uh, need to be answered in camera, I I, I would support a motion to uh, to go. Actually, I would move to go in camera uh, after I ask one quite one specific question. Um, uh, Mr. Stevens, one of the questions around the cost uh, is so much per door. It's a lot of money per door for affordable housing. That is driven by, ultimately, by the location. You're forced to do underground parking if you do parking in, in that type of site. At what point did council have its direction around affordable housing to have affordable housing throughout the city. That its goal was to, to look at making sure that we were supplying affordable housing everywhere. I, I don't want to overstate it to say direction, but that was one of the topics that was really discussed at the Mayor's Roundtable, that um, we wanted to get beyond NIMBYism. Right. We wanted, that was one, I think there was eight tenants that came out of them, and one of them was to put together a NIMBY strategy so that we could um, do away with some of the myths of affordable housing. And uh, so I don't want to say that it was a direction, but as early on in 2003, I would say there was a discussion and a desire to have affordable housing in all areas of the city. <coughs> okay. All right. So, so that, so it's quite clear that that preceded this discussion. So at I least mean, if, by three. If price years. was the pure, pure thing around it, then it would all be in stick built in the suburbs. Yes, if you yeah, if you didn't want to do, you would go to the you'd try and find the the uh, the cheapest part of every input cost. Yeah. Land, materials, labor. Yeah, you'd you'd try and build it as cheaply as you as you could. Surface parking, the like. Okay. So, so this also, so as part of the, the 200 per year, uh, it was also tied into, we're putting, we're, we're looking at, at having affordable housing. Yes, and uh, members of council, the previous members of council will know that there have been other projects that were acquired for exactly that reason. The, the uh, acquisition costs were in the range that were acceptable to the city of Calgary, but the dominant issue was is that we wanted to have affordable housing in as many communities as we could get them. And certainly, we've had those those issues about other affordable housing projects since I've been on council, uh, for the very same same reason. And thanks. That's my question. And Alderman Carra raised a very important point about how we do affordable housing now versus how it was done in the 60s and 70s. And it's 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 almost like the 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 first street building was set up for failure. And uh, and there was no. I mean, I was I wasn't on council and I wasn't around on Calgary Housing Company board of directors at that time. But I can well imagine the conversation around that building and how it just cannot work as an affordable housing project. It's just set up for failure. With that, um, I would. I only have two more on the speakers list. Can I ask you to wait? And, and then, then, I, then I'd like to place a motion so we go in camera to discuss. Yeah, uh, our, our next step is to go into an in-camera portion of our meeting, including okay. this and some other things. All right. So if I can exhaust the speaker's list, then we can do that. You got it. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I have a, Alderman Collier, your light is on, and I have some questions, too. You've spoken on this, but. 
Yeah, I was just going to say, Your Worship, it's very difficult to drill down into any kind of detail, and and uh, I thought that we would share this motion uh, to uh, to just find a mechanism, if anyone has any questions at all, to submit them if we were to hire an expert in this area. Um, I, I don't see that many answers will be answered in camera in a verbal session. It'll just go round and round. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll move that whenever it's appropriate. Um, let, let's take the opportunity in camera because Mr. Stevens did mention there was one item he wanted to bring up there. And then when we rise and report, I suspect we'll be able to move that motion. Mr. Stevens, if I may. As you know, I have six big questions, um, and I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer many of them, but I'm going to ask you one. And this is the one that has always been sticking with me. The issue with the city's decision to charge only for the land on the First Avenue property and take on the cost of the demolition of the building ourselves and transfer that as bare land, I've just never heard of this before. Is this consistent with industry practice? Do you have examples of when this has been done before? I don't have specific examples, but I can tell you that was discussed and it was discussed thoroughly at land committee to say um, it's a it was a it was a detractor to the land. It was it was seen uh, and there are many times I don't have them and I can get them to you where there's actually an improvement on the land that detracts from the value of the land itself, and and we know that at a minimum. This building required eighty to ninety thousand dollars per unit of upgrade, between six and a half, five and a half, and six and a half million dollars at a minimum to upgrade, and to find someone who wanted to spend that on a three point eight million dollar asset. I believe, from my reading of the documentation, again I wasn't on CHC, that was that was not going to happen in the marketplace, in the real estate marketplace at the time. You can understand, of course, though, Mr. Stevens, that with the benefit of hindsight. A decision to not spend five to six million and rather spend close to 30 million seems to be a very strange decision. Again, Your Worship, if you did it just upon the numbers, yes, but I would say that there's three different elements that went into the decision of CHC to recommend that they move away from the asset. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know that you'll be able to answer this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. One of the strange things about the cost of construction on this is that we have two different, three different projects really going in on the same parcel of land. And just looking at the sale price of the market value housing, I'd be surprised if their price for nicer units with balconies, et cetera, um, was 320000 per unit given what they're selling them for. Do you have any sense of what the apportion of common costs was between the three, across the three projects? Not with me. Um, I just took a peek back again. I, I, I can probably find that out because we did hire an independent quantified surveyor who looked at every um, receipt or every bill that was sent to us by the developer to make sure that the construction costs were apportioned appropriately between the three facilities. This may be more a question for Alderman Pincott actually in his role as chair of the Calgary Housing Company. But there was some um, Two questions, really. Number one was, have all of the tenants from the Eau Claire been transitioned into Louise Station? And the second question is, there was some talk in the media about how Louise Station actually has fewer deep subsidy units than Eau Claire did. Could you talk about both of those, please? Yes, it, it does have fewer deep subsidy, uh, deep subsidy units. It has a total of 26 deep. That's right. Uh, so that just in, in and of that, no, they were not transitioned. And I'm not sure, I don't have the date that they would have moved out of the first street, look at the Eau Claire location. But, uh, but nonetheless, there, no, they did not transition. Were we able, the, do you know if we were able to find housing for them all? I'm, uh, I don't know that specifically, but, you know, honestly. Mr. Mr. Oh. Stevens says yes. Okay, so I was going to say I'm sure we did. Uh, um, that said, the Louise Station site operates uh, as a mixed income model. The Eau Claire site did not operate as a mixed income model. That was part of how the Eau Claire site was set up for, quite frankly, failure. Failure of the building, and we were, but most importantly, we were failing the people who actually lived there. The successful models that we know are ones that are mixed income. And the Louise Station site is exactly that. It is a 
26 units that are deep subsidy. There are eight uh, accessible units, and the rest are a range up to near what we call near market, so 90% 90, 90 of market, so up to near market. Uh, that is a model that sets up the building for success, has, it requires less security, it requires less ongoing maintenance, it requires less, uh, it, ha it requires less social supports. That sets the building up for success. It also sets up everybody who lives there for success. It is a building that is operated on a completely different model. We have learned a lot about how we do this, and Louise Station is set up on a model to be successful. Within the portfolio that it resides, the Louise Station is also uh, set up to operate on what we call a, a, on, on a break-even. So the, the costs of operating the building are, are established to be paid for by the rent within the building. So it's set up to be a break-even building. It is not subsidized uh, by any level of government in its operation. Thank you. Anyone else with questions for Mr. Stevens? Madam Clerk, um, before I take a motion to go in camera, uh, we have a number of other items that we'll deal with in the same in-camera session. Given that, do I need to take a motion to accept this report for information before we move forward? Okay. And then and, and part B of this is on our in-camera agenda. So I will take a motion then to accept. Thank you, Alderman Pincott. Do I have a seconder? Alderman Chabot, any discussion on that? Very well then, to accept this report for information, are we agreed? All right, I'll take a motion now to move into the in-camera session. Alderman Hodges, Alderman Pincott. Yeah, are we agreed? Agreed. All right, we'll just move back here. Um, so we have a number of in-camera items that we will be covering in this session, uh, and we will come back and rise and report on all of them shortly. Uh, we'll move uh, that uh, council rise and report to worship. Thank you. Are we agreed? Agreed. Okay, very well. Alderman Hodges? Move that uh, we extend uh, our meeting tonight. That's not quite the wording. We extend uh, tonight's meeting to uh, finish, complete the, uh, today's agenda. Do I have a seconder? Second. Uh, thanks, Alderman Jones. Uh, on the motion to extend the agenda until the uh, complete, extend the meeting time until the completion of the agenda, are we agreed? Any opposed? Okay, very well. Uh, Alderman Collier, card. So, Your Worship, I don't know which one we're dealing with. On the matter of urgent business uh, in relation to the police commission, uh, what we were asking was for the law department to go away and bring back an amending bylaw for next Monday, which Mr. Tully is quite prepared to do. But if we don't deal with it tonight, then it's going to be delayed till January. So let me suggest, let's finish the item, the current item. Yes. And then um, I will recognize you on that item. Okay, and, thank you. Uh, and then we'll go from there. So, Madam Clerk, uh, you have the, uh, the uh, motion uh, that we will put before council. And uh, the whereases are many of the questions uh, that were asked uh, after Mr. Stevens gave his presentation. And uh, I think we found that there probably wasn't an ideal uh, um, venue to to get some of the detailed answers that we were looking for so on the uh, operative part of the motion madam clerk if you could just put that in bold and increase the font uh, so uh, the motion is that council retain an expert in 
assessment and construction to answer the above questions and any other questions members of council may have along with any other applicable documentation and that such experts report back directly to council no later than April of 2011 and your worship as I understand this uh, uh, we want this to go through an RFP process uh, that which is a transparent process that takes a while and then it will take a while to review the documentation at hand so so mr. Tobert you were saying the first quarter <coughs> Um, so sorry, I'll <laughs> follow your paragraph. Just working on the language a little bit. Okay. Um, so I think you probably wanted to say an expert or experts. I think it would be the two different ones. Yes. And we probably need a quick governance structure. Um, Mr. Tober was suggesting to be selected by a community that was the chair of land and the mayor. Yes. Okay. Good. That's okay, uh, Alderman. Mar, you seconded it. Thank you. Thank so, you. Your Worship, maybe you want to speak to this as well. I'll just take um, my sure. seat. I will, uh, I'll, I'll that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Worship, and and I appreciate the uh, the last minute addition in regards to governance. Because uh, what I was going to ask is whether or not the identified skill sets to properly assess that would be identified through this mechanism, and whether it was just a construction person and a real estate person, whether there, we needed to have some additional skill sets in regards to properly assessing uh, all the documentation. I think I think the an expert or experts language probably covers us on that, Alderman Chabot. If you're comfortable with that little steering committee we just invented, uh, yeah. being able to assess that. Yeah, and thank you for that final addition. So I, I will support this recommendation. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, to the findings of that committee. I, I still feel pretty confident in the decision that uh, that council had made in the past, and uh, I really don't see this as an issue other than just making it uh, more transparent. So I will be supporting this. Okay. Thanks, Alderman Chabot, Alderman Hodges. Uh, yeah, just briefly, uh, Your Worship, uh, can the clerk produce a copy of this motion for us so we can get it later tonight or uh, tomorrow morning, please? Do we oh, have it? Someone's given it to me. Thank you very much. In the instant response. Anyone else on this motion? I'll just I'll just speak on it for a second before I call on you to close, Alderman Collier Cart. Um, we had a we have had good discussions about this item. Uh, however, there are, as we suggested uh, in the public portion a bit earlier, there remain unanswered questions. Uh, and this is a process that will allow us to answer some of those questions without going too far down the proverbial rabbit hole. So I think that this is a uh, a good compromise. We're responding to a great deal of interest from the public and finding out more answers on this uh, on this item. Uh, whilst really being careful about the fact that there is litigation going on and we don't want to go too far down this hole. So I, I strongly support this. Anyone else? Alderman Collier, cards closed. Closed. Thank you. So on the motion that you see on the screen, are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? Carried. Uh, Alderman Collier, cards. Uh, members of council, you'll have in front of you a letter from uh, Mr. Shake, the uh, it was his fault. He turned you off. Okay. Uh, you'll have a letter in front of you from the Calgary Police Commission requesting uh, that we add an additional two uh, police commissioners to the Calgary Police Commission. And uh, under the Police Act, the Alberta Police Act, uh, uh, the Commission can have up to 12 members. We've had nine members on the Police Commission for the last 22 years. You can see in the motion that uh, Alderman uh, Mara and I are bringing forward. And, and really, uh, members of Council, this request gets down to the workload that these citizen members have. 
there are four standing policy committees over there uh, that they that they have to work on. Uh, it, uh, there's also a tremendous responsibility they have as far as being a district liaison to many of the diff different district offices and doing ride-alongs and so on and so forth. Um, and, and also some of the commissioners also have other responsibilities uh, on the uh, Canadian Associ Association of Chiefs of Police, the board, and also on the Alberta Association of, uh, of Police Commissions. Uh, so um, we're bringing this forward at their request, and uh, the motion is that we uh, ask the law department to bring forward an amending bylaw in Section 3, increasing the number to 11, and uh, that the reason for the urgency is that we wanted to use the resumes that have been submitted from Org Day, uh, of which there were about 100 names in there, and so we wouldn't need to advertise. Thanks, you. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman collier Cart, Alderman McLeod, then Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. I'll be very brief. Um, I am going to support this motion, um, but I, I uh, have some concerns about this arising from a growing population because if you continue to grow your board at the rate of the population, you're going to have a problem. This board, I'm sure, is a governance board and needs to focus on governance as its primary activity. Everything else is optional. And it sounds like 12 is the limit anyway, so. Thanks, Alderman McLeod. Alderman Chabot? I lost track of my train of thought. That's good. I'll ask a question while you're thinking, uh, Alderman Chabot. Something that you might want. Uh, you can just answer it, Alderman Collier Card. Do we pay the citizen members? They get a, they get a small stipend. Nothing. Don't they? Okay, this is not like other boards we've dealt with. exactly what it is. Okay, that's all. Yeah, I lost it. Okay. Um, anyone else before I call on Alderman uh, collier Cart to close? Alderman collier Cart. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Alderman Cloud, I agree with you. Uh, it's been at the same number for many, many years, and... Uh, uh, but... Where we've really noticed an increase in the workload is with all the extra provincial and federal funding that have come into police and, and a lot of the interest around moving more to a community-based policing. And this has to be one of the best governance boards that I've sat on in my years of service. So I hope Council will support this request. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman collier Cart. On the motion, um, urgent business, are we agreed? City, Any opposed? City Clark, Alderman Hodges is opposed. <coughs> Excuse me, carried. All right, um, I will accept a motion then uh, to table the four in-camera items relating to appointments to committees. Alderman Carra, seconded Alderman Chabot. So we'll table those to next Monday. Hmm? Oh, I thought that one was gone already. No, it's on the agenda. Sorry, all five then? Yep. All right, so all five to an in-camera session of council uh, next Monday, 13th December. Uh, on that motion to table, are we agreed? Administrative inquiries? Okay. Seeing none, Alderman Hodges. Move we adjourn, Your Worship. Uh, second. Uh, thanks, Alderman Jones. And are we agreed? agreed? Any opposed? Adjourned. Thank you all.